Preface of the Prairie Traveller by Randolph B. Marcy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Prairie Traveller, a handbook for overland expeditions, with maps, illustrations, and itineraries of the principal routes between the Mississippi and the Pacific, by Randolph B. Marcy, Captain U.S. Army, published by authority of the War Department, 1859. A quarter of a century's experience in frontier life, a great portion of which has been occupied in exploring the interior of our continent, and in long marches, where I have been thrown exclusively upon my own resources, far beyond the bounds of the populated districts, and where the traveller must vary his expedients to surmount the numerous obstacles which the nature of the country continually reproduces, has shown me under what great disadvantages the voyageur labours for want of a timely initiation into these minor details of prairie craft, which, however apparently unimportant in the abstract, are sure upon the plains to turn the balance of success for or against an enterprise. This information is so varied, and is derived from so many different sources, that I still find every new expedition adds substantially to my practical knowledge, and am satisfied that a good prairie manual will be for the young traveller an addition to his equipment of inappreciable value. With such a book in his hand, he will be able, in difficult circumstances, to avail himself of the matured experience of veteran travellers, and thereby avoid many otherwise unforeseen disasters, while during the ordinary routine of marching, he will greatly augment the sum of his comforts, avoid many serious losses, and enjoy a comparative exemption from doubts and anxieties. He will feel himself a master spirit in the wilderness he traverses, and not the victim of every new combination of circumstances which nature affords or fate allots, as if to try his skill and prowess. I have waited for several years with the confident expectation that someone more competent than myself would assume the task and give the public the desired information, but it seems that no one has taken sufficient interest in the subject to disseminate the benefits of his experience in this way. Our frontiermen, although brave in counsel and action, and possessing an intelligence that quickens in the face of danger, are apt to feel shy of the pen. They shun the atmosphere of the student's closet. Their sphere is in the free and open wilderness. It is not to be wondered at, therefore, that to our veteran borderer the field of literature should remain terra incognita. It is our army that unites the chasm between the culture of civilization in the aspect of science, art, and social refinement, and the powerful simplicity of nature. On leaving the military academy, a majority of our officers are attached to the line of the army, and forthwith assigned to duty upon our remote and extended frontier, where the restless and warlike habits of the nomadic tribes render the soldier's life almost as unsettled as that of the savages themselves. A regiment is stationed to-day on the borders of tropical Mexico. Tomorrow the war-whoop, borne on a gale from the northwest, compels its presence in the frozen latitudes of Puget Sound. The very limited numerical strength of our army, scattered as it is over a vast area of territory, necessitates constant changes of stations, long and toilsome marches, a promptitude of action, and the tireless energy and self-reliance that can only be acquired through an intimate acquaintance with the sphere in which we act and move. The education of our officers at the military academy is doubtless well adapted to the art of civilized warfare, but cannot familiarize them with the diversified details of border service, and they often, at the outset of their military career, find themselves compelled to improvise new expedients to meet novel emergencies. The life of the wilderness is an art, as well as that of the city or court, and every art subjects its votaries to discipline in preparing them for a successful career in its pursuit. The military art, as enlarged to meet all the requirements of border service, the savage in his wiles, or the elements in their caprices, embraces many other special arts which have hitherto almost been ignored, and results which experience and calculation should have guaranteed have been improvidently staked upon favorable chances. The main object at which I have aimed in the following pages has been to explain and illustrate, as clearly and succinctly as possible, the best methods of performing the duties devolving upon the prairie traveller, so as to meet their contingencies under all circumstances, and thereby to endeavor to establish a more uniform system of marching and campaigning in the Indian country. I have also furnished itineraries of most of the principal routes that have been traveled across the plains, taken from the best and most reliable authorities, and I have given some information concerning the habits of the Indians and wild animals that frequent the prairies, with the secrets of the hunter's and warrior's strategy, which I have endeavored to impress more forcibly upon the reader by introducing illustrative anecdote. 
I take great pleasure in acknowledging my indebtedness to several officers of the topographical engineers, and of other corps of the army, for the valuable information I have obtained from their official reports regarding the different routes embraced in the itineraries, and to these gentlemen I beg leave very respectfully to dedicate my book. End of Preface Chapter One, Part One of The Prairie Traveller. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Prairie Traveller by Randolph B. Marcy. Chapter One, Part One. The different routes to California and Oregon, their respective advantages, organization of companies, elections of captains, wagons and teams, relative merits of mules and oxen. Routes to California and Oregon. Emigrants or others desiring to make the overland journey to the Pacific should bear in mind that there are several different routes which may be travelled with wagons, each having its advocates in persons directly or indirectly interested in attracting the tide of emigration and travel over them. Information concerning these routes coming from strangers, living or owning property near them, from agents of steamboats or railways, or from other persons connected with transportation companies, should be received with great caution, and never without corroborating evidence from disinterested sources. There is no doubt that each one of these roads has its advantages and disadvantages, but a judicious selection must depend chiefly upon the following considerations, namely, the locality from whence the individual is to take his departure, the season of the year when he desires to commence his journey, the character of his means of transportation, and the point upon the Pacific coast that he wishes to reach. Persons living in the northeastern states can, with about equal facility and dispatch, reach the eastern terminus of any one of the routes they may select by means of public transport, and as animals are much cheaper upon the frontier than in the eastern states, they should purchase their teams at or near the point where their overland journey is to commence. Those living in the northwestern states, having their own teams, and wishing to go to any point north of San Francisco, will of course make choice of the route which takes its departure from the Missouri River. Those who live in the middle western states, having their own means of transportation, and going to any point upon the Pacific coast, should take one of the middle routes. Others, who reside in the extreme southwest, and whose destination is south of San Francisco, should travel the southern road running through Texas, which is the only one practicable for comfortable winter travel. The grass upon a great portion of this route is green during the entire winter, and snow seldom covers it. This road leaves the Gulf Coast at Powderhorn on Matagorda Bay, which point is difficult of access by land from the north, but may be reached by steamer from New Orleans five times a week. There are stores at Powderhorn and Indianola, where the traveller can obtain most of the articles necessary for his journey, but I would recommend him to supply himself before leaving New Orleans with everything he requires, with the exception of animals, which he will find cheaper in Texas. This road has received a large amount of travel since 1849, is well tracked and defined, and excepting about twenty miles of Hog Wallow Prairie near Powderhorn, it is an excellent road for carriages and wagons. It passes through a settled country for 250 miles, and within this section supplies can be had at reasonable rates. At Victoria and San Antonio, many fine stores will be found, well supplied with large stocks of goods, embracing all the articles the traveller will require. The next route to the north is that over which the semi-weekly mail to California passes, and which, for a great portion of the way to New Mexico, I travelled and recommended in 1849. This road leaves the Arkansas River at Fort Smith, to which point steamers run during the seasons of high water in the winter and spring. Supplies of all descriptions necessary for the overland journey may be procured at Fort Smith or at Van Buren on the opposite side of the Arkansas. Horses and cattle are cheap here. The road on leaving Fort Smith passes through the Choctaw and Chickasaw country for 180 miles, then crosses Red River by ferryboat at Preston, and runs through the border settlements of northern Texas for 150 miles, within which distances supplies may be procured at moderate prices. This road is accessible to persons desiring to make the entire journey with their own transportation from Tennessee or Mississippi, by crossing the Mississippi River at Memphis or Helena, passing Little Rock, and thence through Washington County, intersecting the road at Preston. It may also be reached by taking steamers up Red River to Shreveport or Jefferson, from either of which places there are roads running through a populated country, and intersecting the Fort Smith Road near Preston. This road also unites with the San Antonio Road at El Paso, and from that point they pass together over the mountains to Fort Yuma and to San Francisco in California. Another road leaves Fort Smith and runs up the south side of the Canadian River to Santa Fe and Albuquerque in New Mexico. This route is set down upon most of the maps of the present day, as having been discovered and explored by various persons, but my own name seems to have been carefully excluded from the list. 
whether this omission has been intentional or not i leave for the authors to determine i shall merely remark that i had the command and entire direction of an expedition which in eighteen forty nine discovered explored located and marked out this identical wagon road from fort smith arkansas to santa fe new mexico and that this road for the greater portion of the distance is the same that has been since recommended for a pacific railway this road near albuquerque unites with captain whipple's and lieutenant beale's roads to california another road which takes its departure from fort smith and passes through the cherokee country is called the cherokee trail it crosses grand river at fort gibson and runs a little north of west to the verdigris river thence up the valley of this stream on the north side for eighty miles when it crosses the river and taking a northwest course strikes the arkansas river near old fort man on the santa fe trace thence it passes near the base of pike's peak and follows down cherry creek from its source to its confluence with the south platte and from thence over the mountains into utah and on to california via fort bridger and salt lake city for persons who desire to go from the southern states to the gold diggings in the vicinity of cherry creek this route is shorter by some three hundred miles than that from fort smith via fort leavenworth it is said to be an excellent road and well supplied with the requisites for encamping it has been travelled by large parties of california emigrants for several years and is well tracked and defined the grass upon all the roads leaving fort smith is sufficiently advanced to afford sustenance to animals by the first of april and from this time until winter sets in it is abundant the next route on the north leaves the missouri river at westport leavenworth city atchison or from other towns above between either of which points and st louis steamers ply during the entire summer season the necessary outfit of supplies can always be procured at any of the starting points on the missouri river at moderate rates this is the great immigration route from missouri to california and oregon over which so many thousands have traveled within the past few years the track is broad well worn and cannot be mistaken it has received the major part of the mormon emigration and was traversed by the army in its march to utah in eighteen fifty seven at the point where this road crosses the south platte river lieutenant bryan's road branches off to the left leading through bridger's pass and thence to fort bridger the fort kearney route to the gold region near pike's peak also leaves the emigrant road at this place and runs up the south platte from fort bridger there are two roads that may be travelled with wagons in the direction of california one passing salt lake city and the other running down bear river to soda springs intersecting the salt lake city road at the city of rocks near soda springs the oregon road turns to the right passing fort hall and thence down snake river to fort walla walla unless travellers have business in salt lake valley i would advise them to take the bear river route as it is much shorter and better in every respect the road on leaving the missouri river passes for a hundred and fifty miles through a settled country where grain can be purchased cheap and there are several stores in this section where most of the articles required by travellers can be obtained many persons who have had much experience in prairie travelling prefer leaving the missouri river in march or april and feeding grain to their animals until the new grass appears the roads become muddy and heavy after the spring rains set in and by starting out early the worst part of the road will be passed over before the ground becomes wet and soft this plan however should never be attempted unless the animals are well supplied with grain and kept in good condition they will eat the old grass in the spring but it does not in this climate as in utah and new mexico afford them sufficient sustenance the grass after the first of may is good and abundant upon this road as far as the south pass from whence there is a section of about fifty miles where it is scarce there is also a scarcity upon the desert beyond the sink of the humboldt as large numbers of cattle pass over the road annually they soon consume all the grass in these barren localities and such as pass late in the season are likely to suffer greatly and oftentimes perish from starvation when i came over the road in august eighteen fifty eight i seldom found myself out of sight of dead cattle for five hundred miles along the road and this was an unusually favorable year for grass and before the main body of animals had passed for that season upon the head of the sweetwater river and west of the south pass alkaline springs are met with which are exceedingly poisonous to cattle and horses they can readily be detected by the yellowish red color of the grass growing around them animals should never be allowed to graze near them or to drink the water organization of companies after a particular route has been selected to make the journey across the plains and the requisite number have arrived at the eastern terminus their first business should be to organize themselves into a company and elect a commander the company should be of sufficient magnitude to herd and guard animals and for protection against indians from fifty to seventy men properly armed and equipped will be enough for these purposes and any greater number only makes the movements of the party more cumbersome and tardy in the selection of a captain 
good judgment integrity of purpose and practical experience are the essential requisites and these are indispensable to the harmony and consolidation of the association his duty should be to direct the order of march the time of starting and halting to select the camps detail and give orders to guards and indeed to control and superintend all the movements of the company an obligation should then be drawn up and signed by all the members of the association wherein each one should bind himself to abide in all cases by the orders and decisions of the captain and to aid him by every means in his power in the execution of his duties and they should also obligate themselves to aid each other so as to make the individual interest of each member the common concern of the whole company to ensure this a fund should be raised for the purpose of extra animals to supply the place of those which may give out or die on the road and if the wagon or team of a particular member should fail and have to be abandoned the company should obligate themselves to transport his luggage and the captain should see that he has his share of transportation equal with any other member thus it will be made the interest of every member of the company to watch over and protect the property of others as well as his own in case of failure on the part of any one to comply with the obligations imposed by the articles of agreement after they have been duly executed the company should of course have the power to punish the delinquent member and if necessary to exclude him from all the benefits of the association on such a journey as this there is much to interest and amuse one who is fond of picturesque scenery and of wild life in its most primitive aspect yet no one should attempt it without anticipating many rough knocks and much hard labor every man must expect to do his share of duty faithfully and without a murmur on long and arduous expeditions men are apt to become irritable and ill-natured and oftentimes fancy they have more labor imposed upon them than their comrades and that the person who directs the march is partial towards his favorites etc that man who exercises the greatest forbearance under such circumstances who is cheerful slow to take up quarrels and endeavors to reconcile difficulties among his companions is deserving of all praise and will without doubt contribute largely to the success and comfort of an expedition the advantages of an association such as i have mentioned are manifestly numerous the animals can be herded together and guarded by the different members of the company in rotation thereby securing to all the opportunities of sleep and rest besides this is the only way to resist depredations of the indians and to prevent their stampeding and driving off animals and much more efficiency is secured in every respect especially in crossing streams repairing roads etc etc unless a systematic organization be adopted it is impossible for a party of any magnitude to travel in company for any great length of time and for all the members to agree upon the same arrangements in marching camping etc i have several times observed where this has been attempted that discords and dissensions sooner or later arose which invariably resulted in breaking up and separating the company when a captain has once been chosen he should be sustained in all his decisions unless he commits some manifest outrage when a majority of the company can always remove him and put a more competent man in his place sometimes men may be selected who upon trial do not come up to the anticipations of those who have placed them in power and other men will exhibit during the course of the march more capacity under these circumstances it will not be unwise to make a change the first election having been distinctly provisional wagons and teams a company having been organized its first interest is to procure a proper outfit of transportation and supplies for the contemplated journey wagons should be of the simplest possible construction strong light and made of well-seasoned timber especially the wheels as the atmosphere in the elevated and arid regions over which they have to pass is so exceedingly dry during the summer months that unless the woodwork is thoroughly seasoned they will require constant repairs to prevent them from falling to pieces wheels made of bois d'arc or osage orange wood are the best for the plains as they shrink but little and seldom want repairing as however this wood is not easily procured in the northern states white oak answers a very good purpose if well seasoned spring wagons made in concord new hampshire are used to transport passengers and their mails upon some of the routes across the plains and they are said by those who have used them to be much superior to any others they are made of close-grained oak that grows in a high northern latitude and well seasoned the pole of the wagon should have a joint where it enters the hounds to prevent the weight from coming upon it and breaking the hounds in passing short and abrupt holes in the road the perch or coupling pole should be shifting or movable as in the event of the loss of a wheel an axle or other accident rendering it necessary to abandon the wagon a temporary cart may be constructed out of the remaining portion the tires should be examined just before commencing the journey and if not perfectly snug reset 
one of the chief causes of accidents to carriages upon the plains arises from the nuts coming off from the numerous bolts that secure the running gearing to prevent this the ends of all the bolts should be riveted it is seldom necessary to take them off and when this is required the ends of the bolts may easily be filed away wagons with six mules should never on a long journey over the prairies be loaded with over two thousand pounds unless grain is transported when an additional thousand pounds may be taken provided it is fed out daily to the team when grass constitutes the only forage two thousand pounds is deemed a sufficient load i regard our government wagons as unnecessarily heavy for six mules there is sufficient material in them to sustain a burden of four thousand pounds but they are seldom loaded with more than half that weight every wagon should be furnished with substantial bows and double osnaburg covers to protect its contents from the sun and weather there has been much discussion regarding the relative merits of mules and oxen for prairie travelling and the question is yet far from being settled upon good firm roads in a populated country where grain can be procured i should unquestionably give the preference to mules as they travel faster and endure the heat of summer much better than oxen and if the journey be not over one thousand miles and the grass abundant even without grain i think mules would be preferable but when the march is to extend fifteen hundred or two thousand miles or over a rough sandy or muddy road i believe young oxen will endure better than mules they will if properly managed keep in better condition and perform the journey in an equally brief space of time besides they are much more economical a team of six mules costing six hundred dollars while an eight ox team only costs upon the frontier about two hundred dollars oxen are much less liable to be stampeded and driven off by indians and can be pursued and overtaken by horsemen and finally they can if necessary be used for beef in africa oxen are used as saddle animals and it is said that they perform good service in this way this will probably be regarded by our people as a very undignified and singular method of locomotion but in the absence of any other means of transportation upon a long journey a saddle ox might be found serviceable anderson in his work on southwestern africa says a short strong stick of peculiar shape is forced through the cartilage of the nose of the oxen and to either end of this stick is attached in bridle fashion a tough leathern thong from the extreme tenderness of the nose he is now more easily managed hans presented me with an ox called spring which i afterward rode upward of two thousand miles on the day of our departure he mounted us all on oxen and a curious sight it was to see some of the men take their seats who had never before ridden on oxback it is impossible to guide an ox as one would guide a horse for in the attempt to do so you would instantly jerk the stick out of his nose which at once deprives you of every control over the beast but by pulling both sides of the bridle at the same time and toward the side you wish him to take he is easily managed note a ring instead of the stick put through the cartilage of the nose would obviate this difficulty End of note. your seat is not less awkward and difficult for the skin of the ox unlike that of the horse is loose and notwithstanding your saddle may be tightly girthed you keep rocking to and fro like a child in a cradle a few days however enables a person to acquire a certain steadiness and long habit will do the rest ox travelling when once a man becomes accustomed to it is not so disagreeable as might be expected particularly if one succeeds in obtaining a tractable animal on emergencies an ox can be made to proceed at a tolerable quick pace for though his walk is only about three miles an hour at average he may be made to perform double that distance in the same time mr galton once accomplished twenty-four miles in four hours and that too through heavy sand cows will be found very useful upon long journeys when the rate of travel is slow as they furnish milk and in emergencies may be worked in wagons i once saw a small cow yoked beside a large ox and driven about six hundred miles attached to a loaded wagon and she performed her part equally well with the ox it has been by no means an unusual thing for emigrant travels to work cows in their teams the inhabitants of pembina on red river work a single ox harnessed in shafts like a horse and they transport a thousand pounds in a rude cart made entirely of wood without a particle of iron one man drives and takes the entire charge of eight or ten of these teams upon long journeys this is certainly a very economical method of transportation. End of chapter 1, part 1. Chapter 1, part 2 of The Prairie Traveller. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Prairie Traveller by Randolph B. Marcy. Chapter 1, part 2. Stores and provisions. How packed. Desiccated and canned vegetables. Pemmican. Antiscorbutics cold flour, substitutes in case of necessity, amount of supplies, clothing, camp equipage, arms. Stores and Provisions 
Supplies for a march should be put up in the most secure, compact, and portable shape. Bacon should be packed in strong sacks of a hundred pounds to each, or in very hot climates put in boxes and surrounded with bran, which in a great measure prevents the fat from melting away. If pork be used, in order to avoid transporting about 40% of useless weight, it should be taken out of the barrels and packed like bacon, then so placed in the bottom of the wagons as to keep it cool. The pork, if well cured, will keep several months in this way, but bacon is preferable. Flour should be packed in stout double canvas sacks well sewed, a hundred pounds in each sack. Butter may be preserved by boiling it thoroughly and skimming off the scum as it rises to the top until it is quite clear like oil. It is then placed in tin canisters and soldered up. This mode of preserving butter has been adopted in the hot climate of southern Texas, and it is found to keep sweet for a great length of time, and its flavor is but little impaired by the process. Sugar may be well secured in India rubber or gutta percha sacks, or so placed in the wagon as not to risk getting wet. Desiccated or dried vegetables are almost equal to the fresh, and are put up in such a compact and portable form as easily to be transported over the plains. They have been extensively used in the Crimean War, and by our own army in Utah, and have been very generally approved. They are prepared by cutting the fresh vegetables into thin slices, and subjecting them to a very powerful press, which removes the juice and leaves a solid cake, which, after having been thoroughly dried in an oven, becomes almost as hard as a rock. A small piece of this, about half the size of a man's hand, when boiled, swells up so as to fill a vegetable dish, and is sufficient for four men. It is believed that the antiscorbutic properties of vegetables are not impaired by desiccation, and they will keep for years if not exposed to dampness. Canned vegetables are very good for campaigning, but are not so portable as when put up in the other form. The desiccated vegetables used in our army have been prepared by Chollet and Company, 46 Rue Richet, Paris. There is an agency for them in New York. I regard these compressed vegetables as the best preparation for prairie traveling that has yet been discovered. A single ration weighs, before being boiled, only an ounce, and a cubic yard contains 16,000 rations. In making up their outfit for the plains, men are very prone to overload their teams with a great variety of useless articles. It is a good rule to carry nothing more than is absolutely necessary for use upon the journey. One cannot expect, with the limited allowance of transportation that immigrants usually have, to indulge in luxuries upon such expeditions, and articles for use in California can be purchased there at less cost than that of overland transport. The allowance of provisions for men in marching should be much greater than when they take no exercise. The army ration I have always found insufficient for soldiers who perform hard service, yet it is ample for them when in quarters. The following table shows the amount of subsistence consumed per day by each man of Dr. Ray's party in his spring journey to the Arctic regions of North America in 1854. Pemmican, 1.25 pounds. Biscuit, 0.25 pounds. Edwards preserved potatoes, 0.1 pound. Flour, 0.33 pound. Tea, 0.03 pound. Sugar, 0.14 pound. Grease or alcohol for cooking, 0.25 pound. Total, 2.35 pounds. This allowance of little over two pounds of the most nutritious food was found barely sufficient to subsist the men in that cold climate. The pemmican, which constitutes almost the entire diet of the fur company's men in the northwest, is prepared as follows. The buffalo meat is cut into thin flakes and hung up to dry in the sun or before a slow fire. It is then pounded between two stones and reduced to a powder. This powder is placed in a bag of the animal's hide with the hair on the outside. Melted grease is then poured into it and the bag sewn up. It can be eaten raw, and many prefer it so. Mixed with a little flour and boiled, it is a very wholesome and exceedingly nutritious food, and will keep fresh for a long time. I would advise all persons who travel for any considerable time through a country where they can procure no vegetables to carry with them some antiscorbutics, and if they cannot transport desiccated or canned vegetables, citric acid answers a good purpose and is very portable. When mixed with sugar and water with a few drops of the essence of lemon, it is difficult to distinguish from lemonade. Wild onions are excellent as antiscorbutics, also wild grapes and greens. An infusion of hemlock leaves is also said to be an antidote to scurvy. The most portable and simple preparation of subsistence that I know of, and which is used extensively by the Mexicans and Indians, is called cold flour. It is made by parching corn and pounding it in a mortar to the consistency of coarse meal. A little sugar and cinnamon added makes it quite palatable. When the traveler becomes hungry or thirsty, a little of the flour is mixed with water and drunk. It is an excellent article for a traveler who desires to go the greatest length of time upon the smallest amount of transportation. It is said that half a bushel is sufficient to subsist a man thirty days. 
persons undergoing severe labor and driven to great extremities for food will derive sustenance from various sources that would never occur to them under ordinary circumstances in passing over the rocky mountains during the winter of eighteen fifty seven fifty eight our supplies of provisions were entirely consumed eighteen days before reaching the first settlements in new mexico and we were obliged to resort to a variety of expedients to supply the deficiency our poor mules were fast failing and dropping down from exhaustion in the deep snows and our only dependence for the means of sustaining life was upon these starved animals as they became unserviceable and could go no farther we had no salt sugar coffee or tobacco which at a time when men are performing the severest labor that the human system is capable of enduring was a great privation in this destitute condition we found a substitute for tobacco in the bark of the red willow which grows upon many of the mountain streams in that vicinity the outer bark is first removed with a knife after which the inner bark is scraped up into ridges around the sticks and held in the fire until it is thoroughly roasted when it is taken off the stick pulverized in the hand and is ready for smoking it has the narcotic properties of the tobacco and is quite agreeable to the taste and smell the sumac leaf is also used by the indians in the same way and has a similar taste to the willow bark a decoction of the dried wild or horse mint which we found abundant under the snow was quite palatable and answered instead of coffee it dries up in that climate but does not lose its flavor we suffered greatly for the want of salt but by burning the outside of our mule steaks and sprinkling a little gunpowder upon them it did not require a very extensive stretch of the imagination to fancy the presence of both salt and pepper we tried the meat of horse colt and mules all of which were in a starved condition and of course not very tender juicy or nutritious we consumed the enormous amount of from five or six pounds of this meat per man daily but continued to grow weak and thin until at the expiration of twelve days we were able to perform but little labor and were continually craving for fat meat the allowance of provisions for each grown person to make the journey from the missouri river to california should suffice for a hundred and ten days the following is deemed requisite one hundred fifty pounds of flour or its equivalent in hard bread twenty five pounds of bacon or pork and enough fresh beef to be driven on the hoof to make up the meat component of the ration fifteen pounds of coffee and twenty five pounds of sugar also a quantity of saleratus or yeast powders for making bread and salt and pepper these are the chief articles of subsistence necessary for the trip and they should be used with economy reserving a good portion for the western half of the journey heretofore many of the california immigrants have improvidently exhausted their stock of provisions before reaching their journey's end and have in many cases been obliged to pay the most exorbitant prices in making up the deficiency it is true that if persons choose to pass through salt lake city and the mormons happen to be in an amiable mood supplies may sometimes be procured from them but those who have visited them well know how little reliance is to be placed upon their hospitality or spirit of accommodation i once travelled with a party of new yorkers en route for california they were perfectly ignorant of everything relating to this kind of campaigning and had overloaded their wagon with almost everything except the very articles most important and necessary the consequence was that they exhausted their team and were obliged to throw away the greater part of their loading they soon learned that champagne east india sweetmeats olives etc etc were not the most useful articles for a prairie tour clothing a suitable dress for prairie travelling is of great import to health and comfort cotton or linen fabrics do not sufficiently protect the body against the direct rays of the sun at midday nor against rains or sudden changes of temperature wool being a non-conductor is the best material for this mode of locomotion and should always be adopted for the plains the coat should be short and stout the shirt of red or blue flannel such as can be found in almost all the shops on the frontier this in warm weather answers for an outside garment the pants should be of thick and soft woolen material and it is well to have them reinforced on the inside where they come in contact with the saddle with soft buckskin which makes them more durable and comfortable woolen socks and stout boots coming up well at the knees and made large so as to admit the pants will be found the best for horsemen and they guard against rattlesnake bites in travelling through deep snow during very cold weather in winter moccasins are preferable to boots or shoes as being more pliable and allowing a freer circulation of the blood in crossing the rocky mountains in the winter the weather being intensely cold i wore two pairs of woolen socks and a square piece of thick blanket sufficient to cover the feet and ankles over which were drawn a pair of thick buckskin moccasins and the whole enveloped in a pair of buffalo skin boots with the hair inside made open in the front and tied with buckskin strings at the same time i wore a pair of elk skin pants which most effectually prevented the air from penetrating to the skin and made an excellent defence against brush and thorns my men who were dressed in the regulation clothing 
wore out their pants and shoes before we reached the summit of the mountains, and many of them had their feet badly frozen in consequence. They mended their shoes with pieces of leather cut from the saddle skirts as long as they lasted, and when this material was gone, they covered the entire shoe with green beeve or mule hide, drawn together and sewed upon the top, with the hair inside, which protected the upper as well as the sole leather. The sewing was done with an awl and buckskin strings. These simple expedients contributed greatly to the comforts of the party, and, indeed, I am by no means sure that they did not, in our straitened condition, without the transportation necessary for carrying disabled men, save the lives of some of them. Without the awl and buckskins we should have been unable to have repaired the shoes. They should never be forgotten in making up the outfit for a prairie expedition. We also experienced great inconvenience and pain by the reflection of the sun's rays from the snow upon our eyes, and some of the party became nearly snow-blind. Green or blue glasses, enclosed in a wire network, are an effectual protection to the eyes. But in the absence of these, the skin around the eyes and upon the nose should be blackened with wet powder or charcoal, which will afford great relief. In the summer season, shoes are much better for footmen than boots, as they are lighter, and do not cramp the ankles. The soles should be broad, so as to allow a square, firm tread without distorting or pinching the feet. The following list of articles is deemed a sufficient outfit for one man upon a three months expedition. Two blue or red flannel overshirts, open in front with buttons. Two woolen undershirts. Two pairs thick cotton drawers. Four pairs woolen socks. Two pairs cotton socks. Four colored silk handkerchiefs. Two pairs stout shoes for footmen. One pair boots for horsemen. One pair shoes for horsemen. Three towels. One gutta percha poncho. One broad brimmed hat of soft felt. One comb and brush. Two toothbrushes. One pound castile soap. Three pounds bar soap for washing clothes. One belt knife and small whetstone. Stout linen thread. Large needles. A bit of beeswax. A few buttons. Paper of pins and a thimble all contained in a small buckskin or stout cloth bag. The foregoing articles, with the coat and overcoat, complete the wardrobe. Camp Equipage The bedding for each person should consist of two blankets, a comforter, and a pillow, and a gutta-percha or painted canvas cloth to spread beneath the bed upon the ground and to contain it when rolled up for transportation. Every mess of six or eight persons will require a wrought-iron camp kettle, large enough for boiling meat and making soup, a coffee pot and cups of heavy tin, with the handles riveted on, tin plates, frying and baked pans of wrought iron, the latter for baking bread and roasting coffee, also a mess pan of heavy tin or wrought iron for mixing bread and other culinary purposes, knives, forks, and spoons, an extra camp kettle, tin or gutta percha bucket for water, wood being liable to shrink and fall to pieces is not deemed suitable, an axe, hatchet, and spade will also be needed, with a mallet for driving picket pins, Matches should be carried in bottles and corked tight so as to exclude the moisture. A little blue mass, quinine, opium, and some cathartic medicine put up in doses for adults will suffice for the medicine chest. Each ox wagon should be provided with a covered tar bucket, filled with a mixture of tar or resin and grease, two bows extra, six S's, and six open links for repairing chains. Every set of six wagons should have a tongue, coupling pole, king bolt, and a pair of hounds extra. Every set of six mule wagons should be furnished with five pairs of hames, two double trees, four whipple trees, and two pairs of lead bars extra. Two lariats will be needed for every horse and mule, as one generally wears out before reaching the end of a long journey. They will be found useful in crossing deep streams, and in letting wagons down steep hills and mountains, also in repairing broken wagons. Lariats made of hemp are the best. One of the most indispensable articles to the outfit of the prairie traveler is buckskin, for repairing harness, saddles, bridles, and numerous other purposes of daily necessity, the awl and buckskin will be found in constant requisition. Arms. Every man who goes into Indian country should be armed with a rifle and revolver, and he should never, either in camp or out of it, lose sight of them. When not on the march, they should be placed in such a position that they can be seized at an instant's warning, and when moving about outside the camp, the revolver should invariably be worn in the belt, as the person does not know at what moment he may have use for it. A great diversity of opinion obtains regarding the kind of rifle that is the most efficient and best adapted to Indian warfare, and the question is perhaps as yet very far from being settled to the satisfaction of all. A large majority of men prefer the breech-loading arm, but there are those who still adhere tenaciously to the old-fashioned muzzle-loading rifle as preferable to any of the modern inventions. Among these may be mentioned the border hunters and mountaineers, who cannot be persuaded to use any other than the Hawkins rifle, 
for the reason that they know nothing about the merits of any other. My own experience has forced me to the conclusion that the breech-loading arm possesses greater advantages over the muzzle-loading, for the reason that it can be charged and fired with much greater rapidity. Colt's revolving pistol is very generally admitted, both in Europe and America, to be the most efficient arm of its kind known at the present day. As the same principles are involved in the fabrication of his breech-loading rifle, as are found in the pistol, the conviction to me is irresistible that, if one arm is worthy of consideration, the other is equally so. For my own part, I look upon Colt's new patent rifle as a most excellent arm for border service. It gives six shots in more rapid succession than any other rifle I know of, and these, if properly expended, are oftentimes sufficient to decide a contest. Moreover, it is the most reliable and certain weapon to fire that I have ever used, and I cannot resist the force of my conviction that, if I were alone upon the prairies, and expected an attack from a body of Indians, I am not acquainted with any arms I would as soon have in my hands as this. The Army and Navy revolvers have both been used in our army, but the officers are not united in opinion in regard to their relative merits. I prefer the large army size, for reasons which will be given hereafter. End of chapter 1, part 2 Chapter 2, Part 1 of The Prairie Traveller This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Prairie Traveller by Randolph B. Marcy Chapter 2, Part 1 Marching, Treatment of Animals, Water, Different Methods of Finding and Purifying It, Jornadas, Methods of Crossing Them, Advance and Rear Guards. Marching The success of a long expedition through an unpopulated country depends mainly on the care taken of the animals, and the manner in which they are driven, herded, and guarded. If they are broken down or lost, everything must be sacrificed, and the party becomes perfectly helpless. The great error into which inexperienced travellers are liable to fall, and which probably occasions more suffering and disaster than almost anything else, lies in overworking their cattle at the commencement of the journey. To obviate this, short and easy drives should be made until the teams become habituated to their work, and gradually inured to this particular method of travelling. If animals are overloaded and overworked when they first start out into the prairies, especially if they have recently been taken from grain, they soon fall away and give out before reaching the end of the journey. Grass and water are abundant and good upon the eastern portions of all the different overland routes. Animals should not, therefore, with proper care, fall away in the least before reaching the mountains, as west of them are long stretches where grass and water are scarce, and it requires the full amount of strength and vigor of animals in good condition to endure the fatigues and the hard labor attendant upon the passage of these deserts. Drivers should be closely watched, and never, unless absolutely necessary, permitted to beat their animals, or to force them out of a walk, as this will soon break down the best teams. Those teamsters who make the least use of the whip invariably keep their animals in the best condition. Unless the drivers are checked at the outset, they are very apt to fall into the habit of flogging their teams. It is not only wholly unnecessary, but cruel, and should never be tolerated. In traveling with ox teams in the summer season, great benefit will be derived from making early marches starting with the dawn and making a nooning during the heat of the day as oxen suffer much from the heat of the sun in midsummer these noon halts should if possible be so arranged as to be near grass and water where the animals can improve their time in grazing when it gets cool they may be hitched to the wagon again and the journey continued in the afternoon sixteen or eighteen miles a day may thus be made without injury to the beasts and longer drives can never be expedient unless in order to reach grass or water. When the requisites for encamping cannot be found at the desired intervals, it is better for the animals to make a very long drive than to encamp without water or grass. The noon halt in such cases may be made without water, and the evening drive lengthened. Water. The scarcity of water upon some of the routes across the plains occasionally exposes the traveller to intense suffering, and it renders it a matter of much importance for him to learn the best methods of guarding against the disasters liable to occur to men and animals, in the absence of this most necessary element. In mountainous districts, water can generally be found either in springs, the dry beds of streams, or in holes in the rocks, where they are sheltered from rapid evaporation. For example, in the Waco tanks, 30 miles east of El Paso, New Mexico, upon the Fort Smith Road, where there is an immense reservoir in a cave, water can always be found. This reservoir receives the drainage of a mountain. During a season of the year when there are occasional showers, water will generally be found in low places where there is a substratum of clay. But after the dry season has set in, these pools evaporate, and it is necessary to dig wells. 
the lowest spot should be selected for this purpose when the grass is green and the surface earth moist in searching for water along the dry sandy beds of streams it is well to try the earth with a stick or ramrod and if this indicates moisture water will generally be obtained by excavation streams often sink in light and porous sand and sometimes make their appearance again lower down where the bed is more tenacious but it is a rule with prairie travellers in searching for water in a sandy country to ascend the streams and the nearer their sources are approached the more water will be found in a dry season where it becomes necessary to sink a well in a stream the bed of which is quicksand a flour barrel perforated with small holes should be used as a curb to prevent the sand from caving in the barrel must be forced down as the sand is removed and when as is often the case there is an undercurrent through the sand the well will be continually filled with water there are many indications of water known to old campaigners although none of them are absolutely infallible the most certain of them are deep green cottonwood or willow trees growing in depressed localities also flags water rushes tall green grass etc the fresh tracks and trails of animals converging toward a common centre and the flight of birds and waterfowl towards the same point will also lead to water in a section frequented by deer or mustangs it may be certain that water is not far distant as these animals drink daily and they will not remain long in a locality after the water has dried up deer generally go to water during the middle of the day but birds towards evening a supply of drinking water may be obtained during a shower from the drippings of a tent or by suspending a cloth or blanket by the four corners and hanging a small weight to the centre so as to allow all the rain to run toward one point from whence it drops into a vessel beneath india rubber gutta percha or painted canvas cloths answer a very good purpose for catching water during a rain but they should be previously well washed to prevent them from imparting a bad taste when there are heavy dews water may be collected by spreading out a blanket with a stick attached to one end tying a rope to it dragging it over the grass and wringing out the water as it accumulates in some parts of australia this method is practised in traversing the country upon the headwaters of Red River during the summer of 1852, we suffered most severely from thirst, having nothing but the acrid and bitter waters from the river, which, issuing from a gypsum formation, was highly charged with salts, and when taken into the stomach did not quench thirst in the slightest degree, but on the contrary produced a most painful and burning sensation accompanied with diarrhoea. During the four days that we were compelled to drink this water, the thermometer rose to 104 in the shade, and the only relief we found was from bathing in the river. The use of water is a matter of habit, very much within our control, as by practice we may discipline ourselves so as to require but a small amount. Some persons, for example, who place no restraint upon their appetites will, if they can get it, drink water twenty times a day, while others will not perhaps drink more than once or twice during the same time. I have found a very effectual preventive to thirst by drinking a large quantity of water before breakfast, and, on feeling thirsty on the march, chewing a small green twig or leaf. Water taken from stagnant pools, charged with putrid vegetable matter and animalculae, would be very likely to generate fevers and dysenteries if taken into the stomach without purification. It should, therefore, be thoroughly boiled, and all the scum removed from the surface as it rises. This clarifies it, and by mixing powdered charcoal with it, the disinfecting process is perfected. Water may also be purified by placing a piece of alum in the end of a stick that has been split, and stirring it around in a bucket of water. Charcoal and the leaves of the prickly pear are also used for the same purpose. I have recently seen a compact and portable filter made of charcoal which clarifies the water very effectually and draws it off in the siphon principle. It can be obtained at 85 West Street, New York, for one dollar and a half. Water may be partially filtered in a muddy pond by taking a barrel and boring the lower half full of holes, then filling it up with grass or moss above the upper holes, after which it is placed in the pond with the top above the surface. The water filters through the grass or moss and rises in the barrel to a level with the pond. Travelers frequently drink muddy water by placing a cloth or handkerchief over the mouth of a cup to catch the larger particles of dirt and animalculae. Water may be cooled so as to be quite palatable by wrapping cloths around the vessels containing it, wetting them, and hanging them in the air, where a rapid evaporation will be produced. Some of the frontiermen used a leathern sack for carrying water. This is porous and allows the necessary evaporation without wetting. The Arabs also use a leathern bottle, which they call zemsemya. When they are en route, they hang it on the shady side of a camel, where the evaporation keeps the water continually cool. 
no expedition should ever set out into the plains without being supplied with the means for carrying water especially in an unknown region if wooden kegs are used they must frequently be looked after and soaked in order that they may not shrink and fall to pieces men in marching in a hot climate throw off a great amount of perspiration from the skin and require a corresponding quantity of water to supply the deficiency and unless they get this they suffer greatly when a party makes an expedition into a desert section where there is a probability of finding no water and intend to return over the same track it is well to carry water as far as convenient and bury it in the ground for use on the return trip captain sturt when he explored australia took a tank in his cart which burst and besides that he carried casks of water by these he was enabled to face a desert country with a success which no traveller had ever attained to for instance when returning homeward the water was found to be drying up from the country on all sides of him he was at a pool and the next stage was one hundred and eighteen miles at the end of which it was doubtful if there remained any water it was necessary to send to reconnoitre and to furnish the messenger with means of returning should the pool be found dry he killed a bullock skinned it and by filling the skin with water which held one hundred and fifty gallons sent it by an ox dray thirty miles with orders to bury it and to return shortly after he dispatched a light one-horse cart carrying thirty-six gallons of water the horse and man were to drink at the hide and go on thus they had thirty-six gallons to supply them for a journey of a hundred and seventy-six miles or six days at thirty miles a day at the close of which they would return to the ox hide sleeping in fact five nights on thirty-six gallons of water this a hardy well-driven horse could do even in the hottest climate from f galton's art of travel page seventeen and eighteen jornadas in some localities fifty or sixty miles and even greater distances are frequently traversed without water these long stretches are called by the mexicans jornadas or days journeys there is one in new mexico called jornada del muerto which is seventy-eight and a half miles in length where in a dry season there is not a drop of water yet with proper care this drive can be made with ox or mule teams and without loss or injury to the animals on arriving at the last camping ground before entering upon the jornada all the animals should be as well rested and refreshed as possible to ensure this they must be turned out upon the best grass that can be found and allowed to eat and drink as much as they desire during the entire halt should the weather be very warm and the teams composed of oxen the march should not be resumed until it begins to cool in the afternoon they should be carefully watered just previous to being hitched up and started out upon the jornada the water kegs having been previously filled the drive is then commenced and continued during the entire night with ten or fifteen minutes rest every two hours about daylight a halt should be made and the animals immediately turned out to graze for two hours during which time especially if there is dew upon the grass they will have become considerably refreshed and may be put to the wagons again and driven until the heat becomes oppressive toward noon when they are again turned out upon a spot where the grass is good and if possible where there are shade trees about four o'clock p m they are again started and the march continued into the night and as long as they can be driven without suffering if however there should be dew which is seldom the case on the plains it would be well to turn out the animals several times during the second night and by morning if they are in good condition the jornada of seventy or eighty miles will have been passed without any great amount of suffering i am supposing in this case that the road is firm and free from sand many persons have been under the impression that animals in traversing the plains would perform better and keep in better condition by allowing them to graze in the morning before commencing the day's march which involves the necessity of making late starts and driving during the heat of the day the same persons have been of the opinion that animals will graze only at particular hours that the remainder of the day must be allowed them for rest and sleep and that unless these rules be observed they would not thrive this opinion is however erroneous as animals will in a few days adapt themselves to any circumstances so far as regards their hours of labor rest and refreshment if they have been accustomed to work at particular periods of the day and the order of things is suddenly reversed the working hours changed into hours of rest and vice versa they may not do as well for a short time but they will soon accustom themselves to the change and eat and rest as well as before by making early drives during the summer months the heat of the day is avoided whereas i repeat if allowed to graze before starting the march cannot commence until it grows warm when animals especially oxen will suffer greatly from the heat of the sun and will not do as well as when the other plan is pursued oxen upon a long journey will sometimes wear down their hoofs and become lame when this occurs 
a thick piece of rawhide wrapped around the foot and tied firmly to the leg will obviate the difficulty provided the weather is not wet for if so the shoe soon wears out mexican and indian horses and mules will make long journeys without being shod as their hoofs are tough and elastic and wear away very gradually they will however in time become very smooth making it difficult for them to travel upon grass a train of wagons should always be kept closed upon a march, and if, as often happens, a particular wagon gets out of order and is obliged to halt, it should be turned out of the road to let the others pass while the injury is being repaired. As soon as the broken wagon is in order, it should fall into the line wherever it happens to be. In the event of a wagon breaking down so as to require important repairs, men should be immediately dispatched with the necessary tools and materials, which should be placed in the train where they can readily be got at, and a guard should be left to escort the wagon to camp after having been repaired. If, however, the damage be so serious as to require any great length of time to repair it, the load should be transferred to other wagons, so that the team which is left behind will be able to travel rapidly and overtake the train. If the broken wagon is a poor one, and there be abundance of better ones, the accident being such as to involve much delay for its repair, it may be wise to abandon it taking from it such parts as may possibly be wanting in repairing other wagons. Advance and Rear Guards A few men, well mounted, should constitute the advance and rear guards for each train of wagons passing through the Indian country. Their duty will be to keep a vigilant lookout in all directions, and to reconnoitre places where Indians would be likely to lie in ambush. Should hostile Indians be discovered, the facts should be at once reported to the commander who, if he anticipates an attack, will rapidly form his wagons into a circle or corral, with the animals toward the center, and the men on the inside, with their arms in readiness to repel an attack from without. If these arrangements be properly attended to, few parties of Indians will venture to make an attack, as they are well aware that some of their warriors might pay with their lives the forfeit of such indiscretion. I know an instance where one resolute man, pursued for several days by a large party of Comanches on the Santa Fe Trace, defended himself by dismounting and pointing his rifle at the foremost whenever they came near him, which always had the effect of turning them back. This was repeated so often that the Indians finally abandoned the pursuit, and left the traveller to pursue his journey without farther molestation. During all this time he did not discharge his rifle. Had he done so, he would doubtless have been killed. End of chapter 2, part 1《ハッピーバッグの話を聞いてみてください。ハッピーバッグの話を聞いてみてください。ハッピーバッグの話を聞いてみてください。ハッピーバッグの話を聞いてみてください。ハッピーバッグの話を聞いてみてください。The security of animals, and indeed the general safety of a party, in traveling through a country occupied by hostile Indians, depends greatly upon the judicious selection of camps. One of the most important considerations that should influence the choice of a locality is its capability for defense. If the camp be pitched beside a stream, a concave bend, where the water is deep, with a soft alluvial bed enclosed by high and abrupt banks, will be the most defensible, and all the more should the concavity form a peninsula. The advantages of such a position are obvious to a soldier's eye, as that part of the encampment enclosed by the stream is naturally secure and leaves only one side to be defended. The concavity of the bend will enable the defending party to cross its fire in case of attack from the exposed side. The bend of the stream will also form an excellent corral in which to secure animals from a stampede, and thereby diminish the number of sentinels needful around the camp. In herding animals at night within the bend of a stream, a spot should be selected where no clumps of brush grow on the side where the animals are posted. If thickets of brush cannot be avoided, sentinels should be placed near them to guard against Indians, who might take advantage of this cover to steal animals or shoot them down with arrows before their presence were known. In camping away from streams, it is advisable to select a position in which one or more sides of the encampment shall rest upon the crest of an abrupt hill or bluff. The prairie Indians make their camps upon the summits of the hills, whence they can see in all directions, and thus avoid a surprise. The line of tents should be pitched on that side of the camp most exposed to attack, and sentinels so posted that they may give alarm in time for the main body to rally and prepare for defense. Sanitary Considerations When camping near rivers and lakes surrounded by large bodies of timber and a luxuriant vegetation, 
which produces a great amount of decomposition and consequent exhalation of malaria it is important to ascertain what localities will be the least likely to generate disease and to affect the sanitary condition of men occupying them this subject has been thoroughly examined by dr robert johnson inspector general of hospitals in the english army in eighteen forty five and as his conclusions are deduced from an enlarged experience and extended research they should have great weight i shall therefore make no apology for introducing here a few extracts from his interesting report touching upon this subject it is consonant with the experience of military people in all ages and in all countries that camp diseases most abound near the muddy banks of large rivers near swamps and ponds and on grounds which have been recently stripped of their woods the fact is precise but it has been set aside to make way for an opinion it was assumed about half a century since by a celebrated army physician that camp diseases originated from causes of putrefaction and that putrefaction is connected radically with a stagnant condition of the air as streams of air usually proceed along rivers with more certainty and force than in other places and as there is evidently a more certain movement of air that is more wind on open ground than among woods and thickets this sole consideration without any regard to experience influenced opinion gave currency to the destructive maxim that the banks of rivers open grounds and exposed heights are the most eligible situations for encampment of troops they are the best ventilated they must if the theory be true be the most healthy the fact is the reverse but demonstrative as the fact may be fashion has more influence than multiplied examples of fact experimentally proved encampments are still formed in the vicinity of swamps or on grounds which are newly cleared of their woods in obedience to theory and contrary to fact it is prudent as now said in selecting ground for encampment to avoid the immediate vicinity of swamps and rivers the air is there noxious but as its influence thence originating does not extend beyond a certain limit it is a matter of some importance to ascertain to what distance it does extend because if circumstances do not permit that the encampment be removed out of its reach prudence directs that remedies be applied to weaken the force of its pernicious impressions the remedies consist in the interposition of rising grounds woods or such other impediments as serve to break the current in its progress from the noxious source it is an obvious fact that the noxious cause or the exhalation in which it is enveloped ascends as it traverses the adjacent plain and that its impression is augmented by the adventitious force with which it strikes upon the subject of its action it is thus that a position of three hundred paces from the margin of a swamp on a level with the swamp itself or but moderately elevated is less unhealthy than one at six hundred on the same line of direction on an exposed height the cause here strikes fully in its ascent and as the atmosphere has a more varied temperature and the successions of the air are more irregular on the height than on the plain the impression is more forcible and the noxious effects more strongly marked in accord with this principle it is almost uniformly true ceteris paribus that diseases are more common at least more violent in broken irregular and hilly countries where the temperature is liable to sudden changes and where blasts descend with the fury from the mountains than in large and extensive inclined plains under the action of equal and gentle breezes only from this fact it becomes an object of the first consideration in selecting ground for encampment to guard against the impression of strong winds on their own account independently of their proceeding from swamps rivers and noxious soils it is proved by experience in armies as in civil life that injury does not often result from simple wetting with rain when the person is fairly exposed in the open air and habitually inured to the contingencies of weather irregular troops which act in the advanced line of armies and which have no other shelter from weather than a hedge or tree rarely experience sickness never at least the sickness which proceeds from contagion hence it is inferred that the shelter of tents is not necessary for the preservation of health irregular troops with contingent shelter only are comparatively healthy while sickness often rages with violence in the same scene among those who have all the protection against the inclemencies of weather which can be furnished by canvas the fact is verified by experience and the cause of it is not of difficult explanation when the earth is damp the action of heat on its surface occasions the interior moisture to ascend the heat of the bodies of a given number of men confined within a tent of a given dimension raises the temperatures within the tent beyond the temperature of the common air outside the tent the ascent of moisture is thus encouraged generally by a change of temperature in the tent 
and more particularly by the immediate or near contact of the heated bodies of the men with the surface of the earth. Moisture, as exhaled from the earth, is considered by observers of fact to be a cause which acts injuriously on health. Produced artificially by the accumulation of individuals in close tents, it may reasonably be supposed to produce its usual effects on armies. A cause of contagious influence, of fatal effect, is thus generated by accumulating soldiers in close and crowded tents, under the pretext of defending them from the inclemencies of the weather, and hence it is that the means which are provided for the preservation of health are actually the cause of destruction of life. There are two causes which more evidently act upon the health of troops in the field than any other, namely, moisture exhaled direct from the surface of the earth in undue quantity, and emanations of a peculiar character, arising from diseased action in the animal system in a mass of men crowded together. These are principal, and they are important. The noxious effects may be obviated, or rather the noxious cause will not be generated, under the following arrangement, namely, a carpet of painted canvas for the floor of the tent, a tent with a light roof, as defense against perpendicular rain or the rays of a vertical sun, and with side walls of moderate height, to be employed only against driving rains. To the first there can be no objection. It is useful, as preventing the exhalations of moisture from the surface of the earth. It is convenient, as always ready, and it is economical, as less expensive than straw. It requires to be freshly painted only once a year. The effect of crowding men together in close quarters, illy ventilated, was shown in the prisons of Hindostan, where at one time, when the English held sway, they had on average forty thousand natives in confinement, and this unfortunate population was every year liberated by death in proportions varying from four thousand to ten thousand. The annual average mortality by crowded and unventilated barracks in the English army has sometimes been enormous, as at barrack poor where it seldom fell far short of one-tenth, that is to say, its garrisons were every year decimated by fever or cholera, while the officers and other inhabitants who lived in well-ventilated houses did not find the place particularly unhealthy. The same fact of general exemption among the officers, and complete exemption among their wives, was observed in the marching regiments, which lost by cholera from one-tenth to one-sixth of the enlisted men, who were packed together at night ten and twelve in a tent, with the thermometer at ninety-six degrees. The dimensions of the celebrated Black Hole of Calcutta, where, in 1756, 123 prisoners out of 140 died by carbonic acid in one night, was but eighteen feet square, and with but two small windows, most of the twenty-three who survived until morning were seized with putrid fever and died very soon afterward. On the 1st of December, 1848, 150 deck passengers of the steamer Londonderry were ordered below by the captain, and the hatches closed upon them. Seventy were found dead the next morning. The streams which intersect our great prairies have but very sparse growth of wood or vegetation upon their banks, so that one of the fundamental causes for the generation of noxious malaria does not, to any great extent, exist here, and I believe that persons may encamp with impunity directly upon their banks. Picket Guards When a party is sufficiently strong, a picket guard should be stationed during the night some two or three hundred yards in advance of the point which is most open to assault, and on low ground, so that an enemy approaching over surrounding higher country can be seen against the sky, while the sentinel himself is screened from observation. These sentinels should not be allowed to keep fires unless they are so placed that they cannot be seen from a distance. During the day the pickets should be posted on the summits of the highest eminences in the vicinity of camp, with instructions to keep a vigilant lookout in all directions, and if not within hailing distance, they should be instructed to give some well-understood telegraphic signal to inform those in camp when there is danger. For example, should Indians be discovered approaching at a great distance, they may raise their caps upon the muzzles of their pieces, and at the same time walk around in a circle. While if the Indians are near and moving rapidly, the sentinel may swing his cap and run around rapidly in a circle. To indicate the direction from which the Indians are approaching, he may direct his piece towards them, and walk in the same line of direction. Should the picket suddenly discover a party of Indians very near, and with the apparent intention of making an attack, they should fire their pieces to give the alarm to the camp. These telegraphic signals, when well understood and enforced, will tend greatly to facilitate the communication of intelligence throughout the camp, and conduce much to its security. The picket guards should receive minute and strict orders regarding their duties, under all circumstances, and these orders should be distinctly understood by everyone in the camp, so that no false alarms will be created. 
all persons with the exception of the guards and herders should after dark be confined to the limits of the chain of sentinels so that if any one is seen approaching from without these limits it will be known that they are strangers as there will not often be occasion for any one to pass the chain of pickets during the night it is a good rule especially if the party is small when a picket sentinel discovers any one lurking about his post from without if he has not himself been seen to quietly withdraw and report the fact to the commander who can wake his men and make his arrangements to repel an attack and protect his animals if however the man upon the picket has been seen he should distinctly challenge the approaching party and if he receives no answer fire and retreat to camp to report the fact it is of utmost importance that the picket guards should be wide awake and allow nothing to escape their observation as the safety of the whole camp is involved during a dark night a man can see better himself and is less exposed to the view of others when in a sitting posture than when standing up or moving about i would therefore recommend this practice for night pickets horses and mules especially the latter whose senses of hearing and smelling are probably more acute than those of almost any other animals will discover anything strange or unusual about camp much sooner than a man they indicate this by turning in the direction from whence the object is approaching holding their heads erect projecting their ears forward and standing in a fixed and attentive attitude they exhibit the same signs of alarm when a wolf or other wild animal approaches at camp but it is always wise when they show fear in this manner to be on the alert till the cause is ascertained mules are very keenly sensitive to danger and in passing along over the prairies they will often detect the proximity of strangers long before they are discovered by their riders nothing seems to escape their observation and i have heard of several instances where they have given timely notice of the approach of hostile indians and thus prevented stampedes dogs are sometimes good sentinels but they often sleep sound and are not easily awakened on the approach of an enemy in marching with large force unless there is a guide who knows the country a small party should always be sent in advance to search for good camping places and these parties should be dispatched early enough to return and meet the main command in the event of not finding a camping place within the limits of the day's march a regiment should average upon the prairies where the roads are good about eighteen miles a day but if necessary can make twenty-five or even thirty miles the advance party should therefore go as far as the command can march provided the requisites for camping are not found within that distance the article of first importance in campaigning is grass the next water and the last fuel it is the practice of most persons travelling with large ox trains to select their camps upon the summit of a hill where the surrounding country in all directions can be seen their cattle are then continually within view from the camp and can be guarded easily when a halt is made the wagons are corralled as it is called by bringing the two front ones near and parallel to each other the next two are then driven up on the outside of these with the front wheels of the former touching the rear wheels of the latter the rear of the wagons turned out upon the circumference of the circle that is being formed and so on until one half the circle is made when the rear of the wagons are turned in to complete the circle an opening of about twenty yards should be left between the last two wagons for animals to pass in and out of the corral and this may be closed with two ropes stretched between the wagons such a corral forms an excellent and secure barricade against indian attacks and a good enclosure for cattle while they are being yoked indeed it is indispensable stampedes enclosures are made in the same manner for horses and mules and in case of an attempt to stampede them they should be driven with all possible dispatch into the corral where they will be perfectly secure a stampede is more to be dreaded upon the plains than almost any disaster that can happen it not unfrequently occurs that very many animals are irretrievably lost in this way and the object of an expedition thus defeated the indians are perfectly familiar with the habits and disposition of horses and mules and with the most effectual methods of terrifying them previous to attempting a stampede they provide themselves with rattles and other means for making frightful noises thus prepared they approach as near the herds as possible without being seen and suddenly with their horses at full speed rush in among them making the most hideous and unearthly screams and noises to terrify them and drive them off before their astonished owners are able to rally and secure them as soon as the animals are started the indians divide their party leaving a portion to hurry them off rapidly while the rest linger some distance in the rear to resist those who may pursue them horses and mules will sometimes especially in the night become frightened and stampeded from very slight causes a wolf or a deer passing through a herd will often alarm them and cause them to break away in the most frantic manner upon one occasion in the choctaw country my entire herd of about two hundred horses and mules all stampeded in the night 
and scattered over the country for many miles, and it was several days before I succeeded in collecting them together. The alarm occurred while the herders were walking among the animals, and without any perceptible cause. The foregoing facts go to show how important it is, at all times, to keep a vigilant guard over animals. In the vicinity of hostile Indians, where an attack may be anticipated, several good horses should be secured in such positions that they will continually be in readiness for an emergency of this kind. The herdsmen should have their horses in hand, saddled and bridled, and ready at an instant's notice to spring upon their backs and drive the herds into camp. As soon as it is discovered that the animals have taken fright, the herdsmen should use their utmost endeavors to turn them in the direction of the camp, and this can generally be accomplished by riding the bell mare in front of the herd, and gradually turning her toward it, and slackening her speed as the familiar objects about the camp come in sight. This usually tends to quiet their alarm. End of chapter 2, part 2 Chapter 3 of The Prairie Traveller This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Prairie Traveller by Randolph B. Marcy Chapter 3 Repairing Broken Wagons Fording Rivers Quicksand Wagon Boats Bull Boats Crossing Packs Swimming Animals Marching with Loose Horses Herding Mules Best method of marching, herding and guarding animals, descending mountains, storms, northers. Repairs of accidents. The accidents most liable to happen to wagons on the plains arise from the great dryness of the atmosphere and the consequent shrinkage and contraction of the woodwork in the wheels, the tires working loose, and the wheels in passing over sidling ground, oftentimes falling down and breaking all the spokes where they enter the hub. It therefore becomes a matter of absolute necessity for the prairie traveller to devise some means of repairing such damages, or of guarding against them by the use of timely expedients. The wheels should be frequently and closely examined, and whenever a tire becomes at all loose it should at once be tightened with pieces of hoop iron or wooden wedges driven by twos simultaneously from opposite sides. Another remedy for the same thing is to take off the wheels after encamping, sink them in water, and allow them to remain overnight. This swells the wood, but is only temporary, requiring frequent repetition, and after a time, if the wheels have not been made of thoroughly seasoned timber, it becomes necessary to reset the tires, in order to guard against their destruction by falling to pieces and breaking the spokes. If the tires run off near a blacksmith's shop, or if there be a travelling forge with the train, they may be tied on with rawhide or ropes, and thus driven to the shop or camp. When a rear wheel breaks down upon a march, the best method I know of for taking the vehicle to a place where it can be repaired is to take off the damaged wheel and place a stout pole of three or four inches in diameter under the end of the axle, outside the wagon bed, and extending forward above the front wheel where it is firmly lashed with ropes, while the other end of the pole runs six or eight feet to the rear and drags upon the ground. The pole must be of such length and inclination that the axle shall be raised and retained in its proper horizontal position when it can be driven to any distance that may be desired. The wagon should be relieved as much as practicable of its loading, as the pole dragging upon the ground will cause it to run heavily. When a front wheel breaks down, the expedient just mentioned cannot be applied to the front axle, but the two rear wheels may be taken off and placed upon this axle. They will always fit, while the sound front wheel can be substituted upon one side of the rear axle, after which the pole may be applied as before described. This plan I have adopted upon several different occasions, and I can vouch for its efficacy. The foregoing facts may appear very simple and unimportant in themselves, but blacksmiths and wheelwrights are not met with at every turn of the roads upon the prairies, and in the wilderness, where the traveller is dependent solely upon his own resources, this kind of information will be found highly useful. When the spokes in a wheel shrink more than the fellows, they work loose on the hub, and cannot be tightened by wedging. The only remedy in such cases is to cut the fellow with a saw on opposite sides, taking out two pieces of such dimensions that the reduced circumference will draw back the spokes into their proper place and make them snug. A thin wagon-bow or barrel hoops may then be wrapped around the outside of the fellow and secured with small nails or tacks. This increases the diameter of the wheel so that when the tire has been heated, put on, and cooled, it forces back the spokes into their true places and makes the wheel as sound and strong as it ever was. This simple process can be executed in about half an hour if there be fuel for heating, and obviates the necessity of cutting and welding the tire. I would recommend that the tires should be secured with bolts and nuts, which will prevent them from running off when they work loose, and if they have been cut and reset, they should be well tried with a hammer where they are welded to make sure that the junction is sound. Fording Rivers 
Many streams that intersect the different routes across our continent are broad and shallow and flow over beds of quicksand, which in seasons of high water become boggy and unstable, and are then exceedingly difficult of crossing. When these streams are on the rise, and indeed before any swelling is perceptible, their beds become surcharged with sand loosened by the action of the undercurrent from the approaching flood, and from this time until the water subsides, fording is difficult, requiring great precautions. On arriving upon the bank of a river of this character, which has not been recently crossed, the condition of the quicksand may be ascertained by sending an intelligent man over the fording place, and, should the sand not yield under his feet, it may be regarded as safe for animals or wagons. Should it, however, prove soft and yielding, it must be thoroughly examined and the best track selected. This can be done by a man on foot, who will take a number of sharp sticks long enough, when driven into the bottom of the river, to stand above the surface of the water. He starts from the shore, and with one of the sticks and his feet, tries the bottom in the direction of the opposite bank until he finds the firmest ground, where he plants one of the sticks to mark the track. A man incurs no danger in walking over quicksand, provided he step rapidly, and he will soon detect the safest ground. He then proceeds, planting his sticks as often as may be necessary to mark the way, until he reaches the opposite bank. The ford is thus ascertained, and if there are footmen in the party, they should cross before the animals and wagons, as they pack the sand and make the track more firm and secure. If the sand is soft, horses should be led across, and not allowed to stop in the stream, and the better to ensure this, they should be watered before entering upon the ford, otherwise as soon as they stand still their feet sink in the sand, and it soon becomes difficult to extricate them. The same rule holds in the passage of wagons. They must be driven steadily across, and the animals never allowed to stop while in the river, as the wheels sink rapidly in quicksand. Mules will often stop from fear, and when once embarrassed in the sand, they lie down and will not use the slightest exertion to regain their footing. The only alternative, then, is to drag them out with ropes. I have even known some mules refuse to put forth the least exertion to get up after being pulled out upon firm ground, and it was necessary to set them upon their feet before they were restored to a consciousness of their own powers. In crossing rivers where the water is so high as to come into the wagon beds, but is not above a fording stage, the contents of the wagons may be kept dry by raising the beds between the uprights, and retaining them in that position with blocks of wood placed at each corner between the rockers and the bottom of the wagon beds. The blocks must be squared at each end, and their length, of course, should vary with the depth of water, which can be determined before cutting them. This is a very common and simple method of passing streams among emigrant travelers. When streams are deep, with a very rapid current, it is difficult for the drivers to direct their teams to the proper coming-out places, as the current has a tendency to carry them down too far. This difficulty may be obviated by attaching a lariat rope to the leading animals, and having a mounted man ride in front with the rope in his hand, to assist the team in stemming the current, and direct it towards the point of egress. It is also a wise precaution, if the ford be at all hazardous, to place a mounted man on the lower side of the team with a whip, to urge forward any animal that may not work properly. Where rivers are wide, with a swift current, they should always, if possible, be forded obliquely, downstream, as the action of the water against the wagons assists very materially in carrying them across. In crossing the North Platte upon the Cherokee Trail, at a season when the water was high and very rapid, we were obliged to take the only practicable ford which ran diagonally up the stream. The consequence was that the heavy current, coming down with great force against the wagons, offered such powerful resistance to the efforts of the mules that it was with difficulty they could retain their footing, and several were drowned. Had the ford crossed obliquely down the river, there would have been no difficulty. When it becomes necessary with loaded wagons to cross a stream of this character against the current, I would recommend that the teams be doubled, the leading animals led, a horseman placed on each side with whips to assist the driver, and that before the first wagon enters the water, a man should be sent in advance to ascertain the best ford. During seasons of high water, men in traversing the plains often encounter rivers, which rise above a fording stage and remain in that condition for many days, and to await the falling of the water might involve a great loss of time. If the traveller be alone, his only way is to swim his horse, but if he retains the seat on his saddle, his weight presses the animal down into the water and cramps his movements very sensibly. It is a much better plan to attach a cord to the bridle bit and drive him into the stream, then, seizing his tail, allow him to tow you across. If he turns out of the course, or attempts to turn back, he can be checked with the cord or by splashing water at his head. If the rider remains in the saddle, he should allow the horse to have a loose rein, and never pull upon it except when necessary to guide. If he wishes to steady himself, he can lay a hold upon the mane. 
in travelling with large parties the following expedients for crossing rivers have been successfully resorted to within my own experience and they are attended with no risk of life or property a rapid and deep stream with high abrupt and soft banks probably presents the most formidable array of unfavourable circumstances that can be found streams of this character are occasionally met with and it is important to know how to cross them with the greatest promptitude and safety a train of wagons having arrived upon the banks of such a stream first select the best point for the passage where the banks upon both sides require the least excavation for a place of ingress and egress to and from the river as i have before remarked the place of entering the river should be above the coming out place on the opposite bank as the current will then assist in carrying wagons and animals across a spot should be sought where the bed of the stream is firm at the place where the animals are to get out on the opposite bank if however no such place can be found brush and earth should be thrown in to make a foundation sufficient to support the animals and to prevent them from bogging after the place for crossing has been selected it will be important to determine the breadth of the river between the points of ingress and egress in order to show the length of rope necessary to reach across a very simple practical method of doing this without instruments is found in the french manuel de genie it is as follows the line a b the distance to be measured is extended upon the bank to d from which point after having marked it off lay off equal distances d c and c lower case d produce b c to lower case b making c b equal to c lower case b then extend the line lower case d lower case b until it intersects the prolongation of the line through c a at lower case a the distance between lower case a lower case b is equal to a b or the width of the crossing a man who is an expert swimmer then takes the end of a fishing line or a small cord in his mouth and carries it across leaving the other end fixed upon the opposite bank after which a lariat is attached to the cord and one end of it pulled across and made fast to a tree but if there is nothing convenient to which the lariat can be attached an extra axle or coupling pole can be pulled over by the man who has crossed firmly planted in the ground and the rope tied to it the rope must be long enough to extend twice across the stream so that one end may always be left on each shore a very good substitute for a ferry boat may be made with a wagon bed by filling it with empty water casks stopped tight and secured in the wagon with ropes with a cask lashed opposite the centre of each outside it is then placed in the water bottom upward and the rope that has been stretched across the stream attached to one end of it while another rope is made fast to the other end after which it is loaded the shore end loosened and the men on the opposite bank pull it across to the landing where it is discharged and returned for another load and so on until all the baggage and men are passed over the wagons can be taken across by fastening them down to the axles attaching a rope to the end of the tongue and another to the rear of each to steady it and hold it from drifting below the landing it is then pushed into the stream and the men on the opposite bank pull it over i have passed a large train of wagons in this way across a rapid stream fifteen feet deep without any difficulty i took at the same time a six-pounder cannon which was separated from its carriage and ferried over upon the wagon boat after which the carriage was pulled over in the same way as described for the wagons there are not always a sufficient number of air-tight water casks to fill a wagon bed but a tent fly pollen or wagon cover can generally be had in this event the wagon bed may be placed in the centre of one of these the cloth brought up around the ends and sides and secured firmly with ropes tied around transversely and another rope fastened lengthwise around under the rim this holds the cloth in its place and the wagon may then be placed in the water right side upward and managed in the same manner as in the other case if the cloth be made of cotton it will soon swell so as to leak but very little and answer a very good purpose another method of ferrying streams is by means of what is called by the mountaineers a bull boat the framework of which is made of willows bent into the shape of a boat and wide skiff with a flat bottom willows grow upon the banks of almost all the streams on the prairies and can be bent into any shape desired to make a boat with but one hide a number of straight willows are cut about an inch in diameter the ends sharpened and driven into the ground forming a framework in the shape of a half egg shell cut through the longitudinal axis where these rods cross they are firmly secured with strings a stout rod is then heated and bent around the frame in such a position that the edges of the hide when laid over it and drawn tight will just reach it this rod forms the gunwale which is secured by strings to the ribs small rods are then waddled in so as to make it symmetrical and strong after which the green or soaked hide is thrown over the edges sewn to the gunwales and left to dry the rods are then cut off even with the gunwale and the boat is ready for use 
To build a boat with two or more hides, a stout pole of the desired length is placed upon the ground for a keel, the ends turned up and secured by a lariat. Willow rods of the required dimensions are then cut, heated, and bent into the proper shape for knees, after which their centers are placed at equal distances upon the keel and firmly tied with cords. The knees are retained in their proper curvature by cords around the ends. After a sufficient number of them have been placed upon the keel, two poles of suitable dimensions are heated, bent around the ends for a gunwale, and firmly lashed to each knee. Smaller willows are then interwoven so as to model the frame. Green or soaked hides are cut into the proper shape to fit the frame and sewed together with buckskin strings. Then the frame of the boat is placed in the middle, the hide drawn up snug around the sides, and secured with rawhide thongs to the gunwale. The boat is then turned bottom upward and left to dry, after which the seams where they have been sewed are covered with a mixture of melted tallow and pitch. The craft is now ready for launching. A boat of this kind is very light and serviceable, but after a while becomes water-soaked, and should always be turned bottom upward to dry whenever it is not in the water. Two men can easily build a bull-boat of three hides in two days, which will carry ten men with perfect safety. A small party travelling with a pack-train, and arriving upon the banks of a deep stream, will not always have the time to stop or the means to make any of the boats that have been described. Should their luggage be such as to become seriously injured by a wetting, and there be an India rubber or gutta percha cloth disposable, or if even a green beef or buffalo hide can be procured, it may be spread out upon the ground, and the articles of baggage placed in the center, in a square or rectangular form. The ends and sides are then brought up, so as to entirely envelop the package, and the whole secured with ropes or rawhide. It is then placed in the water, with a rope attached to one end, and towed across by men in the same manner as the boats before described. If hides be used, they will require greasing occasionally, to prevent their becoming water-soaked. When a mounted party with pack animals arrive upon the borders of a rapid stream, too deep to ford, and where the banks are high and abrupt, with perhaps but one place where the beasts can get out upon the opposite shore, it would not be safe to drive or ride them in, calculating that all will make the desired landing. Some of them will probably be carried by the swift current too far down the stream, and thereby endanger not only their own lives, but the lives of their riders. I have seen the experiment tried repeatedly, and I have known several animals to be carried by this current below the point of egress, and thus drowned. Here is a simple, safe, and expeditious method of taking animals over such a stream. Suppose, for example, a party of mounted men arrive upon the bank of the stream. There will always be some good swimmers in the party, and probably others who cannot swim at all. Three or four of the most expert of these are selected, and sent across with one end of a rope made of lariats tied together, while the other end is retained upon the first bank, and made fast to the neck of a gentle and good swimming horse, after which another gentle horse is brought up, and made fast by a lariat around his neck, to the tail of the first, and so on until all the horses are thus tied together. The men who cannot swim are then mounted upon the best swimming horses and tied on, otherwise they are liable to become frightened, lose their balance, and be carried away in a rapid current, or a horse may stumble and throw his rider. After the horses have been strung out in a single line by their riders, and everything is in readiness, the first horse is led carefully into the water, while the men on the opposite bank, pulling upon the rope, thus direct him across, and if necessary aid him in stemming the current. As soon as this horse strikes bottom, he pulls upon those behind him, and thereby assists them in making the landing, and in this manner all are passed over in perfect safety. DRIVING LOOSE HORSES In travelling with loose horses across the plains, some persons are in the habit of attaching them in pairs by their halters to a long stout rope stretched between two wagons drawn by mules, each wagon being about half loaded, the principal object of the rear wagon being to hold back and keep the rope stretched, not more than two stout mules are required, as the horses aid a good deal with their heads in pulling this wagon. From thirty to forty horses may be driven very well in this manner, and if they are wild, it is perhaps the safest method except that of leading them with halters by men riding beside them. The rope to which the horses are attached should be about an inch and a quarter in diameter, with loops or rings inserted at intervals sufficient to admit the horses without allowing them to kick each other, and the halter straps tied to these loops. The horses, on first starting, should have men by their sides to accustom them to this manner of being led. The wagons should be so driven as to keep the rope continually stretched. Good drivers must be assigned to these wagons, who will constantly watch the movements of the horses attached, as well as their own teams. I have had a 150 loose horses driven by 10 mounted herdsmen. 
this requires great care for some considerable time until the horses become gentle and accustomed to their herders it is important to ascertain as soon as possible after starting which horses are wild and may be likely to stampede and lead off the herd such should be led and never suffered to run loose either on the march or in camp animals of this character will soon indicate their propensities and can be secured during the first days of the march it is desirable that all animals that will not stampede when not working should run loose on a march as they pick up a good deal of grass along the road when travelling and the success of an expedition when animals get no other forage but grass depends in a great degree upon the time given them for grazing they will thrive much better when allowed a free range than when picketed as they then are at liberty to select such grass as suits them it may therefore be set down as an infallible rule never to be departed from that all animals excepting such as will be likely to stampede should be turned loose for grazing immediately after arriving at the camping place but it is equally important that they should be carefully herded as near the camp as good grass will admit and those that it is necessary to picket should be placed upon the best grass and their places changed often the ropes to which they are attached should be about forty feet long the picket pins of iron fifteen inches long with ring and swivel at the top so that the rope shall not twist as the animal feeds around it, and the pins must be firmly driven into tenacious earth. Animals should be herded during the day at such distances as to leave sufficient grass undisturbed around and near the camp for grazing through the night. Method of Marching Among men of limited experience in frontier life will be found a great diversity of opinion regarding the best methods of marching, and of treating animals in expeditions upon the prairies some will make late starts and travel during the heat of the day without nooning while others will start early and make two marches laying by during the middle of the day some will picket their animals continually in camp while others will herd them day and night etc for mounted troops or indeed for any body of men travelling with horses and mules a few general rules may be specified which have the sanction of mature experience and a deviation from them will inevitably result in consequences highly detrimental to the best interests of an expedition in ordinary marches through a country where grass and water are abundant and good animals receiving proper attention should not fall away even if they receive no grain and as i said before they should not be made to travel faster than a walk unless absolutely necessary neither should they be taken off the road for the purpose of hunting or chasing buffalo as one buffalo chase injures them more than a week of moderate riding in the vicinity of hostile indians the animals must be carefully herded and guarded within protection of the camp while those picketed should be changed as often as the grass is eaten off within the circle described by the tether rope at night they should be brought within the chain of sentinels and picketed as compactly as is consistent with the space needed for grazing and under no circumstances unless the indians are known to be near and an attack is to be expected should they be tied up to a picket line where they can get no grass unless allowed to graze at night they will fall away rapidly and soon become unserviceable it is much better to march after nightfall turn some distance off the road and to encamp without fires in a depressed locality where the indians cannot track the party and the animals may be picketed without danger in descending abrupt hills and mountains one wheel of a loaded wagon should always be locked as this relieves the wheel animals and makes everything more secure when the declivity is great both rear wheels should be locked and if very abrupt requiring great effort on the wheel animals to hold the wagon the wheels should be rough locked by lengthening the lock chain so that the part which goes around the wheels will come directly upon the ground and thus create more friction occasionally however hills are met with so nearly perpendicular that it becomes necessary to attach ropes to the rear axle and to station men to hold back upon them and steady the vehicle down the descent rough locking is a very safe method of passing heavy artillery down abrupt declivities there are several mountains between the missouri river and california where it is necessary to resort to one of the two last mentioned methods in order to descend with security if there are no lock chains upon the wagons the front and rear wheels on the same side may be tied together with ropes so as to lock them very firmly it is an old and well-established custom among men experienced in frontier life always to cross a stream upon which it is intended to encamp for the night and this rule should never be departed from where a stream is to be forded as a rise during the night might detain the traveller for several days in awaiting the fall of the waters storms in western texas during the autumn and winter months storms arise very suddenly and when accompanied by a north wind are very severe upon men and animals indeed they are sometimes so terrific as to make it necessary for travellers to hasten to the nearest sheltered place to save the lives of their animals when these storms come from the north they are called northers 
and as during the winter season the temperature often undergoes a sudden change of many degrees at the time the storm sets in the perspiration is checked and the system receives an instantaneous shock against which it requires great vital energy to bear up men and animals are not in this mild climate prepared for these capricious meteoric revolutions and they not infrequently perish under their effects while passing near the headwaters of the colorado in october eighteen forty nine i left one of my camps at an early hour in the morning under a mild and soft atmosphere with a gentle breeze from the south but had marched only a short distance when the wind suddenly whipped around to the north bringing with it a furious chilling rain and in a short time the road became so soft and heavy as to make the labor of pulling the wagons over it very exhausting upon the mules and they came into camp in a profuse sweat with the rain pouring down in torrents upon them they were turned out of harness into the most sheltered places that could be found but instead of eating as was their custom they turned their heads from the wind and remained in that position chilled and trembling without making the least effort to move the rain continued with unabated fury during the entire day and night and on the following morning thirty-five out of one hundred and ten mules had perished while those remaining could hardly be said to have had a spark of vitality left they were drawn up with the cold and could with difficulty walk tents and wagon covers were cut up to protect them and they were then driven about for some time until a little vital energy was restored after which they commenced eating grass but it was three or four days before they recovered sufficiently to resume the march the mistake i made was in driving the mules after the norther commenced had i gone immediately into camp before they became heated and wearied they would probably have eaten the grass and this i have no doubt would have saved them but as it was their blood became heated from overwork and the sudden chill brought on a reaction which proved fatal if an animal will eat his forage plentifully there is but little danger of his perishing with cold this i assert with much confidence as i once when travelling with about fifteen hundred horses and mules encountered the most terrific snowstorm that has been known within the memory of the oldest mountaineers it commenced on the last day of april and continued without cessation for sixty consecutive hours the day had been mild and pleasant the green grass was about six inches high the trees had put out their new leaves and all nature conspired to show that the sombre garb of winter had been permanently superseded by the smiling attire of spring about dark however the wind turned into the north it commenced to snow violently and increased until it became a frightful tempest filling the atmosphere with a dense cloud of driving snow against which it was impossible to ride or walk soon after the storm set in one herd of three hundred horses and mules broke away from the herdsmen who were around them and in spite of all their efforts ran at full speed directly with the wind and snow for fifty miles before they stopped three of the herdsmen followed them as far as they were able but soon became exhausted and lost on the prairie one of them was found on his way back to camp in a strait of great prostration and suffering one of the others was found dead and the third crawling about upon his hands and knees after the storm ceased it happened fortunately that i had reserved a quantity of corn to be used in the event of finding a scarcity of grass and as soon as the ground became covered with snow so that the animals could not get at the grass i fed out the corn which i am induced to believe saved their lives indeed they did not seem to be at all affected by this prolonged and unseasonable tempest this occurred upon the summit of the elevated ridge dividing the waters of the arkansas and south platte rivers where storms are said to be of frequent occurrence the greater part of the animals that stampeded were recovered after the storm and although they had travelled a hundred miles at a very rapid pace they did not seem to be much affected by it End of chapter three Chapter four part one of the Prairie Traveller This LibriVox recording is in the public domain The Prairie Traveller by Randolph B. Marcy Chapter four part one Packing Saddles Mexican Method Madrina or Bell Mare Attachment of the Mule Illustrated Best Method of Packing Hoppling Animals Selecting Horses and Mules Grandma and Bunch Grass Packing and Driving with a train of pack animals properly organized and equipped a party may travel with much comfort and celerity it is enabled to take short cuts and move over the country in almost any direction without regard to roads mountains and broken ground may easily be traversed and exemption is gained from many of the troubles and detentions attendant upon the transit of cumbersome wagon trains one of the most essential requisites to the outfit of a pack train is a good pack saddle various patterns are in use many of which are mere instruments of torture upon the backs of the poor brutes lacerating them cruelly and causing continued pain 
The Mexican use a leathern pack saddle without a tree. It is stuffed with hay and is very large, covering almost the entire back and extending far down the sides. It is secured with a broad hair girth, and the load is kept in position by a lash rope drawn by two men so tight as to give the unfortunate beast intense suffering. A pack saddle is made by T. Grimsley, number 41 Main Street, St. Louis, Missouri. It is open at the top with a light, compact, and strong tree which fits the animal's back well and is covered with rawhide, put on green, and drawn tight by the contraction in drying. It has a leathern breast strap, breeching, and lash strap, with a broad hair girth fastened in the Mexican fashion. Of sixty-five of these saddles that I used in crossing the Rocky Mountains, over an exceedingly rough and broken section, not one of them wounded a mule's back, and I regard them as the best saddles I have ever seen. No people probably are more familiar with the art of packing than the Mexicans. They understand the habits, disposition, and powers of the mule perfectly, and will get more work out of him than any other men I have ever seen. The mule and the donkey are to them as the camel to the Arab, their porters over deserts and mountains where no other means of transportation can be used to advantage. The Spanish Mexicans are, however, cruel masters, having no mercy upon their beasts, and it is no uncommon thing for them to load their mules with the enormous burden of three or four hundred pounds. These muleteers believe that when the pack is firmly lashed, the animal supports his burden better and travels with greater ease, which seems quite probable, as the tension forms, as it were, an external sheath supporting and bracing the muscles. It also has a tendency to prevent the saddle from slipping and chafing the mule's back. With such huge cargas as the Mexicans load upon their mules, it is impossible by any precautions to prevent their backs and withers from becoming horribly mangled, and it is common to see them working their animals day after day in this miserable plight. This heavy packing causes the scars that so often mark Mexican mules. The animal, in starting out from camp in the morning, groaning under the weight of his heavy burden, seems hardly able to move, but the pack soon settles and so loosens the lashing that after a short time he moves along with more ease. Constant care and vigilance on the part of the muleteers are necessary to prevent the packs from working loose and falling off, the adjustment of a carga upon a mule does not, however, detain the caravan, as the others move on while it is being righted. If the mules are suffered to halt, they are apt to lie down, and it is very difficult for them, with their loads, to rise. Besides, they are likely to strain themselves in their efforts to do so. The Mexicans, in traveling with large caravans, usually make the day's march without nooning, as too much time would be consumed in unloading and packing up again. Packs, when taken off in camp, should be piled in a row upon the ground, and if there be a prospect of rain, the saddles should be placed over them, and the whole covered with the saddle blankets or canvas. The muleteers and herders should be mounted upon well-trained horses, and be careful to keep the animals of the caravan from wandering or scattering along the road. This can easily be done by having some of the men riding upon each side, and others in the rear of the caravan. In herding mules, it is customary among prairie travelers to have a bell mare, to which the mules soon become so attached that they will follow her wherever she goes. By keeping her in charge of one of the herdsmen, the herds are easily controlled, and during a stampede, if the herdsman mounts her and rushes ahead toward camp, they will generally follow. In crossing rivers, the bell mare should pass first, after which the mules are easily induced to take to the water and pass over, even if they have to swim. Mules are good swimmers unless they happen, by plunging off a high bank, to get water in their ears, when they are often drowned. Whenever a mule in the water drops his ears, it is a sure indication that he has water in them, and he should be taken out as soon as possible. To prevent accidents of this nature, where the water is deep and the banks abrupt, the mule herds should be allowed to enter slowly and without crowding, as otherwise they are not only likely to get their heads under water, but to throw each other over and get injured. The madrina, or bell mare, acts a most important part in a herd of mules, and is regarded by experienced campaigners as indispensable to their security. She is selected for her quiet and regular habits. She will not wander far from the camp. If she happen to have a colt by her side, this is no objection, as the mules soon form the most devoted attachment to it. I have often seen them leave their grazing when very hungry, and flock around a small colt, manifesting their delight by rubbing it with their noses, licking it with their tongues, kicking up their heels, and making a variety of other grotesque demonstrations of affection, while the poor little colt, perfectly unconscious of the cause of these ungainly caresses, stood trembling with fear but unable to make his escape from the compact circle of his mulish admirers. Horses and asses are also used as bell animals, and the mules soon become accustomed to following them, if a man leads or rides a bell animal in advance, the mules follow, like so many dogs, in the most orderly procession. 
After travelling about fourteen miles, says Bayard Taylor, we were joined by three miners, and our mules, taking a sudden liking for their horses, jogged on at a more brisk pace. The instincts of the mulish heart form an interesting study to the traveller in the mountains. I would, were the comparison not too ungallant, liken it to a woman's, for it is quite as uncertain in its sympathies, bestowing its affections when least expected, and when bestowed, quite as constant, so long as the object is not taken away. Sometimes a horse, sometimes an ass, captivates the fancy of a whole drove of mules, but often an animal nowise akin. Lieutenant Beale told me that his whole train of mules once galloped off suddenly on the plains of the Cimarron, and ran half a mile when they halted in apparent satisfaction. The cause of their freak was found to be a buffalo calf which had strayed from the herd. They were frisking around it in the greatest delight, rubbing their noses against it, throwing up their heels, and making themselves ridiculous by abortive attempts to neigh and bray while the calf, unconscious of its attractive qualities, stood trembling in their midst. "'If several large troops,' says Charles Darwin, "'are turned into one field to graze in the morning, "'the muleteer has only to lead the madrinas a little apart "'and tinkle their bells, "'and although there may be two hundred or three hundred mules together, "'each immediately knows its own bell "'and separates itself from the rest. "'The affection of these animals for their madrinas "'saves infinite trouble. "'It is nearly impossible to lose an old mule, "'for if detained several hours by force,' She will, by the power of smell, like a dog, track out her companions, or rather the madrina, for, according to the muleteer, she is the chief object of affection. The feeling, however, is not of an individual nature, for I believe I am right in saying that any animal with a bell will serve as a madrina. Of the attachment that a mule will form for a horse, I will cite an instance from my own observation, which struck me at the time as being one of the most remarkable and touching evidences of devotion that I have ever known among brute creation. On leaving Fort Leavenworth with the army for Utah in 1857, one of the officers rode a small mule whose kind and gentle disposition soon caused him to become a favorite among the soldiers, and they named him Billy. As this officer and myself were often thrown together upon the march, the mule, in the course of a few days, evinced a growing attachment for a mare that I rode, the sentiment was not, however, reciprocated on her part, and she intimated as much by the reversed position of her ears, and the free exercise of her feet and teeth whenever Billy came within her reach. But these signal marks of displeasure, instead of discouraging, rather seemed to increase his devotion, and whenever at liberty he invariably sought to get near her, and appeared much distressed when not permitted to follow her. On leaving Camp Scott for New Mexico, Billy was among the number of mules selected for the expedition. During the march, I was in the habit, when starting out from camp in the morning, of leading off the party, and directing the packman to hold the mule until I should get so far in advance with the mare that he could not see us. But the moment he was released, he would, in spite of all the efforts of the packers, start off at a most furious pace, and never stop or cease braying until he reached the mare's side. We soon found it impossible to keep him with the other mules, and he was finally permitted to have his own way." In the course of time we encountered the deep snows in the Rocky Mountains, where the animals could get no forage, and Billy, in common with the others, at length became so weak and jaded that he was unable any longer to leave his place in the caravan and break a track through the snow around to the front. He made frequent attempts to turn out and force his way ahead, but after numerous unsuccessful efforts he would fall down exhausted and set up a most mournful braying. The other mules soon began to fail, and to be left, worn out and famished, to die by the wayside, it was not, however, for some time that Billy showed symptoms of becoming one of the victims, until one evening after our arrival at camp I was informed that he had dropped down and been left upon the road during the day. The men all deplored his loss exceedingly, as his devotion to the mayor had touched their kind hearts, and many expressions of sympathy were uttered around their bivouac fires that evening. Much to our surprise, however, about ten o'clock, just as we were about going to sleep, we heard a mule braying about half a mile to the rear upon our trail. Sure enough, it proved to be Billy, who, after having rested, had followed upon our track and overtaken us. As soon as he reached the side of the mare, he lay down and seemed perfectly contented. The next day I relieved him from his pack and allowed him to run loose, but during the march he gave out and was again abandoned to his fate, and this time we certainly never expected to see him more. To our great astonishment, however, about twelve o'clock that night, the sonorous but not very musical notes of Billy in the distance aroused us from our slumbers, and again announced his approach. In an instant the men were upon their feet, 
gave three hearty cheers, and rushed out in a body to meet and escort him into camp. But this well-meant ovation elicited no response from him. He came reeling and floundering along through the deep snow, perfectly regardless of these honors, pushing aside all those who occupied the trail or interrupted his progress in the least, wandered about till he found the mare, dropped down by her side, and remained until morning. When we resumed our march on the following day, he made another desperate effort to proceed, but soon fell down exhausted, when we reluctantly abandoned him, and saw him no more. Alas, poor Billy, your constancy deserved a better fate. You may indeed be said to have been a victim to unrequited affection. The articles to be transported should be made up into two packages of precisely equal weight, and as nearly equal in bulk as practicable, otherwise they will sway the saddle over to one side and cause it to chafe the animal's back. The package is made, two ropes about six feet long are fastened around the ends by a slipknot, and if the packages contain corn or other articles that will shift about, small sticks should be placed between the sacks and the ropes, which equalizes the pressure and keeps the packages snug. The ropes are then looped at the ends, and made precisely of the same length, so that the packs will balance and come up well toward the top of the saddle. Two men, then, each taking a pack, go upon opposite sides of the mule, that has been previously saddled, and raising the pack simultaneously, place the loops over the pommel and cantle, settling them well down into their places. The lashing strap is then thrown over the top, brought through the rings upon each side, and drawn as tight at every turn as the two men on the sides can pull it, and after having been carried back and forth diagonally across the packs as often as its length admits, generally three or four times, it is made fast to one of the rings, and securely tied in a slipknot. The breast strap and breeching must not be buckled so close as to chafe the skin. The girth should be broad and soft where it comes opposite the forelegs to prevent cutting them. Leather girth should be wrapped with cloth or bound with soft material. The hair girth, being soft and elastic, is much better than leather. The crupper should never be dispensed with in a mountainous country, but it must be soft, round, and about an inch in diameter where it comes in contact with the tail. Otherwise it will wound the animal in making long and abrupt descents. In Norway they use a short round stick about ten inches long which passes under the tail, and from each end of this a cord connects with the saddle. Camp kettles, tin vessels, and other articles that will rattle and be likely to frighten animals should be firmly lashed to the packs. When the packs work loose, the lash strap should be untied, and a man upon each side draw it up again and make it fast. When ropes are used for lashing, they may be tightened by twisting them with a short stick and making the stick fast. One hundred and twenty-five pounds is a sufficient load for a mule upon a long journey. In traveling over a rocky country, and upon all long journeys, horses and mules should be shod to prevent their hoofs wearing out or breaking. The mountaineers contend that beasts travel better without shoeing, but I have several times had occasion to regret the omission of this very necessary precaution. A few extra shoes and nails with a small hammer will enable travelers to keep their animals shod. In turning out pack animals to graze, it is well either to keep the lariat ropes upon them with the ends trailing upon the ground, or to hopple them, as no corral can be made into which they may be driven in order to catch them. A very good way to catch an animal without driving him into an enclosure is for two men to take a long rope and stretch it out at the height of the animal's neck. Some men then drive him slowly up against it, when one of the men with the rope runs around behind the animal and back to the front again, thus taking a turn with the rope around his neck and holding him secure. To prevent an animal from kicking, take a forked stick and make the forked part fast to the bridle bit, bringing the two ends above the head and securing them there, leaving the part of the stick below the fork of sufficient length to reach near the ground when the animal's head is in its natural position. He cannot kick up unless he lowers his head, and the stick effectually prevents that. Tether rope should be so attached to the neck of the animal as not to slip and choke him, and the picket pins never be left on the ropes except when in the ground as, in the event of a stampede, they are very likely to swing around and injure the animals. Many experienced travelers were formerly in the habit of securing their animals with a strap or iron ring fastened around the fetlock of one forefoot, and this attached to the tether rope. This method holds the animal very securely to the picket pin, but when the rope is first put on, and before he becomes accustomed to it, he is liable to throw himself down and get hurt, so that I think the plan of tethering by the neck or halter is the safest, and so far as I have observed, is now universally practiced. The mountaineers and Indians seldom tether their animals, but prefer the plan of hoppling, as this gives them more latitude for ranging and selecting the choicest grass. Two methods of hoppling are practiced among the Indians and hunters of the West, one with a strap about two feet long buckling around the forelegs above the fetlock joints, 
The other is what they term the side hopple, which is made by buckling a strap around a front and rear leg upon the same side. In both cases, care should be taken not to buckle the strap so tight as to chafe the legs. The latter plan is the best, because the animal, side hoppled, is able to go but little faster than a walk, while the front hopple permits him, after a little practice, to gallop off at considerable speed. If the hopples are made of iron connected with chains, like handcuffs, with locks and keys, it will be impossible for the Indians without files to cut them, but the parts that come in contact with the legs should be covered with soft leather. A horse, says Mr. Galton, may be hobbled with a stirrup leather, by placing the middle around one leg, then twisting it several times and buckling it round the other leg. When you wish to picket horses in the middle of a sandy plain, dig a hole two or three feet deep, and tying your rope to a faggot of sticks or brushwood, or even to a bag filled with sand, bury this in it. For prairie service, horses which have been raised exclusively upon grass, and never been fed on grain or range horses, as they are called in the West, are decidedly the best, and will perform more hard labor than those that have been stabled and groomed. The large, stout ponies found among some of our frontier settlements are well adapted to this service, and endure admirably. The same remarks hold good in the choice of mules, and it will be found that the square-built, big-bellied, and short-legged Mexican mule will endure far more hard service on short allowance of forage than the larger American mule which has been accustomed to grain. In our trip across the Rocky Mountains we had both the American and Mexican mules, and improved a good opportunity of giving their relative powers of endurance a thorough service trial. For many days they were reduced to a meagre allowance of dry grass, and at length got nothing but pine leaves, while their work in the deep snow was exceedingly severe. This soon told upon the American mules, and all of them, with the exception of two, died, while most of the Mexican mules went through. The result was perfectly conclusive. We found that where the snow was not more than two feet deep, the animals soon learned to paw it away and get at the grass. Of course they do not get sufficient in this way, but they do much better than one would suppose. In Utah and New Mexico the autumn is so dry that the grass does not lose its nutritious properties by being washed with rains. It gradually dries and cures like hay, so that animals eat it freely, and will fatten upon it even in midwinter. It is seldom that any grain is fed to stock in either of these territories. Several of the varieties of grass, growing upon the slopes of the Rocky Mountains, are of excellent quality. Among these may be mentioned the grama and bunch grasses. Horses and mules turned out to graze always prefer the grass upon the mountain's sides to grass of the valleys. We left New Mexico about the first of March, six weeks before the new grass appeared, with fifteen hundred animals, many of them low in flesh, yet they improved upon the journey, and on their arrival in Utah were all, with very few exceptions, in fine working condition. Had this march been made at the same season, in the country bordering upon the Missouri River, where there are heavy autumnal rains, the animals would probably have become very poor. In this journey the herds were allowed to range over the best grass that could be found, but were guarded both night and day with great care, whereas if they had been corralled or picketed at night, I dare say they would have lost flesh. Footnote. Some curious and interesting experiments are said to have been recently made at the veterinary school at Alfort, near Paris, by order of the Minister of War, to ascertain the powers of endurance of horses. It appears that a horse will live on water alone five and twenty days, seventeen days without eating or drinking, only five days if fed unwatered, ten days if fed and insufficiently watered. A horse kept without water for three days drank one hundred and four pounds of water in three minutes. It was found that a horse taken immediately after feed, and kept in the active exercise of the squadron school, completely digested its feed in three hours. In the same time, in the conscript school, its food was two-thirds digested, and, if kept perfectly quiet in the stable, its digestion was scarcely commenced in three hours. End of footnote. End of chapter 4, part 1. Chapter 4, Part 2 of The Prairie Traveller. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Prairie Traveller by Randolph B. Marcy. Chapter 4, Part 2. European Saddles, California Saddle, Saddle Wounds, Alkali, Flies, Colic, Rattlesnake Bites, Cures for the Bite. Saddles. Great diversity of opinion exists regarding the best equipment for horses, and the long-mooted question is as yet very far from being definitely settled. I do not regard the opinions of Europeans as having a more direct bearing upon this question, or as tending to establish any more definite and positive conclusions regarding it, than have been developed by the experience of our own border citizens. 
the major part of whose lives has been spent in the saddle yet i am confident that the following brief description of the horse equipments used in different parts of europe the substance of which i have extracted from captain mcclellan's interesting report will be read with interest and instruction the saddle used by the african chasseurs consists of a plain wooden tree with a pad upon the top but without skirts and is somewhat similar to our own military saddle but lower in the pommel and cantle the girth and surcingle are of leather with an ordinary woolen saddle blanket their bridle has a single head stall with the spanish bit buckled to it a new saddle has recently been introduced into the french service by captain cojean the tree of which is cut out of a single piece of wood the cantle only being glued on and a piece of walnut let into the pommel with a thin strip veneered upon the front ends of the bars the pommel and cantle are lower than in the old model the whole is covered with wet rawhide glued on and sewed at the edges the great advantage this saddle possesses is in being so arranged that it may be used for horses of all sizes and conditions the saddle blanket is made of thick felt cloth and is attached to the pommel by a small strap passing through holes in the blanket which is thus prevented from slipping and at the same time it raises the saddle so as to admit a free circulation of air over the horse's spine the hungarian saddle is made of hard wood entirely uncovered with a raised pommel and cantle the seat is formed with a leather strap four inches wide nailed to the forks on the front and rear and secured to the sideboards by leather thongs thus giving an elastic and easy saddle seat this is also the form of the saddle tree used by the russian and austrian cavalry the russians have a leather girth fastened by three small buckles it passes over the tree and is tied to the sideboards the saddle blanket is of stout felt cloth in four thicknesses and a layer of black leather over it and the whole held together by leather thongs passing through and through when the horse falls off in flesh more thicknesses are added and vice versa this saddle blanket is regarded by the russian officers as the best possible arrangement the russians use the curb and snaffle bits made of steel the cossack saddle has a thick padding under the sideboards and on the seat which raises the rider very high on his horse so that his feet are above the bottom of the belly their bridle has but a simple snaffle bit and no martingale the prussian cuirassier have a heavy saddle with a low pommel and cantle covered with leather but it is not thought by captain mcclellan to present anything worthy of imitation the other prussian cavalry ride the hungarian saddle of a heavier model than the one in the austrian service the surcingle is of leather and fastens in the mexican style the girth is also of leather three and a half inches wide with a large buckle it is in two parts attached to the bars by rawhide thongs the curb and snaffle steel bits are used and attached to a single head stall the english cavalry use a saddle which has a lower cantle and pommel than our grimsley saddle covered with leather the snaffle bit is attached to the halter head stall by a chain and tee the curb has a separate head stall which on a march is occasionally taken off and hung on the carbine stock the sardinian saddle has a bare wooden tree very similar to the hungarian a common blanket folded in twelve thicknesses is placed under it the girth and surcingle are of leather without expressing any opinion as to the comparative merits of these different saddles i may be permitted to give a few general principles which i regard as infallible in the choice of a saddle the sideboards should be large and made to conform to the shape of the horse's back thereby distributing the burden over a large surface it should stand up well above the spine so as to admit a free circulation of air under it for long journeys the crupper where it comes in contact with the tail should be made of soft leather it should be drawn back only far enough to hold the saddle from the withers some horses require much more tension upon the crupper than others the girth should be made broad of a soft and elastic material those made of hair in use among the mexicans fulfil the presided conditions a light and easy bit which will not fret or chafe the horse is recommended the saddle blanket must be folded even and smooth and placed on so as to cover every part of the back that comes in contact with the saddle and in warm weather it is well to place a gunny bag under the blanket as it is cooler than the wool it will have been observed that in the french service the folded saddle blanket is tied to the pommel to prevent it slipping back this is well if the blanket be taken off and thoroughly dried whenever the horse is unsaddled a saddle blanket made of moss is used in some of the southwestern states which is regarded by many as the perfection of this article of horse equipment it is a mat woven into the proper shape and size from the beaten fibres of moss that hangs from the trees in our southern states it is cheap durable is not in any way affected by sweat and does not chafe or heat the horse's spine like the woolen blanket its open texture allows a rapid evaporation 
which tends to keep the back cool and obviates the danger of stripping and sudden exposure of the heated parts to the sun and air the experience of some of our officers who have used this mat for years in mexico and texas corroborates all i have said in its favor and they are unanimous in the opinion that a horse will never get a sore back when it is placed under a good saddle a saddle made by the mexicans in california is called the california saddle this is extensively used upon the pacific slope of the mountains and is believed to possess at least as many advantages for rough frontier service as any other pattern that has been invented those hardy and experienced veterans the mountaineers could not be persuaded to ride any other saddle, and their ripened knowledge of such matters certainly gives weight to their conclusions. The merits of the California saddle consist in its being light, strong, and compact, and conforming well to the shape of the horse. When strapped on, it rests so firmly in position that the strongest pull of a horse upon a lariat attached to the pommel cannot displace it. Its shape is such that the rider is compelled to sit nearly erect, with his legs on the continuation of the line of the body, which makes his seat more secure, and at the same time gives him a better control over his arms and horse. This position is attained by setting the stirrup leathers farther back than on the old-fashioned saddle. The pommel is high like the Mexican saddle, and prevents the rider from being thrown forward. The tree is covered with raw hide, put on green and sewed. When this dries and contracts, it gives it great strength. It has no iron in its composition, but is kept together by buckskin strings, and can easily be taken to pieces for mending or cleaning. It has a hair girth about five inches wide. The whole saddle is covered with a large and thick sheet of sole leather, having a hole to lay over the pommel. It extends back over the horse's hips and protects them from the rain, and when taken off in camp it furnishes a good security against dampness when placed under the traveler's bed. The California saddle tree is regarded by many as the best of all others for the horse's back, and as having an easier seat than the Mexican. General Comte de la roche aimon in his treatise upon light troops, published in Paris in 1856, says, In nearly all the European armies the equipment of the horse is not in harmony with the new tactics, with those tactics in which during nearly all of a campaign the cavalry remains in bivouac. Have we reflected upon the kind of saddle which under these circumstances would cover the horse best without incommoding him during the short periods that he is permitted to repose? Have we reflected upon the kind of saddle which, offering the least fragility, exposes the horse to the least danger of sore back? All the cuirassiers and the dragoons of Europe have saddles which they call French saddle, the weight of which is a load for the horse. The interior mechanisms of these saddles is complicated and filled with weak bands of iron, which become deranged, bent, and sometimes break. The rider does not perceive these accidents, or he does not wish to perceive them, for fear of being left behind or of having to go on foot. He continues on, and at the end of a day's march his horse has a sore back, and in a few days is absolutely unserviceable. We may satisfy ourselves of the truth of these observations by comparing the list of horses sent to the rear during the course of a campaign by the cuirassiers and dragoons who use the French saddle, and by the hussars with the Hungarian saddle. The number sent to the rear by the latter is infinitely less, although employed in a service much more active and severe, and it might be still less by making some slight improvements in the manner of fixing their saddle upon the horse. It is a long time since Marshal Saxe said, there was but one kind of saddle fit for cavalry, which was the hussar saddle. This combined all advantages, lightness, solidity, and economy. It is astonishing that the system of actual war had not led to the employment of the kind of saddle in use among the Tartars, the Cossacks, the Hungarians, and indeed among all horsemen and nomads. This saddle has the incontestable advantage of permitting the horse to lie down and rest himself without inconvenience. If, notwithstanding the folded blanket which they place under the Hungarian saddle, this saddle will still wound the animal's back sometimes, this only proceeds from the friction occasioned by the motion of the horse and the movement of the rider upon the saddle, a friction which it will be nearly impossible to avoid, inasmuch as the saddle-bow is held in its place only by a surcingle, the ends of which are united by a leathern band. These bands always relax more or less, and the saddle becomes loose. To remedy this, I propose to attach to the saddle-bow itself a double girth, one end of which shall be made fast to the arch in front, and the other end to the rear of the arch upon the right side, to unite in a single girth, which would buckle to a strap attached upon the left side in the usual manner. This buckle will hold the saddle firmly in its place. Notwithstanding all these precautions, however, 
there were still some inconveniences resulting from the nature of the blanket placed under the saddle which i sought to remedy and i easily accomplished it the woollen nap of the cavalry saddle blankets not being carefully attended to soon wears off and leaves only the rough coarse threads of the fabric this absorbs the sweat from the horse and after it has dried and become hard it acts like a rasp upon the withers first taking off the hair next the skin and then the flesh and finally the beast is rendered unserviceable i sought during the campaign of eighteen o seven a means to remedy this evil and i soon succeeded by a process as simple as it was cheap i distributed among a great number of cavalry soldiers pieces of linen cloth folded double two feet square and previously dipped in melted tallow this cloth was laid next to the horse's back under the saddle blanket and it prevented all the bad effects of the woolen blanket no horses after this appliance were afflicted with sore backs such are the slight changes which i believe should be made in the use of the hungarian saddle the remainder of the equipment should remain as it has always been composed of a breast-strap crupper and martingale etc the improvements of the present age do not appear to have developed anything advantageous to this saddle on the contrary after experimenting upon numerous modifications and inventions public sentiment has at length given the preference to the saddle trees of the natives in asia and america which is very similar to that of the hungarians sores and diseases if a horse be sweating at the time he is unsaddled it is well to strap the folded saddle blanket upon his back with the surcingle where it is allowed to remain until he is perfectly dry this causes the back to cool gradually and prevents scalding or swelling some persons are in the habit of washing their horses backs while heated and sweating with cold water but this is pernicious and often produces sores it is well enough to wash the back after it cools but not before after horses backs or shoulders once become chafed and sore it is very difficult to heal them particularly when they are continued at work it is better if practicable to stop using them for a while and wash the bruised parts often with castile soap and water should it be necessary however to continue the animal in use i have known very severe saddle sores entirely healed by the free application of grease to the parts immediately after halting and while the animal is warm and sweating this seems to harden the skin and heal the wound even when working with the collar in contact with it a piece of bacon rind tied upon the collar over the wound is also an excellent remedy in texas when the horse-flies are numerous they attack animals without mercy and where a contusion is found in the skin they deposit eggs which speedily produce worms in great numbers i have tried the effects of spirits of turpentine and several other remedies but nothing seemed to have the desired effect but calomel blown into the wound which destroys the worms and soon effected a cure in the vicinity of the south pass upon the humboldt river and in some sections upon other routes to california alkaline water is found which is very poisonous to animals that drink it and generates a disease known in california as alkali this disease first makes its appearance by swellings upon the abdomen and between the forelegs and is attended with a cough which ultimately destroys the lungs and kills the animals if taken at an early stage this disease is curable and the following treatment is generally considered as the most efficacious the animal is first raked after which a large dose of grease is poured down its throat acids are said to have the same effect and give immediate relief when neither of these remedies can be procured many of the emigrants have been in the habit of mixing starch or flour in a bucket of water and allowing the animal to drink it it is supposed that this forms a coating over the mucous membrane and thus defeats the action of the poison animals should never be allowed to graze in the vicinity of alkaline water as the deposits upon the grass after floods are equally deleterious with the water itself in seasons when the water is low in the humboldt river there is much less danger of the alkali as the running water in the river then comes from pure mountain springs and is confined to the channel whereas during high water when the banks are overflowed the salts are dissolved making the water more impure for colic a good remedy is a mixture of two tablespoonsful of brandy and two teaspoonsful of laudanum dissolved in a bottle of water and poured down the animal's throat another remedy which has been recommended to me by an experienced officer as producing speedy relief is a tablespoonful of chloride of lime dissolved in a bottle of water and administered as in the other case rattlesnake bites upon the southern routes to california rattlesnakes are often met with but it is seldom that any person is bitten by them yet this is a possible contingency and it can never be amiss to have an antidote at hand hartshorn applied externally to the wound and drunk in small quantities diluted with water whenever the patient becomes faint or exhausted from the effects of the poison is one of the most common remedies 
in the absence of all medicines a string or ligature should at once be bound firmly above the puncture then scarify deep with a knife suck out the poison and spit out the saliva anderson in his book on southwestern africa says in the cape colony the dutch farmers resort to a cruel but apparently effective plan to counteract the bad effects of a serpent's bite an incision having been made in the breast of a living fowl the bitten part is applied to the wound if the poison be very deadly the bird soon evinces symptoms of distress becomes drowsy droops its head and dies it is replaced by a second a third and more if requisite when however the bird no longer exhibits any of the signs just mentioned the patient is considered out of danger a frog similarly applied is supposed to be equally efficacious hanberg in his travels in south africa mentions an antidote against the bite of serpents he says the blood of the turtle was much cried up which on account of this extraordinary virtue the inhabitants dry in the form of small scales or membranes and carry about them when they travel in this country which swarms with this most noxious vermin whenever any one is wounded by a serpent he takes a couple of pinches of the dried blood internally and applies a little of it to the wound i was present upon one occasion when an indian child was struck in the forefinger by a large rattlesnake his mother who was near at the time seized him in her arms and placing the wounded finger in her mouth sucked the poison from the puncture for some minutes repeatedly spitting out the saliva after which she chewed and mashed some plantain leaves and applied to the wound over this she sprinkled some finely powdered tobacco and wrapped the finger up in a rag i did not observe that the child suffered afterwards the least pain or inconvenience the immediate application of the remedies probably saved his life irritation from the bites of gnats and mosquitoes etc may be relieved by chewing the plantain and rubbing the spittle on the bite i know of another instance near fort towson in northern texas where a small child was left upon the earthen floor of a cabin while its mother was washing at a spring near by she heard a cry of distress and on going to the cabin what was her horror on seeing a rattlesnake coiled around the child's arm and striking it repeatedly with its fangs after killing the snake she hurried to her nearest neighbor procured a bottle of brandy and returned as soon as possible but the poison had already so operated upon the arm that it was as black as a negro's she poured down the child's throat a huge draught of the liquor which soon took effect making it very drunk and stopped the action of the poison although the child was relieved it remained sick for a long time but ultimately recovered a man was struck in the leg by a very large rattlesnake near fort belknap texas in 1853 no other remedy being at hand a small piece of indigo was pulverized made into a poultice with water and applied to the puncture it seemed to draw out the poison turning the indigo white after which it was removed and another poultice applied these applications were repeated until the indigo ceased to change its color the man was then carried to the hospital at fort belknap and soon recovered and the surgeon of the post pronounced it a very satisfactory cure a chickasaw woman who was bitten upon the foot near fort washita by a ground rattlesnake a very venomous species drank a bottle of whiskey and applied the indigo poultice and when i saw her three days afterwards she was recovering but the flesh around the wound sloughed away a delaware remedy which is said to be efficacious is to burn powder upon the wound but i have never known it to be tried excepting upon a horse in this case it was successful or at all events the animal recovered of all the remedies known to me i should decidedly prefer ardent spirits it is considered a sovereign antidote among our western frontier settlers and i would make use of it with great confidence it must be taken until the patient becomes very much intoxicated and this requires a large quantity as the action of the poison seems to counteract its effects should the fangs of the snake penetrate deep enough to reach an artery it is probable the person would die in a short time i imagine however that this does not often occur the following remedial measures for the treatment of the bites of poisonous reptiles are recommended by dr philip weston in the london lancet for july eighteen fifty nine one the application of a ligature round the limb close to the wound between it and the heart to arrest the return of venous blood excision of the bitten parts or free incision through the wounds made by the poison teeth subsequently encouraging bleeding by warm solutions to favor the escape of the poison from the circulation three cauterization widely round the limb of the bite with a strong solution of nitrate of silver one drachma to the ounce to prevent the introduction of the poison into the system by the lymphatics four as soon as indications of the absorption of the poison into the circulation begin to manifest themselves the internal administration of ammonia in aerated or soda water every quarter of an hour to support the nervous energy and allay the distressing thirst 
but he continues there is yet wanting some remedy that shall rapidly counteract the poison introduced into the blood and assist in expelling it from the system the well authenticated accounts of the success attending the internal use of arsenic in injuries arising from the bites of venomous reptiles in the east and west indies and also in africa and the well-known properties of this medicine as a powerful tonic and alternatives in conditions of impaired vitality of the blood arising from the absorption of certain blood poisons would lead me to include this agent in the treatment already mentioned it should be administered in combination with ammonia in full doses frequently repeated so as to neutralize quickly the poison circulating in the blood before it can be eliminated from the system this could readily be accomplished by adding ten to fifteen minims of fowler's solution to the compound spirit of ammonia to be given every quarter of an hour in aerated or soda water until the vomiting and the more urgent symptoms of the collapse have subsided subsequently repeating the dose at longer intervals until reaction had become fully established and the patient relieved by copious bilious dejections cedrone which is a nut that grows on the isthmus of panama and which is sold by the druggists in new york is said to be an infallible antidote to serpent bites in the boulet de la ca de med for february eighteen fifty eight it is stated that a man was bitten at panama by a coral snake the most poisonous species on the isthmus during the few seconds that it took him to take the cedrone from his bag he was seized with violent pains at the heart and throat but he had scarcely chewed and swallowed a piece of the nut about the size of a small bean when the pains ceased as by magic he chewed a little more and applied it externally to the wound when the pains disappeared and were followed by copious evacuation of a substance like curdled milk many other cases are mentioned where the cedrone proved an antidote End of chapter four part two Chapter Five of the Prairie Traveller. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Prairie Traveller by Randolph B. Marcy. Chapter Five, Part One. Bivouacs, Tente d'Abri, Gutta Percha Knapsack Tent, Comanche Lodge, Sibley Tent, Camp Furniture, Litters, Rapid Traveling. Bivouacs and Tents. In traveling with pack animals, it is not always convenient or practicable to transport tents, and the traveler's ingenuity is often taxed in devising the most available means for making himself comfortable and secure against winds and storms. I have often been astonished to see how soon an experienced voyager, without any resources save those provided by nature, will erect a comfortable shelter in a place where a person having no knowledge of woodcraft would never think of such a thing almost all people in different parts of the world have their own peculiar method of bivouacking in the severe climate of tibet dr hooker informs us that they encamp near large rocks which absorb the heat during the day and give it out slowly during the night they form as it were reservoirs of caloric the influence of which is exceedingly grateful during a cold night in the polar regions the eskimo live and make themselves comfortable in huts of ice or snow and with no other combustible but oil the natives of australia bury their bodies in the sand keeping their heads only above the surface and thus sleep warm during the chilly nights of that climate fortunately for the health and comfort of travellers upon the plains the atmosphere is pure and dry during the greater part of the year and it is seldom that any rain or dew is seen neither are there marshes or ponds of stagnant water to generate putrid exhalations and poisonous malaria the night air of the summer months is soft exhilarating and delightful Persons may therefore sleep in it and inhale it with perfect impunity, and indeed may prefer this to breathing the confined atmosphere of a house or tent. During the rainy season only is it necessary to seek shelter. In travelling with covered wagons, one always has protection from storms, but with pack trains it becomes necessary to improvise the best substitutes for tents. A very secure protection against storms may be constructed by planting firmly in the ground two upright poles with forks at their tops and crossing them with a light pole laid in the forks, a gutta-percha cloth or sheet of canvas, or in the absence of either of these two, blankets, may be attached by one side to the horizontal pole, the opposite edge being stretched out to the windward at an angle of about forty-five degrees to the ground, and there fastened with wooden pins or with buckskin strings tied to the lower border of the cloth, and to pegs driven firmly into the earth. This forms a shelter for three or four men, and is a good defense against winds and rains, if a fire be then made in front the smoke will be carried away so as not to incommode the occupants of the bivouac this is called a half-faced camp 
Another method practiced a great deal among mountain men and Indians consists in placing several rough poles equidistant around a half circle, and bringing the small ends together at the top, where they are bound with a thong. This forms the conical framework of the bivouac, which, when covered with a cloth stretched around it, makes a very good shelter, and is preferable to the half-faced camp, because the sides are covered. When no cloths, blankets, or hides are at hand to be placed over the poles of the lodge, it may be covered with green boughs laid on compactly, so as to shed a good deal of rain, and keep out the wind in cold weather. We adopted this description of shelter in crossing the Rocky Mountains during the winter of 1857-58, and thus formed a very effectual protection against the bleak winds which sweep with great violence over those lofty and inhospitable sierras. We always selected a dense thicket for our encampment, and covered the lodges with a heavy coating of pine boughs, waddling them together as completely as possible, and piling snow upon the outside in such a manner as to make them quite impervious to the wind. The fires were then kindled at the mouths of the lodges, and our heads and bodies were completely sheltered, while our feet were kept warm by the fires. The French troops, while serving in the Crimea, used what they called the Tente d'Aubry, or shelter tent, which seems to have been received with great favor in Europe. It is composed of two, four, or six square pieces of cloth, with buttons and buttonholes adjusted upon the edges, and is pitched by planting two upright stakes in the ground, at a distance corresponding with the length of the canvas when buttoned together. The two sticks are connected by a cord passed around the top of each, drawn tight, and the ends made fast to pins driven firmly into the ground. The canvas is then laid over the rope between the sticks, spread out at an angle of about 45 degrees, and the lower edges secured to the earth with wooden pins. This makes some defense against the weather, and was the only shelter enjoyed by the mass of the French army in the Crimea up to October 1855. For a permanent camp, it is usual to excavate a shallow basement under the tent, and to bank up the earth on the outside in cold weather. It is designed that upon marches the tente d'abri shall be taken to pieces and carried by the soldiers. A tent has recently been prepared by Mr. John Ryder, 165 Broadway, New York, which is called the Tent Knapsack. It has been examined by a board of army officers and recommended for adoption in our military service. This tent is somewhat similar to the tente d'abri, and is pitched in the same manner, but it has the advantage that each separate piece may be converted into a waterproof knapsack. The following extracts from the report of the board go to show that this tent knapsack will be useful to parties traveling on the prairies with pack trains. It is a piece of gutta percha five feet three inches long and three feet eight inches wide, with double edges on one side and brass studs and buttonholes along two edges, and straps and buckles on the fourth edge, the whole weighing three pounds, two sticks three feet eight inches long by one and one quarter inches in diameter, and a small cord. When used as a knapsack, the clothing is packed in a cotton bag, and the gutta percha sheet is folded round it, lapping at the ends. The clothing is thus protected by two or three thicknesses of gutta percha, and in this respect there is a superiority over the knapsack now used by our troops. Other advantages are that the tent knapsack has no seams, the parts at which those in use wear out soonest. It adapts itself to the size of the contents, so that a compact and portable bundle can be made, whether the kit be entire or not and with the cotton bag it forms a convenient, commodious, and durable receptacle for all a soldier's clothing and necessaries. On a scout, a soldier usually carries only a blanket, overcoat, and at most a single shirt, pair of drawers, and a pair of socks, all of which can be packed in the tent knapsack in a small bundle, perfectly protected from rain, and capable of being suspended from the shoulders, and carried with comfort and ease during a march. Second, as a shelter, the studs and eyelets along two edges of the tent knapsack are for the purpose of fastening a number of them together, and thus making a sheet of larger dimensions. A sheet formed by fastening together four knapsacks was exhibited to the board, stretched upon a frame of wood. When used in service, the sheet is to be stretched on a rope supported by two poles, or by two rifles, muskets, or carbines, and pinned down at the sides with six pins, three on each side. The sheet of four knapsacks is ten feet six inches long and seven feet four inches wide, and when pitched on a rope four feet four inches above the ground, covers a horizontal space six feet six inches wide and seven feet four inches long, which will accommodate five men, and may be made to shelter seven. The sheet can also be used on the ground, and is a great protection from dampness, and as a shawl or talma, indeed, a variety of advantageous uses to which the gutta percha sheet may be put will suggest themselves to persons using it. The board is satisfied with its merits in all the uses to which it is proposed to be put, and is of the opinion that the gutta-percha tent knapsack may be adopted in the military service with advantage. 
the usual tenement of the prairie tribes and of the traders trappers and hunters who live among them is the comanche lodge which is made of eight straight peeled poles about twenty feet long covered with hides or cloth the lodge is pitched by connecting the smaller extremities of three of the poles with one end of a long line the three poles are then raised perpendicularly and the larger extremities spread out in a tripod to the circumference of the circle that is to form the base of the lodge the other poles are then raised laid into the forks of the three first and spread out equidistant upon the circle thus forming the conical framework of the structure nine or ten poles are generally used in one lodge the long line attached to the tripod is then wound several times around the top where the poles intersect and the lower end made fast to the base of the lodge thus securing the frame firmly in position the covering made of buffalo hides dressed without the hair and cut and sewed together to fit the conical framework is raised with a pole spread out around the structure and united at the edges with sharpened wooden pegs leaving sufficient space open at the bottom for a doorway which may be closed with a blanket spread out with two small sticks and suspended over the opening the lower edge of the lodge is made fast to the ground with wooden pins the apex is left open with a triangular wing or flap on each side and the windward flap constantly stretched out by means of a pole inserted into a pocket at the end of it which causes it to draw like a sail and thus occasions a draught from the fire built upon the ground in the centre of the lodge and makes it warm and comfortable in the coldest winter weather canvas makes a very good substitute for the buffalo skin covering sibley tent a tent has been invented by major h h sibley of the army which is known as the sibley tent it is somewhat similar to the comanche lodge but in place of the conical framework of poles it has but one upright standard resting upon an iron tripod in the centre the tripod can be used to suspend cooking utensils over the fire and when folded up admits the wooden standard between the legs thereby reducing the length one half and making it more convenient for packing and travelling this tent constituted the entire shelter of the army in utah during the winter of eighteen fifty seven fifty eight and notwithstanding the severity of the climate in the elevated locality of camp scott the troops were quite comfortable and pleased with the tent in permanent camps the sibley tent may be so pitched as to give more room by erecting a tripod upon the outside with three poles high and stout enough to admit of the tents being suspended by ropes attached to the apex this method dispenses with the necessity of the central upright standard when the weather is very cold the tent may be made warmer by excavating a basement about three feet deep which also gives a wall to the tent making it more roomy the tent used in the army will shelter comfortably twelve men captain g rhodes of the english army in his recent work upon tents and tent life has given a description of most of the tents used in the different armies in europe but in my judgment none of them in point of convenience comfort and economy will compare with the sibley tent for campaigning in cold weather one of its most important features that of admitting of a fire within it and of causing a draught by the disposition of the wings is not that i am aware possessed by any other tent moreover it is exempt from the objections that are urged against some other tents on account of insalubrity from want of top ventilation to carry off the impure air during the night camp furniture the accompanying illustration presents some convenient articles of portable camp furniture camp chair number one camp chair number one is of oak or other hardwood figure one represents it open for use in figure two it is closed for transportation a is a stout canvas forming the back and seat b b b are iron butt hinges c c are leather straps one inch and a quarter wide forming the arms d is an iron rod with a nut and screw at one end camp chairs number two and three camp chair number two is made of sticks tied together with thongs of buckskin or rawhide camp chair number three is a very comfortable seat made of a barrel the part forming the seat being filled with grass camp table figure one represents the table folded for transportation in figure two it is spread out for use a is the top of the table a a are sideboards and c c are end boards turning on butt hinges b b b field cot number one field cot number two field cots in number one a represents the cot put up for use b the cot folded for transportation the legs turn upon iron bolts running through the head and footboards they are then placed upon the canvas and the whole is rolled up around the side pieces in number two the upper figure represents the cot put up for use the lower shows it folded for transportation a is a stout canvas b b are iron butt hinges c c the legs d d leather straps with buckles which hold the legs firm 
FF ends, which fold upon hinges. GG crossbars from leg to leg. This cot is strong, light, and portable. Camp Bureau. This cut represents two chests, AA with their handles, AA, the covers taken off, they are placed one upon the other, and secured by the clamps, BB. D shows the division between the two chests. When it is to be transported, the knobs, C, are unscrewed from the drawers, the looking glass, F, is removed, the drawers are filled with clothing, etc., and the lids are screwed on. Mess Chest. A represents the chest open for table. B is the same closed. C is the upper tray of tin with compartments BB. E is the lower wooden tray divided into compartments. A A for various purposes and made fast to the bottom of the chest. D D are lids opening with hinges. F in figure B is a wooden leg turning upon a hinge and fitting snugly between two pieces of wood screwed upon the cover. Litters. Should a party traveling with pack animals and without ambulances or wagons have one of its members wounded or taken so sick as to be unable to walk or ride on horseback a litter may be constructed by taking two poles about twenty feet in length uniting them by two sticks three feet long lashed across the centre at six feet apart and stretching a piece of stout canvas a blanket or hide between them to form the bed two steady horses or mules are then selected placed between the poles on the front and rear of the litter and the ends of the poles made fast to the sides of the animals either by attachment to the stirrups or to the ends of straps secured over their backs. The patient may then be placed upon the litter, and is ready for the march. The elasticity of the long poles gives an easy motion to the conveyance, and makes this method of locomotion much more comfortable than might be supposed. The prairie Indians have a way of transporting their sick and children upon a litter very similar in construction to the one just described, excepting that one animal is used instead of two. One end of the litter is made fast to the sides of the animal, while the other is left to trail upon the ground. A projection is raised for the feet to rest against and prevent the patient from sliding down. Instead of canvas, the Indians sometimes lash a large willow basket across the poles, in which they place the person to be transported. The animals harnessed to the litter must be carefully conducted upon the march, and caution used in passing over rough and broken ground. Hand Litter a very convenient and comfortable method of packing a sick or wounded man when there are no animals disposable, and which is sometimes resorted to by the Indians, is to take two small poles about ten feet long, and lash three cross pieces to them, one in the center, and the other two about eighteen inches from the ends. A blanket or hide is then secured firmly to this frame, and the patient placed upon it under the center cross piece, which prevents him from falling out. Two men act as carriers, walking between the ends of the long poles. The patient may be protected against rain or sun by bending small willows over the frame and covering them with a cloth. Rapid Traveling Small parties with good animals, light vehicles, and little lading may traverse the plains rapidly and comfortably if the following injunctions be observed. The day's drive should commence as soon as it is light, and where the road is good the animals kept upon a slow trot for about three hours, then immediately turned out upon the best grass that can be found for two hours, thus giving time for grazing and breakfast, after which another drive of about three or four hours may be made, making the noon halt about three hours, when the animals are again harnessed and the journey continued until night. In passing through a country infested by hostile Indians, the evening drive should be prolonged until an hour or two after dark, turning off at a point where the ground is hard, going about half a mile from the road, and encamping without fires in low ground, where the Indians will find it difficult to track or see the party. These frequent halts serve to rest and recruit the animals, so that they will, without injury, make from thirty to forty miles a day for a long time. This, however, can only be done with very light loads and vehicles, such, for example, as an ambulance with four mules, only three or four persons, and a small amount of luggage. End of chapter 5, part 1《ハッピーバッグのプレリトラベラー》。《ハッピーバッグのプレリトラベラー》。《ハッピーバッグのプレリトラベラー》。《ハッピーバッグのプレリトラベラー》。ハッピーバッグのプレリトラベラー。《ハッピーバッグのプレリトラベラー》。《ハッピーバッグのプレリトラベラー》。《ハッピーバッグのプレリトラベラー》。《ハッピーバッグのプレリトラベラー》。《ハッピーバッグのプレリトラベラー》。《ハッピーバッグのプレリトラベラー》。《ハッピーバッグのプレリトラベラー》。《ハッピーバッグのプレリトラベラー》。《ハッピーバッグのプレリトラベラー》。《ハッピーバッグのプレリトラベラー》。《ハッピーバッグのプレリトラベラー》。《ハッピーバッグのプレリトラベラー》。There are long distances upon some of the routes to California, where no other fuel is found but the dried dung of the buffalo, called by the mountaineers chips, and by the French bois de vache, the argoule of the Tartary deserts. 
it burns well when perfectly dry answers a good purpose for cooking and some men even prefer it to wood as it will not burn when wet it is well in a country where no other fuel can be had when it threatens to rain for the traveller to collect a supply before the rain sets in and carry it in wagons to the camp when dry the chips are easily lighted a great savings in fuel may be had by digging a trench about two feet long by eight inches in width and depth the fires are made in the bottom of the trench and the cooking utensils placed upon the top where they receive all the heat this plan is especially recommended for windy weather and it is convenient at all times the wood should be cut short and split into small pieces it is highly important that the traveller should know the different methods that may be resorted to for kindling fires upon a march the most simple and most expeditious of these is by using the lucifer matches but unless they are kept in well corked bottles they are liable to become wet and will then fail to ignite the most of those found in the shops easily imbibe dampness and are of but little use in the prairies those marked van duzer new york and put up in flat rectangular boxes are the best i have met with and were the only ones i saw which were not affected by the humid climate of mexico wax lucifers are better than wooden as they are impervious to moisture i have seen an indian start a fire with flint and steel after all others had failed to do it with matches this was during a heavy rain when almost all available fuel had become wet on such occasions dry fuel may generally be obtained under logs rocks or leaning trees the inner bark of some dry trees cedar for instance is excellent to kindle a fire the bark is rubbed in the hand until the fibres are made fine and loose when it takes fire easily dry grass or leaves are also good after a sufficient quantity of small kindling fuel has been collected a moistened rag is rubbed with powder and a spark struck into it with a flint and steel which will ignite it this is then placed in the centre of the loose net of inflammable material and whirled around in the air until it bursts out into a flame when it is raining the blaze should be laid upon the driest spot that can be found a blanket held over it to keep off the water and it is fed with very small bits of dry wood and shavings until it has gained sufficient strength to burn the larger damp wood when no dry place can be found the fire may be started in a kettle or frying pan and afterwards transferred to the ground should there be no other means of starting a fire it can always be made with a gun or pistol by placing upon the ground a rag saturated with damp powder and a little dry powder sprinkled over it the gun or pistol is then uncharged placed within the cone directly over and near the rag and a cap exploded which will invariably ignite it another method is by placing about one-fourth of a charge of powder into a gun pushing a rag down loosely upon it and firing it out with the muzzle down near the ground which ignites the rag the most difficult of all methods of making a fire but one that is practised by some of the western indians is by friction between two pieces of wood i had often heard of this process but never gave credit to its practicability until i saw the experiment successfully tried it was done in the following manner two dried stalks of the mexican soap plant about three-fourths of an inch in diameter were selected and one of them was made flat on one side near the edge of this flat surface a very small indentation was made to receive the end of the other stick and a groove cut from this down the side the other stick is cut with a rounded end and placed upright upon the first one man then holds the horizontal piece upon the ground while another takes the vertical stick between the palms of his hand and turns it back and forth as rapidly as possible at the same time pressing forcibly down upon it the point of the upright stick wears away the indentation into a fine powder which runs off to the ground in the groove that has been cut after a time it begins to smoke and by continued friction it will at length take fire this is an operation that is difficult and requires practice but if a drill stick is used with a cord placed around the centre of the upright stick it can be turned much more rapidly than with the hands and the fire produced more readily the upright stick may be of any hard dry wood but the lower horizontal stick must be of a soft inflammable nature such as pine cottonwood or black walnut and it must be perfectly dry the indians work the sticks with the palms of their hands holding the lower piece between the feet but it is better to have a man hold the lower piece while another man works the drill bow inexperienced travellers are very liable in kindling fires at their camp to ignite the grass around them great caution should be taken to guard against the occurrence of such accidents as they might prove exceedingly disastrous we were very near having our entire train of wagons and supplies destroyed upon one occasion by the carelessness of one of our party in setting fire to the grass and it was only by the most strenuous and well-timed efforts of two hundred men in setting counter fires and burning around the train that it was saved when the grass is dry it will take fire like powder and if thick and tall with a brisk wind the flames run like a racehorse sweeping everything before them 
a lighted match or the ashes from a cigar or pipe thrown carelessly into the dry grass sometimes sets it on fire but the greatest danger lies in kindling campfires to prevent accidents of this kind before kindling the fire a space should be cleared away sufficient to embrace the limits of the flame and all combustibles removed therefrom and while the fire is being made men should be stationed around with blankets ready to put it out if it takes the grass when a fire is approaching and escape from its track is impossible it may be repelled in the following manner the train and animals are parked compactly together then several men provided with blankets set fire to the grass on the lee side burning it away gradually from the train and extinguishing it on the side next to the train this can easily be done and the fire controlled with the blankets or with dry sand thrown upon it until an area large enough to give room for the train has been burned clear now the train moves on to this ground of safety and the fire passes by harmless jerking meat so pure is the atmosphere in the interior of our continent that fresh meat may be cured or jerked as it is termed in the language of the prairies by cutting it into strips about an inch thick and hanging it in the sun where in a few days it will dry so well that it may be packed in sacks and transported over long journeys without putrefying when there is not time to jerk the meat by the slow process described it may be done in a few hours by building an open framework of small sticks about two feet above the ground placing the strips of meat upon the top of it and keeping up a slow fire beneath which dries the meat rapidly the jerking process may be done upon the march without any loss of time by stretching lines from front to rear upon the outside of loaded wagons and suspending the meat upon them where it is allowed to remain until sufficiently cured to be packed away salt is never used in this process and it is not required as the meat if kept dry rarely putrefies if travellers have ample transportation it will be a wise precaution in passing through the buffalo range to lay in a supply of jerked meat for future exigencies lariats it frequently happens upon long journeys that the lariat ropes wear out or are lost and if there were no means of replacing them great inconvenience might result therefrom a very good substitute may be made by taking the green hide of a buffalo horse mule or ox stretching it upon the ground and pinning it down by the edges after it has been well stretched a circle is described with a piece of charcoal embracing as much of the skin as practicable and a strip about an inch wide cut from the outer edge of sufficient length to form the lariat the strip is then wrapped around between two trees or stakes drawn tight and left to dry after which it is subjected to the process of friction until it becomes pliable when it is ready for use this lariat answers well so long as it is kept dry but after it has been wet and dried again it becomes very hard and unyielding this however may be obviated by boiling it in oil or grease until thoroughly saturated after which it remains pliable the indians make very good lariat ropes of dressed buffalo or buckskins cut into narrow strips and braided these when oiled slip much more freely than the hemp or cotton ropes and are better for lassoing animals but they are not as suitable for picketing as those made of other material because the wolves will eat them and thus set free the animals to which they are attached caches it not unfrequently happens that travellers are compelled for want of transportation to abandon a portion of their luggage and if it is exposed to the keen scrutiny of the thieving savages who often follow the trail of a party and hunt over old camps for such things as may be left it will be likely to be appropriated by them such contingencies have given rise to a method of secreting articles called by the old french canadian voyageurs caching the proper places for making caches are in loose sandy soils where the earth is dry and easily excavated near the bank of a river is the most convenient for this purpose as the earth taken out can be thrown into the water leaving no trace behind when the spot has been chosen the turf is carefully cut and laid aside after which a hole is dug in the shape of an egg and of sufficient dimensions to contain the articles to be secreted and the earth as it is taken out thrown upon a cloth or blanket and carried to a stream or ravine where it can be disposed of being careful not to scatter any upon the ground near the cache the hole is then lined with bushes or dry grass the articles placed within covered with grass the hole filled up with earth and the sods carefully placed back in their original position and everything that would be likely to attract an indian's attention removed from the locality if an india rubber or gutta percha cloth is disposable it should be used to envelop the articles in the cache another plan of making a cache is to dig the hole inside a tent and occupy the tent for some days after the goods are deposited this effaces the marks of excavation the mountain traders were formerly in the habit of building fires over their caches, but the Indians have become so familiar with this practice that I think it is no longer safe. 
Another method of caching, which is sometimes resorted to, is to place the articles in the top of an evergreen tree, such as the pine, hemlock, or spruce. The thick boughs are so arranged around the packages that they cannot be seen from beneath, and they are tied to a limb to prevent them from being blown out by the wind. This will only answer for such articles as will not become injured by the weather. Caves or holes in the rocks that are protected from the rains are also secure deposits for caching goods, but in every case care must be taken to obliterate all tracks or other indications of men having been near them. These caches will be more secure when made at some distance from roads or trails, and in places where Indians would not be likely to pass. To find a cache again, the bearing and distance from the center of it to some prominent object, such as a mound, rock, or tree, should be carefully determined and recorded, so that any one, on returning to the spot, would have no difficulty in ascertaining its position. Disposition of Firearms The mountaineers and trappers exercise a very wise precaution on laying down for the night, by placing their arms and ammunitions by their sides, where they can be seized at a moment's notice. This rule is never departed from, and they are therefore seldom liable to be surprised. In Parkins' Abyssinia, I find the following remarks upon this subject. When getting sleepy, you return your rifle between your legs, roll over, and go to sleep. Some people may think this is a queer place for a rifle, but on the contrary, it is the position of all others where utility and comfort are most combined. The butt rests on the arm, and serves as a pillow for your head. The muzzle points between the knees, and the arms encircle the lock and breech, so that you have a smooth pillow, and are always prepared to start up armed at a moment's notice. I have never made the experiment of sleeping in this way, but I should imagine that a gunstock would make rather a hard pillow. Many of our experienced frontier officers prefer carrying their pistols in a belt at their sides to placing them in holsters attached to the saddles, as in the former case they are always at hand when they are dismounted, whereas by the other plan they become useless when a man is unhorsed, unless he has time to remove them from the saddle, which during the excitement of an action would seldom be the case. Notwithstanding Colt's army and navy-sized revolvers have been in use for a long time in our army, officers are by no means of one mind as to their relative merits for frontier service. The navy pistol, being more light and portable, is more convenient for the belt, but it is very questionable in my mind whether these qualities counterbalance the advantages derived from the greater weight of powder and lead that can be fired from the larger pistol, and the consequent increased projectile force. This point is illustrated by an incident which fell under my own observation. In passing near the Medicine Bow Butte, during the spring of 1858, I most unexpectedly encountered and fired at a full-grown grizzly bear, but as my horse had become somewhat blown by a previous gallop, his breathing so much disturbed my aim that I missed the animal at the short distance of about fifty yards, and he ran off. Fearful, if I stopped to reload my rifle, the bear would make his escape. I resolved to drive him back to the advanced guard of our escort, which I could see approaching in the distance. This I succeeded in doing, when several mounted men, armed with the navy revolvers, set off in pursuit. They approached within a few paces, and discharged ten or twelve shots, the most of which entered the animal, but he still kept on, and his progress did not seem materially impeded by the wounds. After these men had exhausted their charges, another man rode up, armed with the army revolver, and fired two shots, which brought the stalwart beast to the ground. Upon skinning him and making an examination of the wounds, it was discovered that none of the balls from the small pistols had, after passing through his thick and tough hide, penetrated deeper than about an inch into the flesh, but that the two balls from the large pistol had gone into the vitals and killed him. This test was, to my mind, a decisive one as to the relative efficiency of the two arms for frontier service, and I resolved thenceforth to carry the larger size. Several different methods are practiced in slinging and carrying firearms upon horseback. The shoulder strap, with a swivel to hook into a ring behind the guard, with the muzzle resting downward in a leather cup attached by a strap to the same staple as the stirrup leather, is a very handy method for cavalry soldiers to sling their carbines. But the gun being reversed, the jolting caused by the motion of the horse tends to move the charge and shake the powder out of the cone, which renders it liable to burst the gun and to miss fire. An invention of the Namaquis in Africa, described by Galton in his Art of Travel, is as follows. Sew a bag of canvas, leather, or hide, of such bigness as to admit the butt of the gun pretty freely. The straps that support it buckle through a ring in the pommel, and the thongs by which its slope is adjusted fasten round the girth below. The exact adjustment may not be hit upon by an unpractised person for some little time, but when they are once ascertained, the straps need never be shifted, the gun is perfectly safe and never comes below the armpit, even in taking a drop leap. 
It is pulled out in an instant by bringing the elbow in front of the gun and close to the side, so as to throw the gun to the outside of the arm. Then, lowering the arm, the gun is caught up. It is a bungling way to take out the gun while its barrel lies between the arm and the body. Any sized gun can be carried in this fashion. It offers no obstacle to mounting or dismounting. It may be a convenient way of carrying the gun. I have never tried it. Of all methods I have used, I prefer for hunting a piece of leather about twelve inches by four, with a hole cut in each end. One of the ends is placed over the pommel of the saddle, and with a buckskin string made fast to it, where it remains a permanent fixture. When the rider is mounted, he places his gun across the strap upon the saddle, and carries the loose end forward over the pommel, the gun resting horizontally across his legs. It will now only be necessary to steady the gun with the hand. After a little practice, the rider will be able to control it with his knees. It will be found a very easy and convenient method of carrying it. When required for use, it is taken out in an instant by simply raising it with the hand, when the loose end of the strap comes off the pommel. The chief causes of accidents from the use of firearms arise from carelessness, and I have always observed that those persons who are most familiar with their use are invariably the most careful. Many accidents have happened from carrying guns with the cock down upon the cap. When in this position, a blow upon the cock, and sometimes the concussion produced by the falling of the gun, will explode the cap, and occasionally, when the cock catches a twig or in the clothes and lifts it from the cap, it will explode. With a gun at half cock, there is but little danger of such accidents, for when the cock is drawn back, it either comes to the full cock and remains, or it returns to the half cock, but it does not go down upon the cone. Another source of very many sad and fatal accidents resulting from the most stupid and culpable carelessness is in persons standing before the muzzles of guns and attempting to pull them out of wagons, or to draw them through a fence or brush in the same position. If the cock encounters an obstacle in its passage, it will of course be drawn back and fall upon the cap. These accidents are of frequent occurrence, and the cause is well understood by all, yet men continue to disregard it, and their lives pay the penalty of their indiscretion. It is a wise maxim which applies with especial force in campaigning on the prairies. Always look to your gun, but never let your gun look at you. An equally important maxim might be added to this, never to point your gun at another, whether charged or uncharged, and never allow another to point his gun at you. Young men, before they become accustomed to the use of arms, are very apt to be careless, and a large percentage of gun accidents may be traced to this cause. That finished sportsman and wonderful shot, my friend Captain Martin Scott, than whom a more gallant soldier never fought a battle, was the most careful man with firearms I ever knew, and up to the time he received his death wound upon the bloody field of Molino del Rey, he never ceased his cautionary advice to young officers upon this subject. His extended experience and intimate acquaintance with the use of arms had fully impressed him with its importance, and no man ever lived whose opinions upon this subject should carry greater weight. As incomprehensible as it may appear to persons accustomed to the use of firearms, recruits are very prone, before they have been drilled at target practice with ball cartridges, to place the ball below the powder in the piece. Officers conducting detachments through the Indian country should therefore give their special attention to this, and require the recruits to tear the cartridge and pour all the powder into pieces before the ball is inserted. As accidents often occur in camp from the accidental discharge of firearms that have been capped, I would recommend that the arms be continually kept loaded in campaigning, but the caps not placed upon the cones until they are required for firing. This will cause but little delay in action, and will conduce much to security from accidents. When loaded firearms have been exposed for any considerable time to a moist atmosphere, they should be discharged, or the cartridges drawn, and the arms thoroughly cleaned, dried, and oiled. Too much attention cannot be given in keeping arms in perfect firing order. Trailing. I know of nothing in the woodsman's education of so much importance, or so difficult to acquire, as the art of trailing or tracking men and animals. To become an adept in this art requires the constant practice of years, and with some men a lifetime does not suffice to learn it. Almost all the Indians whom I have met with are proficient in this species of knowledge, the faculty for acquiring which appears to be innate with them. Exigencies of woodland and prairie life stimulate the savage from childhood to develop faculties so important in the arts of war and of the chase. I have seen very few white men who were good trailers, and practice did not seem very materially to improve their faculties in this regard. They have not the same acute perceptions for these things as the Indian or the Mexican. It is not apprehended that this difficult branch of woodcraft can be taught from books, as it pertains almost exclusively to the school of practice. Yet I will give some facts relating to the habits of the Indians that will facilitate its acquirement. 
a party of indians for example starting out upon a war excursion leave their families behind and never transport their lodges whereas when they move with their families they carry their lodges and other effects if therefore an indian trail is discovered with the marks of the lodge poles upon it it has certainly not been made by a war party but if the track do not show the trace of lodge poles it will be equally certain that a war or hunting party has passed that way and if it is not desired to come in conflict with them their direction may be avoided mustangs or wild horses when moving from place to place leave a trail which is sometimes difficult to distinguish from that made by a mounted party of indians especially if the mustangs do not stop to graze this may be determined by following upon the trail until some dung is found and if this should lie in a single pile it is a sure indication that a herd of mustangs has passed as they always stop to relieve themselves while a party of indians would keep their horses in motion and the ordure would be scattered along the road if the trail passed through woodland the mustangs will occasionally go under the limbs of trees too low to admit the passage of a man on horseback an indian on coming to a trail will generally tell at a glance its age by what particular tribe it was made the number of the party and many other things connected with it astounding to the uninitiated i remember upon one occasion as i was riding with the delaware upon the prairies we crossed the trail of a large party of indians travelling with lodges the tracks appeared to me quite fresh and i remarked to the indian that we must be near the party oh no said he the trail was made two days before in the morning at the same time pointing with his finger to where the sun would be at about eight o'clock then seeing that my curiosity was excited to know by what means he arrived at this conclusion he called my attention to the fact that there had been no dew for the last two nights but that on the previous morning it had been heavy he then pointed out to me some spears of grass that had been pressed down into the earth by the horse's hoofs upon which the sand still adhered having dried on thus clearly showing that the grass was wet when the tracks were made at another time as i was travelling with the same indian i discovered upon the ground what i took to be a bear track with a distinctly marked impression of the heel and all the toes i immediately called the indian's attention to it at the same time flattering myself that i had made quite an important discovery which had escaped his observation the fellow remarked with a smile oh no captain may be so he not bear track he then pointed with his gun-rod to some spears of grass that grew near the impression but i did not comprehend the mystery until he dismounted and explained to me that when the wind was blowing the spears of grass would be bent over towards the ground and the oscillating motion thereby produced would scoop out the loose sand into the shape i have described the truth of this explanation was apparent yet it occurred to me that its solution would have baffled the wits of most white men fresh tracks generally show moisture where the earth has been turned up but after a short exposure to the sun they become dry if the tracks be very recent the sand may sometimes where it is very loose and dry be seen running back into the tracks and by following them to a place where they cross water the earth will be wet for some distance after they leave it the droppings of the dung from animals are also good indications of the age of the trail it is well to remember whether there have been any rains within the few days as the age of a trail may sometimes be conjectured in this way it is very easy to tell whether tracks have been made before or after a rain as the water washes off all the sharp edges it is not a difficult matter to distinguish the tracks of american horses from those of indian horses as the latter are never shod moreover they are much smaller in trailing horses there will be no trouble while the ground is soft as the impressions they leave will then be deep and distinct but when they pass over hard or rocky ground it is sometimes a very slow and troublesome process to follow them where there is grass the trace can be seen for a considerable time as the grass will be trodden down and bent in the direction the party has moved should the grass have returned to its upright position the trail can often be distinguished by standing upon it and looking ahead for some distance in the direction it has been pursuing the grass that has been turned over will show a different shade of green from that all around it and this often marks a trail for a long time should all traces of the track be obliterated in certain localities it is customary with the indians to follow on in the direction it has been pursuing for a time and it is quite probable that in some place where the ground is more favorable it will show itself again should the trail not be recovered in this way they search for a place where the earth is soft and make a careful examination embracing the entire area where it is likely to run indians who find themselves pursued and wish to escape scatter as much as possible with an understanding that they are to meet again at some point in advance so that if the pursuing party follows any one of the tracks it will invariably lead to the place of rendezvous if for example the trail points in the direction of a mountain pass or toward any other place which affords the only passage through a particular section of country it would not be worth while to spend much time in hunting it 
as it would probably be regained at the pass. As it is important in trailing Indians to know at what gates they are traveling, and as the appearance of the tracks of horses are not familiar to all, I have in the following cut represented the prints made by the hoofs at the ordinary speed of the walk, trot, and gallop, so that persons in following the trail of Indians may form an idea as to the probability of overtaking them, and regulate their movements accordingly. In traversing a district of unknown country, where there are no prominent landmarks, and with the view of returning to the point of departure, a pocket compass should always be carried, and attached by a string to the buttonhole of the coat, to prevent its being lost or mislaid, and on starting out, as well as frequently during the trip, to take the bearing and examine the appearance of the country when facing towards the starting point, as a landscape presents a very different aspect when viewing it from opposite directions. There are few white men who can retrace their steps for any great distance, unless they take the above precautions in passing over an unknown country for the first time. But with the Indians it is different. The sense of locality seems to be innate with them, and they do not require the aid of a magnetic needle to guide them. Upon a certain occasion, when I had made a long march over an unexplored section, and was returning upon an entirely different route without either road or trail, a Delaware by the name of Black Beaver, who was in my party, on arriving at a particular point, suddenly halted, and turning to me, asked if I recognized the country before us. Seeing no familiar objects, I replied in the negative. He put the same question to the other white men of the party, all of whom gave the same answers, whereupon he smiled, and in his quaint vernacular said, injun he don't know nothing injun big fool white man mighty smart he no heap at the same time he pointed to a tree about two hundred yards from where we were then standing and informed us that our outward trail ran directly by the side of it which proved to be true another time as i was returning from the comanche country over a route many miles distant from the one i had travelled in going out one of my Delaware hunters, who had never visited the section before, on arriving upon the crest of an eminence in the prairie, pointed out to me a clump of trees in the distance, remarking that our outward track would be found there. I was not, however, disposed to credit his statement, until we reached the locality and found the road passing the identical spot he had indicated. This same Indian would start from any place to which he had gone by a sinuous route, through an unknown country, and keep a direct bearing back to the place of departure, and he assured me that he has never, even during the most cloudy or foggy weather, or in the darkest nights, lost the points of compass. There are very few white men who are endowed with these wonderful faculties, and those few are only rendered proficient by matured experience. I have known several men, after they had become lost in the prairie, to wander about for days, without exercising the least judgment, and finally exhibiting a state of mental aberration almost upon the verge of lunacy, Instead of reasoning upon their situation, they exhaust themselves running ahead at their utmost speed without any regard to direction. When a person is satisfied that he has lost his way, he should stop and reflect upon the course he has been traveling, the time that has elapsed since he left his camp, and the probable distance that he is from it, and if he is unable to retrace his steps, he should keep as nearly in the direction of them as possible, and if he has a compass, this will be an easy matter." but above all he should guard against following his own track around in a circle with the idea that he is in a beaten trace. When he is travelling with a train of wagons which leaves a plain trail, he can make the distance he has travelled from camp the radius of a circle in which to ride around, and before the circle is described he will strike the trail. If the person has no compass, it is always well to make an observation, and to remember the direction of the wind at the time of departure from camp, and as this would not generally change during the day, it would afford a means of keeping the points of the compass. In the night, Ursa Major, the great bear, is not only useful to find the North Star, but its position, when the pointers will be vertical in the heavens, may be estimated with sufficient accuracy to determine the North, even when the North Star cannot be seen. In tropical latitudes, the zodiacal stars, such as Orion and Antares, give the East and West bearing, and the Southern Cross the North and South, when Polaris and the great bear cannot be seen. It is said that the moss upon firs and other trees in Europe gives a certain indication of the points of compass in a forest country, the greatest amount accumulating upon the north side of the trees. But I have often observed the trees in our own forests, and have not been able to form any positive conclusions in this way. End of chapter 5, part 2this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Prairie Traveller by Randolph B. Marcy Chapter 6, Part 1 Guides and Hunters, Delawares and Shawnees, Kabirs, Black Beaver, Anecdotes, 
domestic troubles lodges similarity of prairie tribes to the arabs delawares and shawnees it is highly important that parties making expeditions through an unexplored country should secure the services of the best guides and hunters and i know of none who are superior to the delawares and shawnee indians they have been with me upon several different occasions and i have invariably found them intelligent brave reliable and in every respect well qualified to fill their positions they are endowed with those keen and wonderful powers in woodcraft which can only be acquired by instinct practice and necessity and which are possessed by no other people that i have heard of unless it be the kebirs or guides who escort the caravans across the great desert of sahara general e dumas in his treatise upon the great desert published in paris eighteen fifty six in speaking of these guides says the kebir is always a man of intelligence of tried probity bravery and skill he knows how to determine his position from the appearance of the stars by the experience of other journeys he has learned all about the roads wells and pastures the dangers of certain passes and the means of avoiding them all the chiefs whose territories it is necessary to pass through the salubrity of the different localities the remedies against disease the treatment of fractures and the antidotes to the venom of snakes and scorpions in these vast solitudes where nothing seems to indicate the route where the wind covers up all traces of the track with sand the kebir has a thousand ways of directing himself in the right course in the night when there are no stars in sight by the simple inspection of a handful of grass which he examines with his fingers which he smells and tastes he informs himself of his locale without ever being lost or wandering i saw with astonishment that our conductor although he had but one eye and that defective recognized perfectly the route and leon the african states that the conductor of his caravan became blind upon the journey from ophthalmia yet by feeling the grass and sand he could tell when we were approaching an inhabited place our guide had all the qualities which make a good kebir he was young large and strong he was a master of arms his eye commanded respect and his speech won the heart but if in the tent he was affable and winning once en route he spoke only when it was necessary and never smiled the delawares are but a minute remnant of the great algonquin family whose early traditions declare them to be the parent stock from which the other numerous branches of the algonquin tribes originated and they are the same people whom the first white settlers found so numerous upon the banks of the delaware when william penn held his council with the delawares upon the ground where the city of philadelphia now stands they were as peaceful and unwarlike in their habits as the quakers themselves they had been subjugated by the five nations forced to take the appellation of squaws and forgo the use of arms but after they moved west beyond the influence of their former masters their naturally independent spirit revived they soon regained their lofty position as braves and warriors and the male squaws of the iroquois soon became formidable men and heroes and so have continued to the present day their war-path has reached the shores of the pacific ocean on the west hudson's bay on the north and into the very heart of mexico on the south they are not clannish in their dispositions like most other indians nor by their habit confined to any given locality but are found as traders trappers or hunters among most of the indian tribes inhabiting our continent i even saw them living with the mormons in utah they are among the indians as jews among the whites essentially wanderers the shawnees have been associated with the delawares a hundred and eighty-five years they intermarry and live as one people their present places of abode are upon the missouri river near fort leavenworth and in the choctaw territory upon the canadian river near fort arbuckle they are familiar with many of the habits and customs of their pale-faced neighbors and some of them speak the english language yet many of their native characteristics tenaciously cling to them upon one occasion i endeavored to teach a delaware the use of the compass he seemed much interested in its mechanism and very attentively observed the oscillations of the needle he would move away a short distance then return keeping his eyes continually fixed upon the needle and the uniform position into which it settled he did not however seem to comprehend it in the least but regarded the entire proceeding as a species of necromantic performance got up for his especial benefit and i was about putting away the instrument when he motioned me to stop and came walking toward it with a very serious but incredulous countenance remarking as he pointed his finger toward it maybe so he tell lie some time the ignorance evinced by this indian regarding the uses of the compass is less remarkable than that of some white men who are occasionally met upon the frontier while surveying indian lands in the wilds of western texas during the summer of eighteen fifty four i encountered a deputy surveyor travelling on foot with his compass and chain upon his back i saluted him very politely remarking that i presumed he was a surveyor to which he replied 
i reckon stranger i are that thar individual i had taken the magnetic variation several times always with nearly the same result about ten degrees twenty but in order to verify my observations i was curious to learn how they accorded with his own working and accordingly inquired of him what he made the variation of the compass in that particular locality he seemed struck with astonishment took his compass from his back and laid it upon a log near by then facing me and pointing with his hand toward it said stranger do you see that thar instrument to which i replied in the affirmative he continued i owned her well nigh going on twenty year i've put her through the peraries and through the timber and now look yer stranger you can just bet your life on it she never varied ere time and if you just follow her sign you'll knock the center out of the north star she never lies she don't he seemed to consider my interrogatory as a direct insinuation that his compass was an imperfect one and hence his indignation thinking that i should not get any very important intelligence concerning the variation of the needle from this surveyor i begged his pardon for questioning the accuracy of his instrument bid him good morning and continued on my journey black beaver in eighteen forty nine i met with a very interesting specimen of the delaware tribe whose name was black beaver he had for ten years been in the employ of the american fur company and during this time had visited nearly every point of interest within the limits of our unsettled territory he had set his traps and spread his blanket upon the head waters of the missouri and columbia and his wanderings had led him south to the colorado and gila and thence to the shores of the pacific in southern california his life had been that of a veritable cosmopolite filled with scenes of intense and startling interest bold and reckless adventure he was with me two seasons in the capacity of guide and i always found him perfectly reliable brave and competent his reputation as a resolute determined and fearless warrior did not admit of question yet i have never seen a man who wore his laurels with less vanity when i first made his acquaintance i was puzzled to know what to think of him he would often in speaking of the prairie indians say to me captain if you have a fight you mustn't count much on me for i's a big coward when the fight begins i spect you'll see me run under the cannon injun mighty fraid of big gun i expressed my surprise that he should if what he told me was true have gained such a reputation as a warrior whereupon he informed me that many years previous when he was a young man and before he had ever been in battle he with about twenty white men and four delawares were at one of the fur company's trading posts upon the upper missouri engaged in trapping beaver while there the stockade fort was attacked by a numerous band of blackfeet indians who fought bravely and seemed determined to annihilate the little band that defended it after the investment had been completed and there appeared no probability of the attacking parties abandoning their purpose one damned fool delaware as black beaver expressed it proposed to his countrymen to make a sortie and thereby endeavour to effect an impression upon the blackfeet this beaver said was the last thing he would ever have thought of suggesting and it startled him prodigiously causing him to tremble so much that it was with difficulty he could stand he had however started from home with the fixed purpose of becoming a distinguished brave and made a great effort to stifle his emotion he assumed an air of determination saying that was the very idea he was just about to propose and slapping his comrades upon the back started towards the gate telling them to follow as soon as the gate was passed he says he took particular care to keep in the rear of the others so that in the event of a retreat he would be able to reach the stockade first they had not proceeded far before a perfect shower of arrows came falling around them on all sides but fortunately without doing them harm not fancying this hot reception those in front proposed an immediate retreat to which he most gladly acceded and at once set off at his utmost speed expecting to reach the fort first but he soon discovered that his comrades were more fleet and were rapidly passing and leaving him behind suddenly he stopped and called out to them come back here you cowards you squaws what for you run away and leave brave man to fight alone this taunting appeal to their courage turned them back and with their united efforts they succeeded in beating off the enemy immediately around them securing their entrance into the fort beaver says when the gate was closed the captain in charge of the establishment grasped him warmly by the hand saying black beaver you are a brave man you have done this day what no other man in the fort would have the courage to do and i thank you from the bottom of my heart in relating the circumstance to me he laughed most heartily thinking it a very good joke and said after that he was regarded as a brave warrior the truth is my friend beaver was one of those few heroes who never sounded his own trumpet yet no one that knows him ever presumed to question his courage 
Another time, while Black Beaver remained upon the headwaters of the Missouri, he was left in charge of a cache consisting of a quantity of goods buried to prevent their being stolen by the Indians. During the time he was engaged upon this duty, he amused himself by hunting in the vicinity, only visiting his charge once a day. As he was making one of these periodical visits, and had arrived upon the summit of a hill overlooking the locality, he suddenly discovered a large number of hostile Blackfeet occupying it, and he supposed they had appropriated all the goods. As soon as they espied him, they beckoned for him to come down and have a friendly chat with them. Knowing that their purpose was to beguile him into their power, he replied that he did not feel in a talking humor just at that time, and started off in another direction, whereupon they hallooed after him, making use of the most insulting language and gestures, and asking him if he considered himself a man thus to run away from his friends, and intimating that, in their opinion, he was an old woman who had better go home and take care of the children beaver says this roused his indignation to such a pitch that he stopped turned around and replied maybe so s'pose three or four of you injuns come up here alone i'll show you if i is old woman's they did not however accept the challenge and beaver rode off although the delawares generally seem quite happy in their social relations yet they are not altogether exempt from some of those minor discords which occasionally creep in and mar the domestic harmony of their more civilized pale-faced brethren I remember upon one occasion I had bivouacked for the night with Black Beaver, and he had been endeavouring to while away the long hours of the evening by relating to me some of the most thrilling incidents of his highly adventurous and erratic life, when at length a hiatus in the conversation gave me an opportunity of asking him if he was a married man. He hesitated for some time, then looking up and giving his forefinger a twirl to imitate the throwing of a lasso, replied, "'One time me catch em wife.' I pay that woman, his mother, one hoss, one saddle, one bridle, two plug tobacco, and plenty goods. I take him home to my house. Got plenty meat, plenty corn, plenty everything. One time we go take walk, maybe so three, maybe so two hours. When I come home, that woman, he say, Black Beaver, what for you go way long time? I say, I not go nowhere. I just take one little walk. Then that woman, he got heap mad and say, No, Black Beaver, you not take no little walk i know what for you go way you go see not a one woman i say maybe not then that woman she cry long time and all the time now she mad you never see merican woman that a way i sympathized most deeply with my friend in his distress and told him for his consolation that in my opinion the women of his nation were not peculiar in this respect that they were pretty much alike all over the world and i was under the impression that there were well authenticated instances even among white women where they had subjected themselves to the same causes of complaint so feelingly depicted by him whereupon he very earnestly asked what you do for cure him whip him i replied no that so far as my observation extended i was under the impression that this was generally regarded by those who had suffered from its effects as one of those chronic and vexatious complaints which would not be benefited by the treatment he suggested even when administered in homeopathic doses and i believed it was now admitted by all sensible men that it was better in all such cases to let nature take its course trusting to a merciful providence at this reply his countenance assumed a dejected expression but at length he brightened up again and triumphantly remarked i tell you my friend what i do i catch em nutter one wife when i go home black beaver had visited st louis and the small towns upon the missouri frontier and he prided himself not a little upon his acquaintance with the customs of the whites and never seemed more happy than when an opportunity offered to display this knowledge in the presence of his indian companions it so happened upon one occasion that i had a comanche guide who bivouacked at the same fire with beaver on visiting them one evening according to my usual practice i found them engaged in a very earnest and apparently not very amicable conversation on inquiring the cause of this beaver answered i've been telling this comanche what i seen mong the white folks i said well beaver what did you tell him i tell him bout the steamboats and the railroads and the heap of houses i seen in st louis well sir what does he think of that he say i's damned fool what else did you tell him about i tell him the world is round but he keep all the time say hush you fool do you s'pose i's child haven't i got eyes can't i see the prairie you call him round he say too maybe so i tell you something you not know before one time my grandfather he make a long journey that way pointing to the west when he get on big mountain he seen heap water on t'other side just so flat he can be and he see the sun go right straight down on t'other side i then tell him all those rivers he seen all the time the water he run suppose the world flat the water he stands still 
Maybe so he not leave me. I told him it certainly looked very much like it. I then asked him to explain to the Comanche the magnetic telegraph. He looked at me earnestly and said, What do you call that magnetic telegraph? I said, You have heard of New York and New Orleans? Oh, yes, he replied. Very well, we have a wire connecting these two cities, which are about a thousand miles apart, and it would take a man thirty days to ride it upon a good horse. Now a man stands at one end of this wire in New York, and by touching it a few times he inquires of his friend in New Orleans what he had for breakfast. His friend in New Orleans touches the other end of the wire, and in ten minutes the answer comes back, ham and eggs. Tell him that, Beaver. His countenance assumed a most comical expression, but he made no remark, until I again requested him to repeat what I had said to the Comanche, when he observed, No, Captain, I not tell him that, for I don't believe that myself. Upon my assuring him that such was the fact, and that I had seen it myself, he said, Injun not very smart. Sometimes he's big fool, but he holler pretty loud. You hear him maybe half mile. You say, American man, he talk thousand miles? I spect you try to fool me now, Captain. Maybe so you lie. The Indians living between the outer white settlements and the nomadic tribes of the plains form intermediate social links in the chain of civilization. The first of these occupy permanent habitations, but the others, although they cultivate the soil, are only resident when their crops are growing, going out into the prairies after harvest to spend the winter in hunting. Among the former may be mentioned the Cherokees, Creeks, Choctaws, and Chickasaws, and of the latter are the Delawares, Shawnees, Kickapoos, etc., who are perfectly familiar with the use of the rifle, and, in my judgment, would make as formidable partisan warriors as can be found in the universe. THE WILD TRIBES OF THE WEST These are very different in their habits from the natives that formerly occupied the country bordering upon the Atlantic coast. The latter lived permanently in villages, where they cultivated the soil and never wandered very far from them. They did not use horses, but always made their war expeditions on foot, and never came into action unless they could screen themselves behind the cover of trees. They inflicted the most inhuman tortures upon their prisoners, but did not, that I am aware, violate the chastity of women. The prairie tribes have no permanent abiding places. They never plant a seed, but roam for hundreds of miles in every direction over the plains. They are perfect horsemen, and seldom go to war on foot. Their attacks are made in the open prairies, and when unhorsed they are powerless. They do not, like the eastern Indians, afflict upon their prisoners prolonged tortures, but invariably subject all females that have the misfortune to fall into their merciless clutches to an ordeal worse than death. It is highly important to every man passing through a country frequented by Indians to know some of their habits, customs, and propensities, as this will facilitate his intercourse with friendly tribes and enable him, when he wishes to avoid a conflict, to take precautions against coming in collision with those who are hostile. Almost every tribe has its own way of constructing its lodges, encamping, making fires, its own style of dress, by some of which peculiarities the experienced frontiersman can generally distinguish them. The Osages, for example, make their lodges in the shape of a wagon top, of bent rods or willows covered with skins, blankets, or the bark of trees. The Kickapoo lodges are made in an oval form, something like a rounded haystack, of poles set in the ground, bent over, and united at the top. This is covered with cloths or bark. The Wichitas, Wacos, Toaconis, and Tonkawas erect their hunting lodges of sticks put up in the form of the frustrum of a cone and covered with brush. All these tribes leave the framework of their lodges standing when they move from camp to camp, and this, of course, indicates the particular tribe that erected them. The Delawares and Shawnees plant two upright forked poles, place a stick across them, and stretch a canvas covering over it, in the same manner as with the Tante d'Abri. The Sioux, Arapahoes, Cheyennes, Utes, Snakes, Blackfeet, and Kiowas make use of the Comanche Lodge covered with dressed buffalo hides. All the prairie Indians I have met with are the most inveterate beggars. They will flock around strangers, and in the most importunate manner, ask for everything they see, especially tobacco and sugar, and if allowed, they will handle, examine, and occasionally pilfer such things as happen to take their fancy. The proper way to treat them is to give them at once such articles as are to be disposed of, and then, in a firm and decided manner, let them understand that they are to receive nothing else. A party of Keechis once visited my camp with their principal chief, who said that he had some important business to discuss, and demanded a council with the Capitan. After consent had been given, he assembled his principal men, and going through the usual preliminary of taking a big smoke, he arose, and with a great deal of ceremony, commenced his pompous and flowery speech, which, like all others of a similar character, amounted to nothing until he touched upon the real object of his visit. 
He said he had travelled a long distance over the prairie to see and have a talk with his white brothers, and that his people were very hungry and naked. He then approached me with six small sticks, and after shaking hands, laid one of the sticks in my hand, which he said represented sugar, another signified tobacco, and the other four pork, flour, whiskey, and blankets, all of which he assured me his people were in great need of and must have. His talk was then concluded, and he sat down, apparently much gratified with the graceful and impressive manner with which he had executed his part of the performance. It then devolved upon me to respond to the brilliant effort of the prairie orator, which I did in something like the following manner. After imitating his style for a short time, I closed my remarks by telling him that we were poor infantry soldiers, who were always obliged to go on foot, that we had become very tired of walking, and would like very much to ride. Furthermore, I had observed that they had among them many fine horses and mules. I then took two small sticks, and imitating as nearly as possible the manner of the chief, placed one in his hand, which I told him was nothing more or less than a first-rate horse, and then the other which signified a good large mule. I closed by saying that I was ready to exchange presents whenever it suited his convenience. They looked at each other for some time without speaking, but finally got up and walked away, and I was not troubled with them again. End of chapter 6, part 1《Chapter Six, Part Two of the Prairie Traveller. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Prairie Traveller by Randolph B. Marcy. Chapter Six, Part Two. Method of Making War. Tracking and Pursuing Indians. Method of Attacking Them. Telegraphing by Smokes. Indian Fighting. The military system, as taught and practiced in our army up to the time of the Mexican War, was without doubt efficient and well adapted to the art of war among civilized nations. This system was designed for the operations of armies acting in populated districts, furnishing ample resources, and against an enemy who was tangible, and made use of a similar system. The vast expanse of desert territory that has been annexed to our domain within the last few years is peopled by numerous tribes of marauding and erratic savages who are mounted upon fleet and hardy horses, making war the business and pastime of their lives, and acknowledging none of the ameliorating conventionalities of civilized warfare. Their tactics are such as to render the old system almost wholly impotent. To act against an enemy who is here today and there tomorrow, who at one time stampedes a herd of mules upon the headwaters of the Arkansas, and when next heard from is in the very heart of the populated districts of Mexico, laying waste haciendas and carrying devastation, rapine, and murder in his steps, who is everywhere without being anywhere, who assembles at the moment of combat and vanishes whenever fortune turns against him, who leaves his women and children far distant from the theatre of hostilities, and has neither towns or magazines to defend, nor lines of retreat to cover, who derives his commissariat from the country he operates in, and is not encumbered with baggage-wagons or pack-trains, who comes into action only when it suits his purposes, and never without the advantage of numbers or position. With such an enemy, the strategic science of civilized nations loses much of its importance, and finds but rarely, and only in peculiar localities, an opportunity to be put in practice. Our little army, scattered as it has been over the vast area of our possessions in small garrisons of one or two companies each has seldom been in a situation to act successfully on the offensive against large numbers of these marauders and has often been condemned to hold itself almost exclusively upon the defensive the morale of the troops must thereby necessarily be seriously impaired and the confidence of the savages correspondingly augmented the system of small garrisons has a tendency to disorganize the troops in proportion as they are scattered, and renders them correspondingly inefficient. The same results have been observed by the French army in Algeria, where in 1845 their troops were, like ours, disseminated over a vast space, and broken up into small detachments stationed in numerous entrenched posts. Upon the sudden appearance of Abd el Kader in the plain of Metidia, they were defeated with serious losses, and were from day to day obliged to abandon these useless stations, with all the supplies they contained. A French writer, in discussing this subject, says, quote, We have now abandoned the fatal idea of defending Algeria by small entrenched posts. In studying the character of the war, the nature of the men who are opposed to us, and of the country in which we are to operate, we must be convinced of the danger of admitting any other system of fortification than that which is to receive our grand depots, our magazines, and to serve as places to recruit and rest our troops when exhausted by long expeditionary movements. 
these fortifications should be established in the midst of the centres of action so as to command the principal routes and serve as pivots to expeditionary columns we owe our success to a system of war which has its proofs in twice changing our relations with the arabs this system consists altogether in the great mobility we have given to our troops instead of disseminating our soldiers with the vain hope of protecting our frontiers with a line of small posts we have concentrated them to have them at all times ready for emergencies and since then the fortunes of the arabs has waned and we have marched from victory to victory this system which has thus far succeeded ought to succeed always and to conduct us god willing to the peaceful possession of the country in reading a treatise upon war as it is practised by the french in algeria by colonel a lore of the second algerian tireleurs published in paris in eighteen fifty eight i was struck with the remarkable similarity between the habits of the arabs and those of the wandering tribes that inhabit our western prairies their manner of making war is almost precisely the same and a successful system of strategic operations for one will in my opinion apply to the other as the turks have been more successful than the french in their military operations against the arab tribes it may not be altogether uninteresting to inquire by what means these inferior soldiers have accomplished the best results the author above mentioned in speaking upon this subject says quote, in these latter days the world is occupied with the organization of mounted infantry according to the example of the turks where in the most successful experiments that have been made the mule carries the foot soldier the turkish soldier mounts his mule puts his provisions upon one side and his accoutrements on the other and thus equipped sets out upon long marches travelling by day and night and only reposing occasionally in bivouac arrive near the place of operations as near the break of day as possible the turks dismount in the most profound silence and pass in succession the bridle of one mule through that of another in such a manner that a single man is sufficient to hold forty or fifty of them by retaining the last bridle which secures all the others then they examine their arms and are ready to commence their work the chief gives his last orders posts his guides and they make the attack surprise the enemy generally asleep and carry the position without resistance the operation terminated they hasten to beat a retreat to prevent the neighboring tribes from assembling and thus avoid a combat the turks had only three thousand mounted men and ten thousand infantry in algeria yet these thirteen thousand men suffice to conquer the same obstacles which have arrested us for twenty-six years notwithstanding the advantage we had of an army which was successively reinforced until it amounted to a hundred thousand why not imitate the turks then mount our infantry upon mules and reduce the strength of our army the response is very simple the turks are turks that is to say mussulmans and indigenous to the country the turks speak the arabic language the days of algiers had less country to guard than we and they care very little about retaining possession of it they are satisfied to receive a part of its revenues they were not permanent their dominion was held by a thread the arab dwells in tents his magazines are in caves when he starts upon a war expedition he folds his tent drives far away his beasts of burden which transport his effects and only carries with him his horse and arms thus equipped he goes everywhere nothing arrests him and often when we believe him twenty leagues distant he is in ambush at precisely rifle range from the flanks of his enemy it may be thought the union of contingents might retard their movements but this is not so the arabs whether they number ten or a hundred thousand move with equal facility they go where they wish and as they wish upon a campaign the place of rendezvous merely is indicated and they arrive there what calculations can be made against such an organization as this strategy evidently loses its advantages against such enemies a general can only make conjectures he marches to find the arabs and finds them not then again when he least expects it he suddenly encounters them when the arab despairs of success in battle he places his sole reliance upon the speed of his horse to escape destruction and as he was always in a country where he can make his camp beside a little water he travels until he has placed a safe distance between himself and his enemy no people probably on the face of the earth are more ambitious of martial fame or entertain a higher appreciation for the deeds of a daring and successful warrior than the north american savages the attainment of such reputation is the paramount and absorbing object of their lives all their aspirations for distinction invariably take this channel of expression a young man is never considered worthy to occupy a seat in council until he has encountered an enemy in battle and he who can count the greatest number of scalps is the most highly honored by his tribe this idea is inculcated from their earliest infancy 
it is not surprising therefore that with such weighty inducements before him the young man who as yet has gained no renown as a braver warrior should be less discriminate in his attacks than older men who have already acquired a name the young braves should therefore be closely watched when encountered on the plains the prairie tribes are seldom at peace with all their neighbors and some of the young braves of a tribe are almost always absent upon a war excursion these forays sometimes extend into the heart of the northern states of mexico where the indians have carried on successful invasions for many years they have devastated and depopulated a great portion of sonora and chihuahua the objects of these forays are to steal horses and mules and to take prisoners and if it so happens that a war party has been unsuccessful in the accomplishment of these ends or has had the misfortune to lose some of its number in battle they become reckless and will often attack a small party with whom they are not at war provided they hope to escape detection the disgrace attendant upon a return to their friends without some trophies as an offset to the loss of their comrades is a powerful incentive to action and they extend but little mercy to defenceless travellers who have the misfortune to encounter them at such a conjuncture while en route from new mexico to arkansas in eighteen forty nine i was encamped near the head of the colorado river and wishing to know the character of the country for a few miles in advance of our position i desired an officer to go out and make the reconnaissance i was lying sick in my bed at the time or i should have performed the duty myself i expected the officer would have taken an escort with him but he omitted to do so and started off alone after proceeding a short distance he discovered four mounted indians coming at full speed directly toward him when instead of turning his own horse toward camp and endeavouring to make his escape he was well mounted or of halting and assuming a defensive attitude he deliberately rode up to them after which the tracks indicated that they proceeded about three miles together when the indians most brutally killed and scalped my most unfortunate but too credulous friend who might probably have saved his life had he not in the kindness of his excellent heart imagined that the savages would reciprocate his friendly advances he was most woefully mistaken and his life paid the forfeit of his generous and noble disposition i have never been able to get any positive information as to the persons who committed this murder yet circumstances render it highly probable that they were a party of young indians who were returning from an unsuccessful foray and they were unable to resist the temptation of taking the scalp and horse of the lieutenant a small number of white men in travelling upon the plains should not allow a party of strange indians to approach them unless able to resist an attack under the most unfavorable circumstances it is a safe rule when a man finds himself alone in the prairies and sees a party of indians approaching not to allow them to come near him and if they persist in so doing to signal them to keep away if they do not obey and he be mounted upon a fleet horse he should make for the nearest timber if the indians follow and press him too closely he should halt turn around and point his gun at the foremost which will often have the effect of turning them back but he should never draw trigger unless he finds that his life depends upon the shot for as soon as his shot is delivered his sole dependence unless he have time to reload must be upon the speed of his horse the indians of the plains notwithstanding the encomiums that have been heaped upon their brethren who formerly occupied the eastern states for their gratitude have not so far as i have observed the most distant conception of that sentiment you may confer numberless benefits upon them for years and the more that is done for them the more they will expect they do not seem to comprehend the motive which dictates an act of benevolence or charity and they invariably attribute it to fear or the expectation of reward when they make a present it is with a view of getting more than its equivalent in return i have never yet been able to discover that the western wild tribes possessed any of those attributes which among civilized nations are regarded as virtues adorning the human character they have yet to be taught the first rudiments of civilization and they are at this time as far from any knowledge of christianity and as worthy subjects for missionary enterprise as the most untutored natives of the south sea islands the only way to make these merciless freebooters fear or respect the authority of our government is when they misbehave first of all to chastise them well by striking such a blow as will be felt for a long time and thus show them that we are superior to them in war they will then respect us much more than when their good will is purchased with presents. The opinion of a friend of mine, who has passed the last twenty-five years of his life among the Indians of the Rocky Mountains, corroborates the opinions I have advanced upon this head, and although I do not endorse all of his sentiments, yet many of them are deduced from long and matured experience and critical observation. He says, quote, They are the most uncertainest varmints in all creation, and I reckon they are not more than half human for you never seed a human arter you fed and treated him to the best fixins in your lodge just turn round and steal all your horses or every other thing he could lay his hands on no not exactly 
he would feel kind of grateful and ask you to spread a blanket in his lodge if you ever pass that away but the injun he don't care shucks for you and is ready to do you a heap of mischief as soon as he quits your feed no cap he continued it's not the right way to give him presents to buy peace but if i were governor of these year united states i tell you what i'd do i'd invite em all to a big feast and make believe i wanted to have a big talk and as soon as i got em all together i'd pitch in and sculp about half of em and then t'other half would be mighty glad to make peace that would stick that's the way i'd make a treaty with the doggone red-bellied varmints and as sure as you're born cap'n that's the only way i suggested to him the idea that there would be a lack of good faith and honour in such a proceeding and that it would be much more in accordance with my notions of fair dealing to meet them openly in the field and there to endeavour to punish them if they deserve it to this he replied tain't no use to talk about honour with them cap they hain't got no such a thing in em and they won't show fair fight any way you can fix it don't they kill and sculp a white man when are they get the better of em the mean varmints they'll never behave themselves until you give em a clean out and out lickin they can't understand white folks ways and they won't learn em and if you treat em decently they think you are afeard you may depend on captain the only way to treat injuns is to thrash them well at first then the balance will sort of take to you and behave themselves the wealth of the prairie indians consists almost exclusively in their horses of which they possess large numbers and they are in the saddle from infancy to old age horsemanship is with them as with the arab of the sahara a necessary part of their education the country they occupy is unsuited to cultivation and their only avocations are war rapine and the chase they have no fixed habitations but move from place to place with the season and the game all their worldly effects are transported in their migrations and wherever their lodges are pitched there is their home they are strangers to all cares creating for themselves no artificial wants and are perfectly happy and contented so long as the buffalo is found within the limits of their wanderings every man is a soldier and they generally exhibit great confidence in their own military prowess meeting indians on approaching strangers these people put their horses at full speed and persons not familiar with their peculiarities and habits might interpret this as an act of hostility but it is their custom with friends as well as enemies and should not occasion groundless alarm when a party is discovered approaching thus and are near enough to distinguish signals all that is necessary in order to ascertain their disposition is to raise the right hand with the palm in front and gradually push it forward and back several times they all understand this to be a command to halt and if they are not hostile it will at once be obeyed after they have stopped the right hand is raised again as before and slowly moved to the right and left which signifies i do not know you who are you as all the wild tribes have their peculiar pantomimic signals by which they are known they will then answer the inquiry by giving their signal if this should not be understood they may be asked if they are friends by raising both hands grasped in the manner of shaking hands or by locking the two forefingers firmly while the hands are held up if friendly they will respond with the same signal but if enemies they will probably disregard the command to halt or give the signal of anger by closing the hand placing it against the forehead and turning it back and forth while in that position the pantomimic vocabulary is understood by all the prairie indians and when oral communication is impracticable it constitutes the court or general council language of the plains the signs are exceedingly graceful and significant and what was a fact of much astonishment to me i discovered they were very nearly the same as those practised by the mutes in our deaf and dumb schools and were comprehended by them with perfect facility the comanche is represented by making with the hand a waving motion in imitation of the crawling of a snake the cheyenne or cut arm by drawing the hand across the arm to indicate cutting it with a knife the arapahoes or smellers by seizing the nose with the thumb and forefinger the sioux or cutthroats by drawing the hand across the throat the pawnees or wolves by placing a hand on each side of the forehead with two fingers pointing to the front to represent the narrow sharp ears of the wolf the crows by imitating the flapping of the bird's wings with the palms of the hands when indians meet a party of strangers and are disposed to be friendly the chiefs after the usual salutations have been exchanged generally ride out and accompany the commander of the party some distance holding a friendly talk and at the same time indulging their curiosity by learning the news etc phlegmatic and indifferent as they appear to be they are very inquisitive and observing and at the same time exceedingly circumspect and cautious about disclosing their own purposes they are always desirous of procuring from whomsoever they meet testimonials of their good behaviour which they preserve with great care and exhibit upon all occasions to strangers as a guarantee of future good conduct on meeting with the chief of the southern comanches in eighteen forty nine after going through the usual ceremony of embracing and assuring me that he was the best friend the americans ever had among the indians 
He exhibited numerous certificates from the different white men he had met with, testifying to his friendly disposition. Among these was one that he desired me to read with special attention, as he said he was of the opinion that perhaps it might not be so complimentary in its character as some of the others. It was in these words, quote, The bearer of this says he is a Comanche chief named Seneco, that he is the biggest Indian and best friend the whites ever had. In fact, he is a first-rate fellow, but I believe he is a damned rascal, so look out for him. I smiled on reading the paper, and looking up, found the chief's eyes intently fixed upon mine with an expression of the most earnest inquiry. I told him the paper was not as good as it might be, whereupon he destroyed it. Five years after this interview, I met Seneco again near the same place. He recognized me at once, and, much to my surprise, pronounced my name quite distinctly. A circumstance which happened in my interview with this Indian shows their character for diplomatic policy. I was about locating and surveying a reservation of land upon which the government designed to establish the Comanches, and was desirous of ascertaining whether they were disposed voluntarily to come into the measure. In this connection, I stated to him that their great father, the President, being anxious to improve their condition, was willing to give them a permanent location where they could cultivate the soil, and if they wished it, he would send white men to teach them the rudiments of agriculture, supply them with farming utensils, and all other requisites for living comfortably in their new homes. I then desired him to consult with his people, and let me know what their views were upon the subject. After talking a considerable time with his headmen, he rose to reply, and said, he was very happy to learn that the president remembered his poor red children in the plains, and he was glad to see me again, and hear from me that their great father was their friend, that he was also very much gratified to meet his agent who was present, and that he should remember with much satisfaction the agreeable interview we had had upon that occasion. After delivering himself of numerous other non-committal expressions of similar import, he closed his speech and took his seat without making the slightest allusion to the subject in question. On reminding him of this omission, and again demanding from him a distinct and categorical answer, he, after a brief consultation with his people, replied that his talk was made and concluded, and he did not comprehend why it was that I wanted to open the subject anew. But as I continued to press him for an answer, he at length said, "'You come into our country, and select a small patch of ground around which you run a line, and tell us the President will make us a present of this to live upon.' when everybody knows that the whole of this entire country, from the Red River to the Colorado, is now, and always has been, ours from time immemorial. I suppose, however, if the President tells us to confine ourselves to these narrow limits, we shall be forced to do so whether we desire it or not. He was evidently averse to the proposed change in their mode of life, and has been at war ever since the establishment of the settlement. The mode of life of the nomadic tribes, owing to their unsettled and warlike habits, is such as to render their condition one of constant danger and apprehension. The security of their numerous animals from the encroachments of their enemies, and habitual liability to attacks, compels them to be at all times upon the alert. Even during profound peace they guard their herds both day and night, while scouts are often patrolling upon the surrounding heights to give notice of the approach of strangers, and enable them to secure their animals and take a defensive attitude. When one of these people conceives himself injured, his thirst for revenge is insatiable, Grave and dignified in his outward bearing, and priding himself upon never exhibiting curiosity, joy, or anger, yet when once roused he invinces the implacable dispositions of his race, the affront is laid up and cherished in his breast, and nothing can efface it from his mind until ample reparation is made. The insult must be atoned for by presence, or be washed out with blood. War Expeditions When a chief desires to organize a war party, he provides himself with a long pole, attaches a red flag to the end of it, and trims the top with eagle feathers. He then mounts his horse in his war costume, and rides around through the camp singing the war song. Those who are disposed to join the expedition mount their horses and fall into the procession. After parading about for a time, all dismount, and the war dance is performed. This ceremony is continued from day to day until a sufficient number of volunteers are found to accomplish the objects desired, when they set out for the theater of their intended exploits. As they proceed upon their expedition, it sometimes happens that the chief with whom it originated, and who invariably assumes the command, becomes discouraged at not finding an opportunity of displaying his warlike abilities, and abandons the enterprise, in which event, if others of the party desire to proceed farther, they select another leader and push on, and thus so long as any one of the party holds out. A war party is sometimes absent for a great length of time, and for days, weeks, and months their friends at home anxiously await their return, until suddenly from afar, the shrill war-cry in a vavant courier is heard proclaiming the approach of the victorious warriors. The camp is in an instant alive with excitement and commotion. 
men women and children swarm out to meet the advancing party their white horses are painted and decked out in the most fantastic style and led in advance of the triumphal procession and as they pass around through the village the old women set up a most unearthly howl of exultation after which the scalp dance is performed with all the pomp and display their limited resources admit of the warriors having their faces painted black when on the other hand the expedition terminates disastrously by the loss of some of the party in battle the relatives of the deceased cut off their own hair and the tails and manes of their horses as symbols of mourning and howl and cry for a long time in eighteen fifty four i saw the widow of a former chief of the southern comanches whose husband had been dead about three years yet she continued her mourning tribute to his memory by crying daily for him and refusing all offers to marry again the prairie warrior is occasionally seen with the rifle in his hand but his favorite arm is the bow the use of which is taught him at an early age by constant practice he acquires a skill in archery that renders him no less formidable in war than successful in the chase their bows are usually made of the tough and elastic wood of the bois d'ar strengthened and reinforced with sinews of the deer wrapped firmly around and strung with a cord of the same material they are from three to four feet long the arrows which are carried in a quiver upon the back are about twenty inches long of flexible wood with a triangular iron point at one end and at the other two feathers intersecting at right angles at short distances about fifty yards the bow in the hands of the indian is effective and in close proximity with the buffalo throws the arrow entirely through his huge carcass in using this weapon the warrior protects himself from the missiles of his enemy with a shield made of two thicknesses of undressed buffalo hide filled in with hair the comanches sioux and other prairie tribes make their attacks upon the open prairies trusting to their wonderful skill in equitation and horsemanship they ride around their enemies with their bodies thrown upon the opposite side of the horse and discharge their arrows in rapid succession while at full speed they will not however often venture near an enemy who occupies a defensive position if therefore a small party be in danger of an attack from a large force of indians they should seek the cover of timber or a park of wagons or in the absence of these rocks or holes in the prairie which afford good cover attempts to stampede animals are often made when parties first arrive in camp and when every one's attention is preoccupied in the arrangements therewith connected in a country infested by hostile indians the ground in the vicinity of which it is proposed to encamp should be cautiously examined for tracks and other indian signs by making a circuit around the locality previous to unharnessing the animals after indians have succeeded in stampeding a herd of horses or mules and desire to drive them away they are in the habit of pushing them forward as rapidly as possible for the first few days in order to place a wide interval between themselves and any party that may be in pursuit in running off stolen animals the indians are generally divided into two parties one for driving and the other to act as a rear guard before they reach a place where they propose making a halt they leave a vedette upon some prominent point to watch for pursuers and give the main party timely warning enabling them to rally their animals and push forward again tracking indians when an indian sentinel intends to watch for an enemy approaching from the rear he selects the highest position available and places himself near the summit in such an attitude that his entire body shall be concealed from the observation of any one in the rear his head only being exposed above the top of the eminence here he awaits with great patience so long as he thinks there is any possibility of danger and it will be difficult for an enemy to surprise him or to elude his keen and scrutinizing vigilance meanwhile his horse is secured under the screen of the hill all ready when required hence it will be evident that in following indian depredators the utmost vigilance and caution must be exercised to conceal from them the movements of their pursuers they are the best scouts in the world proficient in all the artifices and stratagems available in border warfare and when hotly pursued by a superior force after exhausting all other means of evasion they scatter in different directions and if in a broken or mountainous country they can do no better abandon their horses and baggage and take refuge in the rocks gorges or other hiding places this plan has several times been resorted to by indians in texas when surprised and notwithstanding their pursuers were directly upon them the majority made their escape leaving behind all their animals and other property for overtaking a marauding party of indians who have advanced eight or ten hours before the pursuing party are in readiness to take the trail it is not best to push forward rapidly at first as this will weary and break down horses the indians must be supposed to have at least fifty or sixty miles the start it will therefore be useless to think of overtaking them without providing for a long chase 
scouts should continually be kept out in front upon the trail to reconnoiter and give preconcerted signals to the main party when the indians are espied in approaching all eminences or undulations in the prairie the commander should be careful not to allow any considerable number of his men to pass upon the summits until the country around has been carefully reconnoitred by the scouts who will cautiously raise their eyes above the crests of the most elevated points making a scrutinizing examination in all directions and while doing this should an indian be encountered who has been left behind as a sentinel he must if possible be secured or shot to prevent his giving the alarm to his comrades these precautions cannot be too rigidly enforced when the trail becomes warm and if there be a moon it will be better to lie by in the daytime and follow the trail at night as the great object is to come upon the indians when they are not anticipating an attack such surprises if discreetly conducted generally prove successful as soon as the indians are discovered in their bivouac the pursuing party should dismount leave their horses under charge of a guard in some sequestered place and before advancing to the attack the men should be instructed in signals for their different movements, such as all will easily comprehend and remember. As, for example, a pull upon the right arm may signify to face to the right, and a pull upon the left arm to face to the left, a pull upon the skirt of the coat to halt, a gentle push on the back to advance in ordinary time, a slap on the back to advance in double-quick time, etc. These signals, having been previously well understood and practiced, may be given by the commander to the man next to him, and from him communicated in rapid succession throughout the command i will suppose the party formed in one rank with the commander on the right he gives the signal and the men move off cautiously in the direction indicated the importance of not losing sight of his comrades on his right and left and of not allowing them to get out of his reach so as to break the chain of communication will be apparent to all and great care should be taken that the men do not mistake their brothers in arms for the enemy this may be prevented by having two passwords and when there be any doubt as to the identity of two men who meet during the night operations one of these words may be repeated by each above all the men must be fully impressed with the importance of not firing a shot until the order is given by the commanding officer and also that a rigorous personal accountability will be enforced in all cases of a violation of this rule if the commander gives the signal for commencing the attack by firing a pistol or gun there will probably be no mistake unless it happens through carelessness by the accidental discharge of firearms i can conceive of nothing more appalling or that tends more to throw men off their guard and produce confusion than a sudden and unexpected night attack even the indians who pride themselves upon their coolness and self-possession are far from being exempt from its effects and it is not surprising that men who go to sleep with a sense of perfect security around them and are suddenly aroused from a sound slumber by the terrific sounds of an onslaught from an enemy should lose their presence of mind telegraphing by smokes the transparency of the atmosphere upon the plains is such that objects can be seen at great distances a mountain for example presents a distinct and bold outline at fifty or sixty miles and may occasionally be seen as far as a hundred miles the indians availing themselves of this fact have been in the habit of practising a system of telegraphing by means of smokes during the day and fires by night and i dare say there are but few travellers who have crossed the mountains to california that have not seen these signals made and responded to from peak to peak in rapid succession the indians thus make known to their friends many items of information highly important to them if enemies or strangers make their appearance in the country the fact is telegraphed at once giving them time to secure their animals and to prepare for attack defence or flight war or hunting parties after having been absent a long time from their erratic friends at home and not knowing where to find them make use of the same preconcerted signals to indicate their presence very dense smokes may be raised by kindling a large fire with dry wood and piling upon it the green boughs of pine balsam or hemlock this throws off a heavy cloud of black smoke which can be seen very far this simple method of telegraphing so useful to the savages both in war and in peace may in my judgment be used to advantage in the movements of troops cooperating in separate columns in the indian country i shall not attempt at this time to present a matured system of signals but will merely give a few suggestions tending to illustrate the advantages to be derived from the use of them for example when two columns are marching through a country at such distances apart that smokes may be seen from one to the other their respective positions may be made known to each other at any time by two smokes raised simultaneously or at certain preconcerted intervals should the commander of one column desire to communicate with the other he raises three smokes simultaneously which if seen by the other party should be responded to in the same manner they would then hold themselves in readiness for any other communications 
If an enemy is discovered in small numbers, a smoke raised twice at fifteen minutes interval would indicate it, and if in large force, three times within the same intervals might be the signal. Should the commander of one party desire the other to join him, this might be telegraphed by four smokes at ten minutes interval. Should it become necessary to change the direction of the line of march, the commander may transmit the order by means of two simultaneous smokes raised a certain number of times to indicate the particular direction, for instance twice for north, three times for south, four times for east, and five times for west, three smokes raised twice for northeast, three times for northwest, etc. By multiplying the combination of signals, a great variety of messages might be transmitted in this manner, but to avoid mistakes, the signals should be written down and copies furnished to the commander of each separate party, and they need not necessarily be made known to other persons. During the day, an intelligent man should be detailed to keep a vigilant lookout in all directions for smokes, and he should be furnished with a watch, pencil, and paper to make a record of the signals, with their number, and the time of the intervals between them. End of chapter 6《Chapter Seven of the Prairie Traveller》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《The Prairie Traveller》by Randolph B. Marcy — Chapter Seven — Hunting — Its Benefits to the Soldier — Buffalo, Deer, Antelope, Bear, Bighorn, or Mountain Sheep — Their Habits, and Hints upon the Best Methods of Hunting Them. — Hunting — I know of no better school of practice for perfecting men in target firing and the use of firearms generally than that in which the frontier hunter receives his education. One of the first and most important lessons that he is taught impresses him with the conviction that unless his gun is in good order and steadily directed upon the game, he must go without his supper, and if ambition does not stimulate his efforts, his appetite will, and ultimately lead to success and confidence in his own powers. The man who is afraid to place the butt of his piece firmly against his shoulder, or who turns away his head at the instant of pulling trigger, as soldiers often do before they have been drilled at target practice, will not be likely to bag much game or to contribute materially toward the result of a battle. The successful hunter, as a general rule, is a good shot, will always charge his gun properly, and may be relied upon in action. I would, therefore, when in garrison or at permanent camps, encourage officers and soldiers in field sports. If permitted, men very readily cultivate a fondness for these innocent and healthy exercises, and occupy their leisure time in their pursuit, whereas if confined to the narrow limits of a frontier camp or garrison, having no amusements within their reach, they are prone to indulge in practices which are highly detrimental to their physical and moral condition. By making short excursions about the country they acquire a knowledge of it, become inured to fatigue, learn the art of bivouacking, trailing, etc., etc., all of which will be found serviceable in border warfare, and even if they should perchance now and then miss some of the minor routine duties of the garrison, the benefits they would derive from hunting would, in my opinion, more than counterbalance its effects. Under the old regime it was thought that drills, dress parades, and guard mountings comprehended the sum total of the soldier's education but the experience of the last ten years has taught us that these are only the rudiments and that to combat successfully with indians we must receive instruction from them study their tactics and where they suit our purposes copy from them the union of discipline with the individuality self-reliance and rapidity of locomotion of the savage is what we should aim at this will be the tendency of the course indicated, and it is conceived by the writer that an army composed of well-disciplined hunters will be the most efficient of all others against the only enemy we have to encounter within the limits of our vast possessions. I find some pertinent remarks upon this subject in a very sensible essay by a late captain of infantry, U.S. He says, quote, It is conceived that scattered bands of mounted hunters, with the speed of a horse and the watchfulness of a wolf or antelope, whose faculties are sharpened by their necessities, who, when they get short of provisions, separate and look for something to eat, and find it in the water, in the ground, or on the surface, whose bill of fare ranges from grass seed, nuts, roots, grasshoppers, lizards, and rattlesnakes up to the antelope, deer, elk, bear, and buffalo, and who have a continent to roam over, will be neither surprised, caught, conquered, overawed, or reduced to famine by a rumbling, bugle-blowing, drum-beating town passing through their country on wheels at the speed of a loaded wagon. If the Indians are in the path and do not wish to be seen, they cross a ridge, and the town moves on, ignorant whether there are fifty Indians within a mile or no Indian within fifty miles. If the Indians wish to see, they return to the crest of the ridge, crawl up to the edge, pull up a bunch of grass by the roots, and look through or under it at the procession. End quote. 
although i would always encourage men in hunting when permanently located yet unless they are good woodsmen it is not safe to permit them to go out alone in marching through the indian country as aside from the danger of encountering indians they would be liable to become bewildered and perhaps lost and this might detain the entire party in searching for them the better plan upon a march is for three or four to go out together accompanied by a good woodsman who will be able with certainty to lead them back to camp the little group could ascertain if indians are about and would be strong enough to act on the defensive against small parties of them and while they are amusing themselves they may perform an important part as scouts and flankers an expedition may have been perfectly organized and everything provided that the wisest forethought could suggest yet circumstances beyond the control of the most experienced traveller may sometimes arise to defeat the best concerted plans it is not for example an impossible contingency that the traveller may by unforeseen delays consume his provisions lose them in crossing streams or have them stolen by hostile indians and be reduced to the necessity of depending upon game for subsistence under these circumstances a few observations upon the habits of the different animals that frequent the plains and on the best methods of hunting them may not be altogether devoid of interest or utility in this connection the buffalo the largest and most useful animal that roams over the prairies is the buffalo it provides food clothing and shelter to thousands of natives whose means of livelihood depend almost exclusively upon this gigantic monarch of the prairies not many years since they thronged in countless multitudes over all that vast area lying between mexico and the british possessions but now their range is confined within very narrow limits and a few more years will probably witness the extinction of the species the traveller in passing from texas or arkansas through southern new mexico to california does not at the present day encounter the buffalo but upon all the routes north of latitude thirty six degrees the animal is still found between the ninety ninth and hundred and second meridians of longitude although generally regarded as migratory in their habits yet the buffalo often winter in the snows of a high northern latitude early in the spring of eighteen fifty eight i found them in the rocky mountains at the head of the arkansas and south platte rivers and there was every indication that this was a permanent abiding place for them there are two methods generally practised in hunting the buffalo viz running them on horseback and stalking or still hunting the first method requires a sure-footed and tolerably fleet horse that is not easily frightened the buffalo cow which makes much better beef than the bull when pursued by the hunter runs rapidly and unless the horse be fleet it requires a long and exhausting chase to overtake her when the buffalo are discovered and the hunter intends to give chase he should first dismount arrange his saddle blanket and saddle buckle the girth tight and make everything about his horse furniture snug and secure he should then put his arms in good firing order and taking the lee side of the herd so that they may not get the wind of him he should approach in a walk as close as possible taking advantage of any cover that may offer his horse then being cool and fresh will be able to dash into the herd and probably carry his rider very near the animal he has selected before he becomes alarmed if the hunter be right-handed and uses a pistol he should approach upon the left side and when nearly opposite and close upon the buffalo deliver his shot taking aim a little below the centre of the body and about eight inches back of the shoulder this will strike the vitals and generally render another shot unnecessary when a rifle or shotgun is used the hunter rides up on the right side keeping his horse well in hand so as to be able to turn off if the beast charges upon him this however never happens except with a buffalo that is wounded when it is advisable to keep out of his reach the buffalo has immense powers of endurance and will run for many miles without any apparent effort or diminution in speed the first buffalo i ever saw i followed about ten miles and when i left him he seemed to run faster than when the chase commenced as a long buffalo chase is very severe labor upon a horse i would recommend to all travellers unless they have a good deal of surplus horse flesh never to expend it in running buffalo still hunting which requires no consumption of horse flesh and is equally successful with the other method is recommended in stalking on horseback the most broken and hilly localities should be selected as these will furnish cover to the hunter who passes from the crest of one hill to another examining the country carefully in all directions when the game is discovered, if it happens to be on the lee side, the hunter should endeavor, by making a wide detour, to get upon the opposite side, as he will find it impossible to approach within rifle range with the wind. When the animal is upon a hill, or in any other position where he cannot be approached without danger of disturbing him, the hunter should wait until he moves off to more favorable ground, and this will not generally require much time, as they wander about a great deal when not grazing. He then pickets his horse and approaches cautiously, seeking to screen himself as much as possible by the undulations in the surface or behind such other objects as may present themselves 
but if the surface should offer no cover he must crawl upon his hands and knees when near the game and in this way he can generally get within rifle range should there be several animals together and his first shot take effect the hunter can often get several other shots before they become frightened a delaware indian and myself once killed five buffaloes out of a small herd before the remainder were so much disturbed as to move away although we were within the short distance of twenty yards yet the reports of our rifles did not frighten them in the least and they continued grazing during all the time we were loading and firing the sense of smelling is exceedingly acute with the buffalo and they will take the wind from the hunter at as great a distance as a mile when the animal is wounded and stops it is better not to go near him until he lies down as he will often run a great distance if disturbed but if left to himself will in many cases die in a short time the tongues humps and marrow bones are regarded as the choice parts of the animal the tongue is taken out by ripping open the skin between the prongs of the lower jawbone and pulling it out through the orifice the hump may be taken off by skinning down on each side of the shoulders and cutting away the meat after which the hump ribs can be unjointed where they unite with the spine the marrow when roasted in the bones is delicious the deer of all game quadrupeds indigenous to this continent the common red deer is probably more widely dispersed from north to south and from east to west over our vast possessions than any other they are found in all latitudes from hudson's bay to mexico and they clamber over the most elevated peaks of the western sierras with the same ease that they range the eastern forests or the everglades of florida in summer they crop the grass upon the summits of the rocky mountains and in winter when the snow falls deep they descend into sheltered valleys where they fall an easy prey to the indians besides the common red deer of the eastern states two other varieties are found in the rocky mountains viz the black-tailed deer which takes its name from the fact of its having a small tuft of black hair upon the end of its tail and the long-tailed species the former of these is considerably larger than the eastern deer and is much darker being of a very deep yellowish iron gray with a yellowish red upon the belly it frequents the mountains and is never seen far away from them its habits are similar to those of the red deer and it is hunted in the same way the only difference i have been able to discern between the long-tailed variety and the common deer is in the length of the tail and body i have seen this animal only in the neighborhood of the rocky mountains but it may resort to other localities although the deer are still abundant in many of our forest districts in the east and do not appear to decrease very rapidly yet there has within a few years been a very evident diminution in the number of those frequenting our western prairies in passing through southern texas in eighteen forty six thousands of deer were met with daily and astonishing as it may appear it was no uncommon spectacle to see from one to two hundred in a single herd the prairies seemed literally alive with them but in eighteen fifty five it was seldom that a herd often was seen in the same localities it seemed to me that the vast herds first met with could not have been killed off by the hunters in that sparsely populated section and i was puzzled to know what had become of them it is possible that they may have moved off into mexico they certainly are not in our territory at the present time twenty years experience in deer hunting has taught me several facts relative to the habits of the animal which when well understood will be found of much service to the inexperienced hunter and greatly contribute to his success the best target shots are not necessarily the most skilful deer stalkers one of the great secrets of this art is in knowing how to approach the game without giving alarm and this cannot easily be done unless the hunter sees it before he is himself discovered there are so many objects in the woods resembling the deer in color that none but a practiced eye can often detect the difference when the deer is reposing he generally turns his head from the wind in which position he can see an enemy approaching from that direction and his nose will apprise him of the presence of danger from the opposite side the best method of hunting deer therefore is across the wind while the deer are feeding early in the morning and a short time before dark in the evening are the best times to stalk them as they are then busily occupied and less on the alert when a deer is espied with his head down cropping the grass the hunter advances cautiously keeping his eyes constantly directed upon him and screening himself behind intervening objects or in the absence of other cover crawls along upon his hands and knees in the grass until the deer hears his step and raises his head when he must instantly stop and remain in an attitude fixed and motionless as a statue for the animal's vision is his keenest sense when alarmed he will detect the slightest movement of a small object and unless the hunter stands or lies perfectly still his presence will be detected if the hunter does not move the deer will after a short time recover from his alarm and resume his grazing when he may be again approached the deer always exhibits his alarm by a sudden jerking of the tail just before he raises his head 
i once saw a delaware indian walk directly up within rifle range of a deer that was feeding upon the open prairie and shoot him down he was however a long time in approaching and made frequent halts whenever the animal flirted his tail and raised his head although he often turned toward the hunter yet he did not appear to notice him probably taking him for a stump or a tree when the deer are lying down in the smooth prairie unless the grass is tall it is difficult to get near them as they are generally looking around and become alarmed at the least noise the Indians are in the habit of using a small instrument which imitates the bleat of the young fawn, with which they lure the doe within range of their rifles. The young fawn gives out no scent upon its track, until it is sufficiently grown to make good running. And instinct teaches the mother that this wise provision of nature to preserve the helpless little quadruped from the ravages of wolves, panthers, and other carnivorous beasts will be defeated if she remains with it, as her tracks cannot be concealed. She therefore hides her fawn in the grass, where it is almost impossible to see it, even when very near it, goes off to some neighboring thicket within call, and makes her bed alone. The Indian pot-hunter, who is but little scrupulous as to the means he employs in accomplishing his ends, sounds the bleat along near the places where he thinks the game is lying, and the unsuspicious doe, who imagines that her offspring is in distress, rushes with headlong impetuosity toward the sound, and often goes within a few yards of the hunter to receive her death wound this is cruel sport and can only be justified when meat is scarce which is very frequently the case in the indian's larder it does not always comport with a man's feelings of security especially if he happens to be a little nervous to sound the deer bleat in a wild region of country i once undertook to experiment with the instrument myself and made my first essay in attempting to call up an antelope which i discovered in the distance i succeeded admirably in luring the wary victim within shooting range had raised upon my knees and was just in the act of pulling the trigger when a rustling in the grass on my left drew my attention in that direction, where, much to my surprise, I beheld a huge panther within about twenty yards, bounding with gigantic strides directly toward me. I turned my rifle, and in an instant, much to my relief and gratification, its contents were lodged in the heart of the beast. Many men, when they suddenly encounter a deer, are seized with nervous excitement, called in sporting parlance the buck fever, which causes them to fire at random, notwithstanding i have had much experience in hunting i must confess that i am never entirely free from some of the symptoms of this malady when firing at large game and i believe that in four out of five cases where i have missed the game my balls have passed too high i have endeavoured to obviate this by sighting my rifle low and it has been attended with more successful results the same remarks apply to most other men i have met with they fire too high when excited the antelope this animal frequents the most elevated bleak and naked prairies in all the latitudes from mexico to oregon and constitutes an important item of subsistence with many of the prairie indians it is the most wary timid and fleet animal that inhabits the plains it is about the size of a small deer with a heavy coating of coarse wiry hair and its flesh is more tender and juicy than that of the deer it seldom enters a timbered country but seems to delight in cropping the grass from the elevated swells of the prairies when disturbed by the traveller it will circle around him with the speed of the wind but does not stop until it reaches some prominent position whence it can survey the country on all sides and nothing seems to escape its keen vision they will sometimes stand for a long time and look at a man provided he does not move or go out of sight but if he goes behind a hill with the intention of passing around and getting nearer to them he will never find them again in the same place i have often tried the experiment and invariably found that as soon as i went where the antelope could not see me he moved off their sense of hearing as well as vision is very acute which renders it difficult to stalk them by taking advantage of the cover afforded in broken ground the hunter may by moving slowly and cautiously over the crests of the irregularities in the surface sometimes approach within rifle range the antelope possesses a greater degree of curiosity than any other animal i know of and will often approach very near a strange object the experienced hunter taking advantage of this peculiarity lies down and secretes himself in the grass after which he raises his handkerchief hand or foot so as to attract the attention of the animal and thus often succeeds in beguiling him within shooting distance in some valleys near the rocky mountains where the pasturage is good during the winter season they collect in immense herds the indians are in the habit of surrounding them in such localities and running them with their horses until they tire them out when they slay large numbers the antelope makes a track much shorter than the deer very broad and round at the heel and quite sharp at the toe a little experience renders it easy to distinguish them the bear besides the common black bear of the eastern states several others are found in the mountains of california oregon utah and new mexico 
viz the grizzly brown and cinnamon varieties all have nearly the same habits and are hunted in the same manner from all i had heard of the grizzly bear i was induced to believe him one of the most formidable and savage animals in the universe and that the man who would deliberately encounter and kill one of these beasts had performed a signal feat of courage which entitled him to a lofty position among the votaries of nimrod so firmly had i become impressed with this conviction that i should have been very reluctant to fire upon one had i met him when alone and on foot the grizzly bear is assuredly the monarch of the american forests and so far as physical strength is concerned he is perhaps without a rival in the world but after some experience in hunting my opinions regarding his courage and his willingness to attack men have very materially changed in passing over the elevated table lands lying between the two forks of the platte river in eighteen fifty eight i encountered a full-grown female grizzly bear with two cubs very quietly reposing upon the open prairie several miles distant from any timber this being the first opportunity that had ever occurred to me for an encounter with the ursine monster and being imbued with the most exalted notions of the beast's proclivities for offensive warfare especially when in the presence of her offspring it may very justly be imagined that i was rather more excited than usual i however determined to make the assault i felt the utmost confidence in my horse as she was afraid of nothing and after arranging everything about my saddle and arms in good order i advanced to within about eighty yards before i was discovered by the bear when she raised upon her haunches and gave me a scrutinizing examination i seized this opportune moment to fire but missed my aim and she started off followed by her cubs at their utmost speed after reloading my rifle i pursued and on coming again within range delivered another shot which struck the large bear in the fleshy part of the thigh whereupon she set up a most distressing howl and accelerated her pace leaving her cubs behind after loading again i gave the spurs to my horse and resumed the chase soon passing the cubs who were making the most plaintive cries of distress they were heard by the dam but she gave no other heed to them than occasionally to halt for an instant turn around sit up on her posteriors and give a hasty look back but as soon as she saw me following her she invariably turned again and redoubled her speed i pursued about four miles and fired four balls into her before i succeeded in bringing her to the ground and from the time i first saw her until her death wound notwithstanding i was very often close upon her heels she never came to bay or made the slightest demonstration of resistance her sole purpose seemed to be to make her escape leaving her cubs in the most cowardly manner upon three other different occasions i met the mountain bears and once the cinnamon species which is called the most formidable of all and in none of these instances did they exhibit the slightest indication of anger or resistance but invariably ran from me such is my experience with this formidable monarch of the mountains it is possible that if a man came suddenly upon the beast in a thicket where it could have no previous warning he might be attacked but it is my opinion that if the bear gets the wind or sight of a man at any considerable distance it will endeavour to get away as soon as possible i am so fully impressed with this idea that i shall hereafter hunt bear with a feeling of as much security as i would have in hunting the buffalo the grizzly like the black bear hibernates in winter and makes his appearance in the spring with his claws grown out long and very soft and tender he is then poor and unfit for food i have heard a very curious fact stated by several old mountaineers regarding the mountain bears which of course i cannot vouch for but it is given by them with great apparent sincerity and candour they assert that no instance has ever been known of a female bear having been killed in a state of pregnancy this singular fact in the history of the animal seems most inexplicable to me unless she remain concealed in her brumal slumber until after she has been delivered of her cubs i was told by an old delaware indian that when the bear has been travelling against the wind and wishes to lie down he always turns in an opposite direction and goes some distance away from his first track before making his bed if an enemy then comes upon his trail his keen sense of smell will apprise him of the danger the same indian mentioned that when a bear has been pursued and sought shelter in a cave he had often endeavoured to eject him with smoke but that the bear would advance to the mouth of the cave where the fire was burning and put it out with his paws then retreat into the cave again this would indicate that bruin is endowed with some glimpses of reason beyond the ordinary instincts of the brute creation in general and indeed is capable of discerning the connection between cause and effect notwithstanding the extraordinary intelligence which this quadruped exhibits upon some occasions upon others he shows himself to be one of the most stupid brutes imaginable 
For example, when he has taken possession of a cavern, and the courageous hunter enters with a torch and rifle, it is said he will, instead of forcibly ejecting the intruder, raise himself upon his haunches, and cover his eyes with his paws, so as to exclude the light, apparently thinking that in this situation he cannot be seen. The hunter can then approach as close as he pleases and shoot him down. The Bighorn the bighorn, or mountain sheep, which has a body like the deer with the head of a sheep, surmounted by an enormous pair of short heavy horns, is found throughout the Rocky Mountains, and resorts to the most inaccessible peaks and to the wildest and least frequented glens. It clambers over almost perpendicular cliffs with the greatest ease and celerity, and skips from rock to rock, cropping the tender herbage that grows upon them. It has been supposed by some that this animal leaps down from crag to crag, lighting upon his horns, as an evidence of which it has been advanced that the front part of the horns is often much battered. This I believe to be erroneous, as it is very common to see horns that have no bruises upon them. The old mountaineers say that they have often seen the bucks engaged in desperate encounters with their huge horns, which in striking together make loud reports. This will account for the marks sometimes seen upon them. The flesh of the bighorn, when fat, is more tender, juicy, and delicious than that of any other animal I know of, but it is a bonne bouche which will not grace the tables of our city epicures until a railroad to the Rocky Mountains affords the means of transporting it to a market a thousand miles distant from its haunts. In its habits, the mountain sheep greatly resembles the chamois of Switzerland, and it is hunted in the same manner. The hunter traverses the most inaccessible and broken localities, moving along with great caution, as the least unusual noise causes them to flit away like a phantom, and they will be seen no more. The animal is gregarious, but it is seldom that more than eight or ten are found in a flock. When not grazing, they seek the sheltered sides of the mountains, and repose among the rocks. End of chapter 7 Itineraries 1 through 4 of The Prairie Traveller. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Prairie Traveller by Randolph B. Marcy. Itinerary 1. From Fort Smith, Arkansas, to Santa Fe and Albuquerque, New Mexico, by Captain R. B. Marcy, USA. Fifteen miles from Fort Smith to Strickland's Farm. The road crosses the Poteau River at Fort Smith, where there is a ferry. It then follows the Poteau Bottom for ten miles. This part of the road is very muddy after heavy rains. At 14 miles, it passes the Choctaw Agency, where there are several stores. There is the greatest abundance of wood, water, and grass at all camps for the first 200 miles. Where any of these are wanting, it will be specially mentioned. The road passes through the Choctaw settlements for about 150 miles, and corn and supplies can be purchased from these Indians at reasonable rates. 11 miles to Camp Creek. Road crosses a prairie of 3 miles in length, then enters a heavy forest. The camp is on a small branch, with grass plenty in a small prairie about 400 yards to the left of the road. 12 miles to Coon Creek. Road passes through the timber and is muddy in a rainy season. 12 miles to Sambois Creek. Prairie near, some Choctaw houses at the crossing. 14 miles to Bend of Sambois Creek. Indian Farm. 15 miles to South Fork of Canadian or Gaines Creek. Road traverses a very rough and hilly region. There is a ford and a ferry upon the creek. Indian Farm on the west bank. 12 miles to First Fort of Coal Creek. Road crosses over a rolling prairie, and at 4 miles the Fort Washita Road turns to the left. Second Fort of Coal Creek, Indian Farm. 4 miles to Little Cedar Mountain, very rough mountainous road. 5 miles to Shawnee Village, several Indian houses. 14 miles to Shawnee Town. Road passes several small prairies, Indian settlements, store on opposite bank of Canadian River near the camp. 21 miles to Delaware Mountain. Road passes over a very beautiful country with small streams of good water frequent and good camps. It crosses small prairies and groves of timber. Five miles to Boggy River. Road passes a country similar to that mentioned above. Three miles to Clear Creek. Road turns to the right near a prominent round mound. Beautiful country diversified with prairies and timbered lands. Seven miles to Branch of Topofki Creek. Beautiful country and fine roads. Nine and a half miles to Cane Creek. Excellent camp. Five miles to Small Branch. Road passes about two miles from the old Camp Arbuckle, built by Captain Marcy in 1853, since occupied by Black Beaver and several Delaware families. Eleven and a half miles to Mustang Creek. Road runs on the dividing ridge between the waters of the Washita and Canadian on a high prairie. Seventeen and a half miles to Choteau's Creek. Road passes on the high prairie opposite Choteau's old trading house and leaves the outer limits of the Indian settlements. Excellent road and good camps at short distances. Eleven and three quarter miles on Choteau's Creek. Road runs up the creek is smooth and good. Twelve and three quarter miles to head of Choteau's Creek. 
Road runs up the creek and is good. Seventeen and a quarter miles to branch of Washita River. Road runs over an elevated prairie country and passes a small branch at six miles from last camp. Five and three-quarter miles to branch of Spring Creek. Good camp. Sixteen miles to head of Spring Creek. Road traverses a high prairie country, is smooth and firm. Thirteen miles to Red Mounds. Road runs over a high rolling prairie country and is excellent. Five miles to branch of Washita River. Good road. Fifteen and three-quarter miles to branch of Canadian. Road continues on the ridge dividing the Washita and Canadian rivers, is smooth and firm. Seventeen and three-quarter miles to branch of Washita River. Road continues on the divide. Eighteen miles to branch of Canadian. Road continues on the divide from one to four miles from the Canadian. Nineteen miles on Canadian River. Good road. Sixteen miles to Little Washita River. Good road, timber becoming scarce. Thirteen miles to branch of Canadian. Good road. Seventeen and a half miles to Antelope Buttes. Road runs along the Canadian bottom and in places is sandy. Fourteen miles to Rush Lake. Small pond on the prairie. No wood within half a mile. Some buffalo chips. Poor water. Sixteen miles to branch of Washita River. Good road on the divide. Ten and a quarter miles to Dry River. Road descends a very long hill and crosses the Dry River near the Canadian. Water can be found by digging about a foot in the sand of the creek. Good grass on the west bank. Seventeen miles to branch of Canadian. Road winds up a very long and abrupt hill, but is smooth and firm. Twenty-two and a half miles to Timbered Creek. Road passes over a very elevated prairie country and descends by a long hill into the beautiful valley of Timbered Creek. Eleven and a half miles to Spring Branch. Good camp. Fourteen miles on Spring Branch. Good camp. Seventeen and three-quarter miles to Branch of Canadian. Road passes a small branch three and a half miles from the last camp. Eighteen and three-eighth miles to Branch of Canadian. Road passes a small branch of the Canadian at eight miles from the last camp. Seventeen and seven-eighth miles to Spring Branch. Good road. Nine and a half miles to Branch of Canadian. Good road and camp. Eighteen and a half miles on Branch of the Canadian. Good road and camp. Ten and a quarter miles to Pools of Water. Good camp. Ten miles to Large Pond. Good camp. Twenty-five miles to Pools of Water. No wood, water brackish. The road passes over a very elevated and dry country without wood or water. Eighteen and a half miles to Head of Branch. At thirteen and a half miles, the road crosses a branch of the Canadian. Nineteen and three-quarter miles to Laguna, Colorado. Road here falls into an old Mexican cart road. Good springs on the left up the creek, with wood and grass abundant. Seven miles to Pools of Water. Road runs through cedars. Ten and three-quarter miles to Pajarito Creek. Grass begins to be rather short in places, but is abundant on the creek. Thirteen and a half miles to Gallinas Creek. Good camp. Fifteen miles to Second Gallinas Creek. Good road. Sixteen and a half miles to Pecos River at Anton Chico. This is the very first settlement after leaving Camp Arbuckle. Corn and vegetables can be purchased here. Grass is generally short here. Fifteen miles to Pecos River opposite Casta. Road runs through the cedar and is firm and good. Camp is in sight of the town of Casta, upon a very elevated bluff. Twenty-one and three-quarter miles to Laguna, Colorado. Road passes through a wooded country for a portion of the distance, but leaves it before reaching camp, where there is no wood, but water generally sufficient for trains. In a very dry season, it has been known to fail. The road forks here, the right leading to Santa Fe via Galistillo, forty-five and a half miles, and the left to Albuquerque, twenty-two and a half miles to San Antonio, good road, eighteen and three-quarter miles to Albuquerque, good road. Total distance from Fort Smith to Albuquerque, 814 and three-quarter miles. Total distance from Fort Smith to Santa Fe, 819 miles. Itinerary 2. From Fort Leavenworth to Santa Fe, by the way of the upper ferry of the Kansas River and the Cimarron. In this table, the distances taken by an odometer are given in miles and hundredths of a mile. The measured distances between the crossings of the Arkansas and Santa Fe are from Major Kendrick's published table, Wood, water, and grass are found at all points where the absence of them is not stated. From Fort Leavenworth to Salt Creek, 2.88 miles. 9.59 miles to Strangers Creek. 13.54 miles on Strangers Creek. 9.6 miles to Grasshopper Creek. 6.5 miles on Grasshopper Creek. 2.86 miles on Grasshopper Creek. 2.6 miles on Grasshopper Creek. 4.54 miles to Soldier Creek. 2.45 miles to Upper Ferry, Kansas River. 7.41 miles to Pottawatomie Settlement, 5.75 miles to Pottawatomie Creek, 3.89 miles to White Wakarusi Creek, 7.78 miles on White Wakarusi Creek, 6.27 miles on White Wakarusi Creek, 0.73 miles to Road from Independence, no place to encamp, 5.72 miles on White Wakarusi Creek, 
2.51 miles on White Wakaruzi Creek. 2.82 miles to 142 Mile Creek. 7.8 miles to Bluff Creek. 5.77 miles to Rock Creek. 5.08 miles to Big John Spring. 2.29 miles to Council Grove. 7.97 miles to Elm Creek. Water generally. 8.06 miles to Diamond Spring. 1.42 miles to Diamond Creek. 15.46 miles to Lost Spring. No wood. 9.25 miles to Mud Creek. Water uncertain. No wood. 7.76 miles to Cottonwood Creek. 6.16 miles to Waterholes. Water generally. No wood. 12.44 miles to Big Turkey Creek. No water. 7.83 miles to Little Turkey Creek. Water uncertain. No wood. 18.19 miles to Little Arkansas River. 10.6 miles to Owl Creek. Water generally in holes above and below crossing. 6.39 miles to Little Cow Creek. Water only occasionally. 2.93 miles to Big Cow Creek. Water holes, 10 miles estimated. Water uncertain, no wood. 18.24 miles to Bend of the Arkansas. 6.66 miles to Walnut Creek. 16.35 miles to Pawnee Rock. Teams sometimes camp near here and drive stock to the Arkansas to water. No wood. 5.28 miles to Ash Creek. Water above and below crossing, uncertain. 6.65 miles to Pawnee Fork. Best grass some distance above crossing. From Pawnee Fork to the lower crossing of the Arkansas, a distance of 98.5 miles, convenient camping places can be found along the Arkansas. The most prominent localities are therefore only mentioned. A supply of fuel should be laid in at Pawnee Fork to last you till you pass Fort Mann, though it may be obtained but inconveniently from the opposite side of the Arkansas. Dry route branches off at 3.5 miles estimated. This route joins the main one again 10 miles this side of Fort Mann. It is said to be a good one, but deficient in water and without wood. 11.43 miles to Coon Creek, 46.58 miles to Jackson's Island, 5.01 miles, dry route comes in, 10.05 miles to Fort Mann, 25.34 miles to lower crossing of the Arkansas. The Bents Fort route branches off at this point. For the distances upon this route, see next table. A supply of wood should be got from this vicinity to last till you reach Cedar Creek. 15.68 miles to Waterhole, Water uncertain, no wood. 30.02 miles to two water holes. Water uncertain, no wood. 14.14 miles to lower Cimarron Springs, no wood. 20 miles to pools of water. Water uncertain, no wood. 19.02 miles to Middle Springs of the Cimarron, no wood. 12.93 miles to Little Crossing of the Cimarron, no wood. 14.1 miles to Upper Cimarron Springs, no wood. Pools of water seven miles estimated, no wood. 19.05 miles to Cold Spring, a tree here and there in the vicinity, pools of water, 11 miles estimated, water uncertain, no wood. 16.13 miles to Cedar Creek, Manise Creek, 10 miles estimated, water indifferent and uncertain, scant pasture, no wood. Arroyo de la Seña, 2.5 miles estimated, no water. 21.99 miles to Cottonwood Creek, no water. Arroyo del Burro, 5 miles estimated. 15.17 miles to Rabbit Ear Creek, 10 miles estimated, springs, round mound, 8 miles estimated, no water, no wood, no camping place, Rock Creek, 10 miles estimated, grazing scant, no wood, 26.4 miles to Whetstone Creek, spring, no wood, Arroyo Don Carlos, 10.5 miles estimated, water, etc., to the left of the road, 14.13 miles to Point of Rocks, Water and grass up the canyon just after crossing the point, scattering shrub cedars in the neighboring heights. 16.62 miles to Sandy Arroyo. Water uncertain, no wood. Crossing of Canadian River, four and three-quarter miles estimated. Grazing above the crossing, willows. 10.05 miles to Rio Ocote. Wood one-third of a mile to the right of the road. Grass in the canyon. Pond of water, thirteen and a half miles estimated. No wood. 19.65 miles to Wagon Mound, Santa Clara Springs. Wood brought from the Rio Ocate, Rio del Perro, Rock Creek, 17.5 miles estimated. 21.62 miles to Canyon del Lobo, Rio Moro, 3.5 miles estimated. Rio Sapio, 1 mile estimated. The Bents Fort route comes in here. 18 miles to Las Vegas, forage purchasable. 13.05 miles to Tacolote, forage purchasable, Ojo Vernal. 5 miles estimated, no grass to speak of. 14 miles to San Miguel, forage purchasable, no grass. 
21.81 miles to ruins of Pecos. Grazing very scant. Cottonwood Creek, 4.5 miles estimated. Water uncertain. No grass. 13.41 miles to Stone Corral. No grass. 10.8 miles to Santa Fe. Forage purchasable. No grazing. Itinerary 3. Camping places upon a road discovered and marked out from Fort Smith, Arkansas, to Doña Aña and El Paso, New Mexico, in 1849, by Captain R. B. Marcy, U.S.A. 65 miles from Fort Smith to South Fork of the Canadian. The road from Fort Smith to the South Fork of the Canadian follows the same track as the road to Albuquerque and Santa Fe, and by reference to the tables of distances for that road, the intermediate camps will be found. 15 miles to Pryor's Store. Grass, wood, and water near. 17 and a half miles to Little Boggy. Good camp. Wherever there are not requisites of wood, water, and grass for encamping, it will be specially noted. When they are not mentioned, they will always be found. 13 miles on Little Boggy. Good camp. 15 and a half miles to Boggy Depot. Store and blacksmith shop. 12 and three-fifths miles to Blue River. The road passes over a flat section, which is muddy after rains. 8 and a half miles to Fort Washita. Good camp half a mile before reaching the fort. The road forks at an Indian village on the boggy, the left being the most direct. There are settlers along the road who will give all necessary information to strangers. Corn plenty. 22 miles to Preston, Texas, on Red River. The road from Fort Washita runs through the Indian settlements, passing many places where good camps may be found, and crosses the Red River at Preston. There is a ferry here, also stores and a blacksmith shop. 20 miles to McCarty's. Road runs through a heavy timbered country, crossing several streams where there are good camps. 14 and 2 fifth miles to Elm Fork of the Trinity at Gainesville. Road passes over a section diversified by prairies and groves of timber. 12 miles on Elm Fork of Trinity, good camp. 11 miles on Elm Fork of Trinity, excellent camps. Road passes over a beautiful country rapidly settling up with farmers who cultivate and sell grain at low rates. 9 miles to Turkey Creek, tributary of Red River. Road emerges from the upper cross timbers 2 miles from camp. 26 and 3 quarter miles to Buffalo Springs. Springs of good water, but of limited amount, in a ravine. 12 miles on a ravine. Pools of good water and a small running stream, not reliable. 13 and a half miles on a ravine. Pools of water. 17 and a quarter miles on a ravine. Pools of water. 17 and a quarter miles to running branch of Cottonwood Spring. Branch about 2 feet wide. Good water. Wood about half a mile distant. 14 miles to Fort Belknap. Good road through post oak timber. County seat and town at Fort Belknap. Good camp on the west side of the Brazos, which is always fordable except in very high water. 14 miles to small branch. Water in holes. 18 miles to water holes. Pools of water. Road passes over prairie and timbered lands. Is very smooth and level. 7.5 miles to Stern's Farm on Clear Fork of the Brazos River. Good road. Excellent camp with abundance of wood, water, and grass. Indian reservation here. 13 miles to Elm Creek or Quaquahono. Good road over rolling prairie and mesquite lands. 17 miles to ravine. Pools of standing water. Good road. 18 miles to ravine. Pools of standing water. Good road. 27 miles to small creek. Tributary of the Brazos. Good road. 6 miles to pools of water. Good camp. 8.5 miles to small branch. Good water. 20.5 miles to tributary of the Colorado. Brackish water. 3.25 miles to Rio, Colorado. Brackish water, road very excellent. Twelve and a tenth miles to spring on the road, good water. Twenty-two and nine-tenth miles to big spring to the left of the road, affording a great amount of water which runs off in a small stream. Twenty-three miles to Laguna, Colorado, water somewhat sulfurous, fuel mesquite roots, grass abundant. Thirty-five miles to Mustang Pond. This pond is north of the road about two miles and was found in 1849, but immigrants and others have not been able to find it since. For this reason, I would advise travelers to fill their water kegs at the Laguna, Colorado, as in a very dry season they might not be able to get any water until they reach the sand hills. The road is excellent over the Llano Estacado, or Staked Plain. Thirty-four and a half miles to Sand Hills. Water in holes. The water is good here and can always be relied on as permanent. The road through the sand hills is very heavy, and I would advise travelers with loaded wagons to make half loads. Thirty-one and a half miles to Laguna near the Pecos River. Road passes through the hills and descends the high prairie to the valley of the Pecos, Laguna on the left. Fifteen and five-eighth miles to crossing of the Pecos. Water deep and not fordable. River forty-two yards wide. A road leads up the eastern bank of the Pecos to a ford with rock bottom. 
Good camps can be had at almost any point on the Pecos. The water is brackish, but can be used without harm. Fifty-four and a half miles on the Pecos River, point of the river where the road turns off toward Delaware Creek. Nine and one-eighth miles on Delaware Creek. Good road after leaving the Pecos River. The road on the Pecos is good in the bottom in very dry weather, but after heavy rains it is submerged and very muddy. Travelers should then turn off to the bluffs. The water in Delaware Creek is brackish. Eleven and seven-eighth miles to Ojo de San Martin. Fine spring of fresh water, also mineral spring. Good road up Delaware Creek. Fifteen and three-tenth miles to Independence Spring. Large spring of excellent water. Look out for Indians. Five and one-tenth miles to Ojo de Camin. Good spring in the pine timber at the base of the mountain. Four and a half miles to Peak of the Guadalupe. Spring at the foot of the mountain. Road descends the mountain and is very steep. Twenty-three and seven-eighth miles to Ojo del Cuervo. Road descends through a very rough and sinuous ravine and crosses a long prairie to camp at a pond of standing water. No wood. Twenty-six miles to Cornudas. Wells. Well in the rocks. Plenty of water for small parties. Road good. Eight and three-quarter miles to Sierra del Alamo. Road good. Water limited in quantity. There is a small spring upon the side of the mountain. No wood except a few mesquite roots. Twenty-two and a quarter miles to Waco Tanks. Good water in a large reservoir in the rocks. The road here branches, the left leading to El Paso and the right to Doña Aña. Twenty-eight miles to El Paso on the Rio del Norte. Good road with some sand, no water upon it. The distance from the Waco Tanks to Doña Aña is sixty-three miles, but forty miles of the road is over heavy sand and no water until reaching the mountain twenty-five miles from Doña Aña. I would recommend travelers to take the El Paso road in preference. Total distance from Fort Smith to El Paso, 860 miles. Itinerary 4. From Leavenworth City to Great Salt Lake City. 3 miles from Leavenworth City to Salt Creek. Good camp, wood, water, and grass. 12 miles to Cold Spring. To the right of the road in a deep ravine, plenty of wood, water, and grass. 12 miles to Small Branch. To the north of the road in an arroyo, good water, wood, and grass. Here enters the road from Atchison, six miles distant. Sixteen and two-third miles to Grasshopper Creek. Good wood, water, and grass. Nine and a half miles to Walnut Creek. Road passes a town called Whitehead, four miles from last camp. Water in pools, but three-quarter of a mile below is a fine spring. Plenty of wood, water, and grass. Seventeen miles to Grasshopper Creek. Good camp with wood, water, and grass. Twelve and a half miles to Big Nemaha, two miles above Richland. Good wood, water, and grass near the creek. 11 miles to water holes. On the ridge at the head of a ravine are wood, water, and grass, but in a dry time there would be but little water. 10 and 3 quarter miles to Vermilion Creek. Water in the creek not good, but there is a good well of cold water near the road. Wood and grass good. 21 and a half miles to Big Blue River. Upper crossing, good ford. Plenty of wood, water, and grass. Fine clear stream, 60 yards wide. 17 and a half miles to Branch of the Big Blue. Camp half a mile north of the road. Good wood, water, and grass. Fifteen miles to Turkey or Rock Creek. Good spring, four hundred yards to the north of the road. Store at the crossing. Good wood, water, and grass. Nineteen miles to Big Sandy. Wood, water, and grass good. Nineteen miles to Little Blue River. Road runs across the hills without water until reaching camp. Good wood, water, and grass. Eighteen and three-quarter miles on Little Blue River. Camp is at the point where the road turns off from the creek. Good camps may be found anywhere on the Little Blue with excellent wood, water, and grass. Fine running stream. Fifteen miles on Little Blue River. Road strikes the creek again and keeps it to the camp. Good wood, water, and grass. Nineteen miles to Elm Creek. Road leaves the Little Blue and runs along a divide to the head of Elm Creek, where we found water in holes with some few trees. Grass good. Twenty miles to Platte River. Road crosses one small branch where there is water except in a dry season. Good camp on the Platte with wood, water, and grass. 15 miles to Fort Kearney. Good camp about 2 miles from the fort upon the Platte, either above or below. Grass, wood, and water abundant. 17 miles on Platte River. Road runs along the river where there is plenty of grass and occasionally a few cottonwood trees. Here the buffalo generally begin to be seen, and the traveler can always get plenty of buffalo chips along this section. 16 and 3 quarter miles on Plum Creek. Road runs along the Platte to Plum Creek where there is a little wood, with good grass and water. Mail station at the crossing of Plum Creek. Twenty-two and a third miles on Platte River. Road runs along the Platte bottom after crossing Plum Creek and is good except in wet weather. The road occasionally comes near the Platte, and although the timber becomes thin, 
yet places are found where fuel can be obtained. Grass is plenty at all points. 23 miles on Platte River. Road continues along the river valley over a flat country where the water stands in ponds and is boggy in wet weather. Camps occasionally on the river, but little fuel. Grass and water good. 14 miles on Platte River. Road continues along the valley with the same character as before, but more timber. Camp opposite Brady's Island. Plenty of wood, water, and grass. 17 and a quarter miles to Slough. On the prairie. Road runs from one to three miles from the river. No wood all day. Plenty of grass and buffalo chips for cooking. 15 and a quarter miles on Platte River. Road crosses O'Fallon's Bluffs, where there is a good camping place on the right of the road. Plenty of wood, water, and grass on a small stream, which is part of the Platte. Mail station here. Sixteen and a half miles to South Platte River. Road runs along the Platte with no timber. Good grass and water at any point with buffalo chips for fuel. Seventeen miles on South Platte River. No timber all day. Good wood and grass at all points with buffalo chips. Eight miles to South Platte Crossing. No wood all day. Good water and grass with buffalo chips. The river is about 600 yards wide, rapid with quicksand bottom, but can be forded when not above a medium stage. It is best to send a footman ahead to ascertain the depth of water before crossing the wagons and animals. 19 miles to Ash Hollow at North Platte River. Road leaves the south fork of the Platte and strikes over the high prairie for 16 miles, when it descends the high bluffs bordering the valley of the North Platte and enters Ash Hollow, where there is plenty of wood and a small spring of water. Half a mile beyond this, the road reaches the river mail station and a small grocery here sixteen and three-quarter miles on north platte very sandy road no wood grass and water plenty at all points buffalo chips sufficient for cooking seventeen miles on north platte road sandy in places no wood good grass and water some buffalo chips sixteen and a half miles on north platte road good no wood good grass and water cattle chips in places eighteen and three-quarter miles on north platte no wood camp opposite chimney rock which is a very peculiar formation on the south of the road and resembles a chimney grass good road muddy after rains seventeen and a half miles on north platte no wood grass and water good sixteen miles to horse creek branch of the north platte in seven miles the road passes through scott's bluffs where there is generally water in the first ravine about two hundred yards below the road the road then descends the mountain at the foot of which is the platte and a mail station a little wood can be obtained at Scott's Bluffs. There is none in Horse Creek. Fourteen and a quarter miles on North Platte. Road follows the river bottom all day. Wood, water, and grass on the river. Twelve miles to Fort Laramie. Road rough and rocky in places. There are wood and water plenty, and before many trains have passed, the grass is good above the fort. Mail station and post office here with a sutler's store well stocked with such articles as the traveler wants. Ten miles on North Platte. Road good but hilly in places. Camp is in the river bottom with plenty of wood, water, and grass. Hot spring two miles above here. Fourteen miles to Bitter Creek. There are two roads, both of which lead to Salt Lake. The upper or south road is best in the spring or in wet weather. I travel the lower road. Wood, water, and grass are good. Seventeen and three-quarter miles to Horseshoe Creek. Fine camp with excellent wood, water, and grass. The road here forks, one passing to the left over the hills, and the other running nearer the Platte. Twenty and a half miles on North Platte River. Good road along near the river. Good wood, water, and grass. Road crosses the river at twelve and a half miles. Twenty and a quarter miles on North Platte River. Road crosses the river again, and the camp is two miles above the mouth of Laprell Creek. Good wood, water, and grass. Nineteen miles on North Platte River. Road runs along the river and is smooth and good. The camp is two miles above the crossing of Deer Creek, where there is a blacksmith shop and store. Good grass, wood, and water. 16 miles on North Platte River. Good road with wood, water, and grass at camp. 13 miles on North Platte River. Good road passing the bridge where there is a blacksmith shop and store, also a military station and a mail station. At 2 miles from camp, the road crosses the river on a good ford with rocky bottom. The wood, water, and grass are abundant. 23 miles to Red Buttes on the North Platte. Road is very hilly and in some places sandy. Passes Willow Spring where there is grass and a little wood. Good wood, water, and grass at camp mail station here eleven miles to sweetwater creek road leaves the river at the red buttes and strikes over the high rolling prairie good grass and water but little wood at camp fifteen miles on sweetwater creek road passes a blacksmith shop and a store at the bridge six miles from camp and at two and a half miles from the camp it passes the devil's gate and a mail station the sweetwater here runs between two perpendicular cliffs presenting a most singular and striking appearance take wood at the gate for camp Good grass and water at all places on Sweetwater Creek.
twenty miles on Sweetwater Creek. Road muddy after rains and some bad ravines to cross. Wood, water, and grass of the best quality at camp. Twelve miles on Sweetwater Creek. Road runs along the valley of the Sweetwater, where there is plenty of wood and grass in places, but little wood at the camp noted. Eight miles on Sweetwater. Road good, no wood, grass abundant. Twenty miles on Sweetwater. Road good, no wood. Seventeen miles on Strawberry Creek. Little wood, grass and water abundant. Road leaves Sweetwater and ascends a very long hill which is very rocky. Twenty and a quarter miles to South Pass. Road crosses the dividing ridge and strikes the Pacific Spring, where there is excellent water and good grass if many cattle have not passed, in which event the traveler had better continue on down the creek which issues from the spring. Sage for fuel. No wood. Fifteen and three-quarter miles to Dry Sandy Creek. Grass scarce. No wood. Some sage and greasewood. Water brackish but drinkable. Road good. Here the traveler should send ahead and have the best spots of grass found, as it is very scarce throughout this section. Sublet's cut-off turns off here for Soda Springs and Fort Hall. Take the left for Fort Bridger and Salt Lake City. Fifteen miles to Little Sandy Creek. Grass in spots along the creek bottom and some fuel. Eighteen miles to Big Sandy Creek. Grass in detached spots on the creek and little fuel. Twenty and a half miles to Green River, Upper Ford. Grass and fuel on the river. Seven miles on Green River at the Lower Ford. Good grass and fuel below the ford. Ferry in time of high water. Mail station and grocery. Sixteen miles to Black's Fork. Good grass and fuel. Seven miles to Ham's Fork. United States Bridge, no toll. Good grass and fuel. Twelve miles to Black's Fork. Road forks at the crossing of Black's Fork, both roads leading to Fort Bridger. This itinerary is upon the left-hand road, which crosses Black's Fork two miles from Ham's Fork. Thirteen miles to Smith's Fork. Good camps along Black's Fork at any place, but the road leaves the stream for several miles. Wood water and grass at the confluence of Black's and Smith's Forks. Eighteen and a quarter miles to Fort Bridger. Good camps above and below the fort. Military post, mail station, and store. Muddy Creek. Good grass, wood, and water. Grass short after many trains have passed. It is then necessary to go up the creek to find good grass. Road passes a fine spring three miles back. Nineteen miles to Bear River. Good camps with wood, water, and grass. Good ford except in very high water. Sulphur Creek two miles back. Nineteen miles to Red Fork in Echo Canyon, two miles below Cache Cave. Good grass and fuel. Water plenty. Nineteen and a quarter miles to Weber River. Good grass, wood, and water. Mail station. United States Bridge for high water, no toll. Five and a quarter miles to Spring Branch. Good camp. Road leaves the river and takes the left into a valley. Nine miles to Bachman's Creek. Road crosses over a mountain and descends to the creek, where there is a good camp. Fourteen miles to Big Canyon Creek. Road crosses Bachman's Creek thirteen times in eight miles, then ascends the mountain along a small creek which is well wooded and good grass. Six miles to Emigration Creek. Road leaves Canyon Creek and crosses the two mountains, which are very steep and long, grass and wood before crossing the little mountain. Ten and a quarter miles to Great Salt Lake City. Forage can be purchased here, as well as most of the articles the traveler may require, at high prices. There is no camping place within two miles of the city. It is best for those who encamp with animals to cross the Jordan River, or to stop near the mouth of the canyon before entering the city. Total distance from Fort Leavenworth to Salt Lake City... 1,168 miles. End of itineraries 1 through 4. Itineraries 5 through 8 of The Prairie Traveler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Prairie Traveler by Randolph B. Marcy. Itineraries 5 through 8. Itinerary 5. From Salt Lake City to Sacramento in Benicia, California. From Salt Lake City to Hates Ranch, 18 miles. Good road and grass abundant until Bear River is crossed. 17 and a quarter miles to Ford on Weber River. Good road and grass abundant. 15 miles to Point of Mountain. Spring water warm but pure. 12 and three quarter miles to Box Elder Creek. Excellent water, grass and fuel abundant in the canyons. 23 miles to Ferry on Bear River. Four miles above the usual crossing. Excellent grass. Three-quarter mile to West Bank. Grass not good on the West Bank. Six miles to Small Spring. Cross Bear River below the mouth of the Malade. Seventeen and a half miles to Blue Springs. Water and grass scarce and of poor quality. 
twenty one and a quarter miles to deep creek heavy sage but good grass on the right of the road near sink twenty and a half miles to cedar springs good grass on the hills with fine water and wood rolling country ten miles to rock creek plenty of grass to the left of the road good camping place fourteen and a half miles to raft river good camp twenty two and a half miles to goose creek mountains grass wood and water abundant rough and mountainous country road from fort bridger comes in here via soda springs thirteen and three quarter miles on goose creek rough broken country with a good road which runs along the creek for several miles twenty eight and a half miles to head of one thousand spring valley road runs over a rolling barren section with but little water except on the river far to the right twenty five and three quarter miles to thousand spring valley meadow grass good fuel scarce camps can be found at short intervals along the road fourteen miles to head of humboldt river fine camping places and road generally good running over rolling country twenty three miles to slough of the humboldt extensive bottoms of good grass twenty miles humboldt river along the entire course of the humboldt good grass is found in the bottoms the road which follows the bottom is hard and smooth but cannot be travelled in seasons of very high water as the bottom overflows it is then necessary to take the road on the bluffs where the grass is scarce the river when not above a fording stage can be forded at almost any point and good camps can be found at short intervals there are spots along the river bottom where alkaline ponds are frequent these are poisonous to cattle and should be avoided by travellers it is well along this river not to allow animals to drink any water except from the river where it is running twenty miles humboldt river the foregoing remarks apply for every camp on the humboldt river twenty two miles on humboldt river good camps along the humboldt valley twenty three miles humboldt river thirteen and a half miles humboldt river sixteen and a half miles humboldt river twenty five miles humboldt river thirteen and three quarter miles humboldt river twenty four miles humboldt river twenty four and a half miles humboldt river twenty and a quarter miles humboldt river eighteen and three quarter miles humboldt river thirteen and a half miles humboldt river eighteen and a quarter miles lawson's meadow the road here forks the left going by the carson valley and sacramento route and the right via goose clear and rhett lakes applegate's pass of the cascade mountains into rogue river valley fort law oregon territory eureka fort jones fort redding and sacramento river thirty three and a half miles on humboldt river grass and water poor all the distance to the sink of the humboldt nineteen and a half miles to sink of the humboldt river the water at the sink is strongly impregnated with alkali the road generally is good travellers should not allow their stock to drink too freely of this water twenty six miles to head sink of humboldt road good forty five miles to carson river road crosses the desert where there is no water for stock but there is a well where travellers can purchase water for drinking this part of the road should be travelled in the cool of the day and at night grass good also the water two miles to carson river good bunch of grass near the road thirty miles on carson river twenty six miles of desert poor grass fourteen miles to eagle ranch good grass and water thirteen miles to reese's ranch good grass and water twelve miles to williams ranch very good water and grass fifteen miles to hope valley rough road and rocky three miles near sierra good camp with water and grass seven miles to first summit road rough and rocky good water grass scarce two miles to second summit road mountainous and very steep snow nearly all the year ten miles to lakes good camp twelve miles to leak springs good grass near the road ten miles to traders creek grass and fuel scarce twelve miles to sly park grass and fuel near the road forty mile house water plenty grass scarce sacramento valley water plenty purchase forage sacramento city water plenty purchase forage total distance from salt lake city to benicia nine hundred and seventy three miles at the big meadows twenty three miles from the sink of the humboldt travellers should make a halt of a day or two to rest and recruit their animals and to cut grass for crossing the desert as this is the last good camping place until reaching carson river the ground near this place is boggy and animals should be watered with buckets the camping ground here is on the right bank of the river and about half a mile to the left of the main road the water is in a slough near its head where will be found some springs which run off a short distance but soon sink the road across the desert is very sandy especially towards the western extremity twenty miles from the sink of the humboldt there are four wells about half a mile east of the mail station the road leading to the wells turns to the right where water can be purchased from one to two shillings for each man and beast 
at nine and a half miles beyond the mail station on the desert a road turns off from the main trace toward a very high sandy ridge and directly upon the top of this ridge is the crater of an extinct volcano at the bottom of which is a salt lake upon the extreme north of this lake will be found a large spring of fresh water sufficient for one thousand animals from thence to ragtown on carson river is three miles i would advise travellers when their animals become exhausted before reaching this water to take them out of harness and drive them to this place to recruit there is some grass around the lake this desert has always been the most difficult part of the journey to california and more animals have probably been lost here than at any other place the parts of wagons that are continually met with here shows this most incontestably itinerary six from great salt lake city to los angeles and san francisco california salt lake city to willow creek twenty and five eighth miles good grass fourteen miles to american creek good grass eleven and a half miles to provo city town seven and a quarter mile to hobble creek good camp six mile to spanish fork good camp five miles to petite meat good camp twenty five miles to salt creek several small streams between good camp eighteen and five eighth miles to tula creek ford no wood grass good six and a quarter miles to severe river road is sandy passing over a high ridge good camp twenty five and a half miles to cedar creek road rather mountainous and sandy good grass and wood seven and a half miles to creek this is the fourth stream south of severe river road crosses two streams good camp three and five eighth miles to willow flats the water sinks a little east of the road twenty five miles to spring good grass and water twenty two and a quarter miles to sage creek grass poor wood and water five and one-eighth miles to beaver creek good wood water and grass twenty seven and a quarter miles to north canyon creek in little salt lake valley good grass no wood the road is rough and steep for six miles five and three-eighth miles to creek good wood water and grass six and three-quarter miles to creek good wood water and grass twelve and seven-eighth miles to cottonwood creek good grass and water nine miles to cedar springs good camp twenty-three miles to pint creek good grass one mile up the canyon nine miles to road springs road is rough good camp sixteen miles to santa clara road descending and rough poor grass from this point to cahoon pass look out for indians seventeen and an eighth miles to camp springs two miles before reaching the springs the road leaves the santa clara good grass twenty two and an eighth mile to rio virgin road crosses over the summit of a mountain good road grass poor thirty nine and five eighths miles on rio virgin road runs down the rio virgin crossing it ten times grass good down the river nineteen and five eighths miles to muddy creek road for half a mile is very steep and sandy good camp fifty two and five eighth miles to las vegas water is sometimes found two and a half miles west of the road in holes twenty three miles from the muddy and some grass about a mile from the road good camp five miles on vegas road runs up the river good grass seventeen miles to cottonwood spring poor grass twenty nine and three quarter miles to cottonwood grove no grass water and grass can be found four miles west by following the old spanish trail to a ravine and thence to the left in the ravine one mile twenty one and three quarter miles to resting springs good grass and water animals should be rested here before entering the desert seven miles to spring the spring is on the left of the road and flows into salteratus creek animals must not be allowed to drink the salteratus water fourteen and an eighth miles to salt springs poor grass and no fresh water thirty eight and three quarter miles to bitter springs good road poor grass thirty and three quarter miles to mojave river good road and good grass fifty one and a half miles on the mojave last ford good grass all the way up the mojave seventeen miles to cahoon pass at the summit ten miles to camp road bad down the canyon eleven and a half miles to coco mongo ranch ten miles to del chino ranch williams nineteen and three-eighths miles to san gabriel river six miles to san gabriel mission eight and a quarter miles to pueblo de los angeles sixty-five and three-quarter miles on the santa clara river on the coast route good camps to san jose seven and a half miles to buenaventura mission and river road here strikes the pacific shore twenty six miles to santa barbara town forty five and three quarter miles to san Ynez river at the mission seventy eight and seven eighths miles to santa margareta old mission twenty eight and three eighths miles to san miguel old mission twenty four and three quarter miles to san antonio river 
26 and 3 quarter mile to Rio del Monterey. 15 and 5 eighth miles to Solida Mission at the fort of Rio del Monterey. 37 and a half miles to San Juan Mission. 33 miles to San Jose Pueblo. 75 miles to San Francisco. Itinerary 7. From Fort Bridger to the City of Rocks. From Captain Hancock's Journal. Fort Bridger to Little Muddy Creek. 9 miles. Water brackish in pools along the creek. Tall bunch grass. Sage for fuel. Road runs over a barren section. Is rough and passes one steep hill. 12 and a third miles to Big Muddy Creek. The road, with the exception of two or three bad gullies, is good for ten miles. Then it follows the big muddy bottom, which is flat and boggy. The camp is three miles above the crossing. Some grass, sage for fuel. Fourteen and a fifth miles to small branch of the muddy creek. Cross the river in three miles at a bad ford. A mile above camp the grass is good. Road generally good. Nineteen and a half miles on small creek. Road continues up the muddy nine and a half miles to its head. It then ascends to the divide between Bear and Green Rivers, probably 800 feet. The descent on the other side is about the same. The road passes many fine springs. At one and two miles back, it passes points of hills, where it is very rough. Good grass and sage at camp. Eight and nine-tenths miles to the Bear River. Bad creek to cross near the camp. Thence to the Bear River Valley, the road is good. It then follows down a river, crossing Willow Creek. Good camp with a large fine spring. 17 miles on Bear River. Good road along the river. Plenty of wood, water, and grass at all points. Foot of Grant's Mountain. Road runs along the Bear River. At two and a half miles strikes Smith's Fork, a rapid trout stream. The road crosses the lower ford. A few miles farther on is a bad slough, which can be avoided by taking a round on the hills. Cross Thomas's Fork on a bridge, also a slough near it. Toll two dollars for each team and wagon. The road then leaves Bear River Valley and turns over a very steep hill good grass wood and water twelve miles on bear river road ascends grants mountain twelve hundred feet in one and a half miles double teams then descends again into bear river valley at four and four fifths miles good wood water and grass seventeen and two fifths miles to indian creek road crosses eight fine spring branches camp is on a beautiful trout stream good wood water and grass eleven miles to spring near bear river road is hilly crossing two spring branches good wood water and grass the camp is on the left and near the road eleven miles on bear river at six and seven tenth miles the road strikes a large group of springs called soda springs and here crosses pine creek on the left bank of which is a saleratus lake soon after it strikes the main springs and after crossing another creek the steamboat spring may be seen in the bed of the river fifteen miles to portnuff or rock creek at two and three tenth miles the road leaves bear river near where it runs through a canyon with high bluffs on each side at this point the california and fort hall roads separate the california road called hudspeth's cut-off then crosses a valley between the bear river and port nuff river mountains nine miles no water from camp to camp good camp fifteen miles to marsh creek about two miles above the main road the creek can be forded a road leads to it from the descent into the valley road good water and grass plenty no wood sixteen and a fifth miles to Pontac creek first part of the road is hilly the remainder good good camp seven and a fifth mile to malad river at seven and a fifth miles the road crosses the malad river good camp a hundred and forty miles from salt lake city good road twenty two and three tenths miles to small creek the road ascends a ridge through a canyon and descends to a valley on the other side from the camp to the summit of the ridge is six and a fifth miles the descent is three and seven tenths miles it then crosses a valley eight miles wide and strikes a canyon which leads to the top of a hill over a rough wood plenty of wood water and grass at camp but no water between this and the last camp nine and three-fifths miles to small creek road after five miles strikes a canyon with a long but gentle ascent two miles from the entrance of this canyon is a spring branch there is wood and some grass and water at this place eleven and a fifth miles on spring branch the road passes through a canyon and at five miles strikes the head of a spring branch which it follows down two and a half miles to the junction with a larger branch which is bridged at nine-tenths of a mile another fork enters grass is very fine here road follows down this across the main branch and the camp is two miles below good camp eighteen and a half miles to decasur creek or raft river road continues down the creek two and three-tenths miles and crosses then ascends by a steep hill to an elevated sage plain leaving the creek at eleven and four-fifth miles and passes a slough with water good camp seventeen and nine-tenths miles to spring branch 
The road crosses the creek near the last camp and follows up a valley, crossing in five miles several spring branches. At two and nine-tenths miles, it crosses the creek again and follows up the valley two miles farther, then crosses a high sage plain eight and nine-tenths miles long, when it strikes a spring one hundred and fifty yards to the left of the road, where there is an excellent camp in a beautiful valley. Ten miles to junction of Salt Lake City Road. Road passes several small branches in three miles, then commences ascending through a canyon, which in two and a fifth miles leads to the entrance to the city of rocks and passes through these for three miles it then crosses a ridge leaving the city of rocks and at ten miles from the last camp intersects the road from salt lake city at one and two fifth miles beyond this a road leads off to the right to a spring branch three miles where there is a good camp near the foot of goose creek mountain from this point california travelers can refer to the itinerary of the route from salt lake city to sacramento itinerary eight from Soda Springs to the City of Rocks, known as Hudspeth's Cutoff. From Soda Springs to Bear River, 20 miles. The road runs down Bear River, crossing some small streams. Good camp. 10 miles to Portner Creek. Camp at the head of the creek. Good wood, water, and grass. 12 miles to Fork of Portner Creek. Good camp. 15 miles to Powak Creek. Road crosses a summit. Good road and camp. 12 miles to Snake Spring. Good camp. 12 miles to Uta Spring. Good camp. 15 miles to Decashur Creek. Road crosses a small stream. Rather bad crossing. Good camp. 18 miles to City of Rocks. Junction of Salt Lake Road. Good camp. End of itineraries 5 through 8. Itineraries 9 to 12 of the Prairie Traveler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Prairie Traveler by Randolph B. Marcy. Itinerary 9. Sublet's Cut-Off from the Junction of the Salt Lake and Fort Hall Roads. Junction to Big Sandy, 7 miles. 44 miles to Green River. From the Big Sandy to Green River, Upper Road, there is an abundance of grass in places along the road, but no water. 6 miles to Small Creek. The road runs up the creek. Good grass. 4 miles on the creek. Good grass and water. 12 miles to Small Spring. The spring is on the left of the road. Good grass. Nine miles to Ham's Fork. Good wood, water, and grass. Six miles to Spring. On the summit of a mountain. Good grass. Six miles to Muddy Creek. Wood, water, and grass. Ten miles to Spring. In Bear River Valley. Good wood, water, and grass. Six miles to Smith's Fork. In Bear River Valley. Good water, wood, and grass. Ten miles to Tomouse Fork. Road runs down Bear River. Good wood, water, and grass. Seven miles to Spring Creek. Wood, water, and grass. Seven miles to Smith's Ford. Road crosses over a spur of the mountain. Long and gradual ascent. Descent rather abrupt. Good water, wood, and grass. Eight miles to Tellex Fork. Road runs down Bear River. Good camp. Four miles to Small Creek. Good camp. Four miles to Small Creek. Good camp. Seven miles to Small Creek. Good camp. 12 miles to Soda Springs. Left side of the road among some cedars is a good camp. Here, take the left-hand road to California. Called Hudspeth's Cut-Off. Itinerary 10. From Lawson's Meadows on the Humboldt River to Fort Redding via Rogue River Valley. Fort Lane, Oregon Territory, Eureka, and Fort Jones. Lawson's Meadow to Mountain Springs, 18 and a half miles. Road leaves the Humboldt and takes a northwesterly course 12 miles to a spring of good water, good bunch grass to the left of the road, and a small spring at the camp. The road is plain on leaving the river, but after a few days it becomes faint. Road from this point passes over a desert country for about 60 miles without good water or much grass. 38 and a half miles to Black Rock Spring. Road level and hard with little vegetation. In 14 miles pass springs, but the water is not good. In 16 miles, the road passes a slough, which is difficult to cross. Water not good, but can be given to cattle in small quantities. In 5 miles from this, the road passes Black Rock, mentioned by Colonel Fremont in his trip from Columbia River in 1843-44. 3 miles farther, pass Boiling Springs, very hot, but good cooled. Grass pretty good. 20 and a quarter miles to Mountain Rill. Water good, bunch grass in the vicinity. In eight miles travel, the road passes a beautiful creek of pure water with good grass. Five and three-quarter miles to Lake, Marshy. Ten and a half miles to High Rock Canyon. This canyon is twenty-five miles long with wild and curious scenery. Road crosses the creek frequently, and the mud is bad. 
In the autumn, the road is good. 14 and three quarter miles up High Rock Canyon. Small creek. Beautiful country with the greatest abundance of water and grass. Also fuel. 25 and a quarter miles to Pine Grove Creek. Road passes over an interesting country, well supplied with wood, water, and grass, and passes around the south end of a salt lake. Eighteen and a half miles to west slope of Sierra. Road passes over the mountain, which is steep but not rocky, then descends to a small creek of good water, which runs into Goose Lake. Good grass and fuel. Look out for the Indians, as they are warlike and treacherous here. Seven and three quarter miles to the east shore of Goose Lake. Excellent camp. Sixteen and a quarter miles to the west shore of Goose Lake. This is a beautiful sheet of fresh water. Great quantities of waterfowl resort to this lake. Sixteen and a quarter miles to Slough Springs. The road passes over a very rocky divide, covered with loose volcanic debris, very hard for animals, and wearing to their feet. They should be well shod before attempting the passage. Eighteen and a half miles to Marshy Lake. Road difficult for wagons. Fifteen miles to Clear Lake. Beautiful lake of pure water, with good grass around its shore. Twenty-five and a quarter miles to east shore of Rhett's Lake. Road tolerable over a rolling, rocky country, between lakes. The road crosses Lost River over a natural bridge, on a solid, smooth ledge of rock. Nineteen miles to west shore of Rhett's Lake. Plenty of wood, water, and grass along this road. Twenty-one miles to Klamath River. Road leaves Rhett's Lake and enters the forest and mountains. Tolerably good. Good camp. Fifteen and a quarter miles to Cascade Mountains. The road passes over high mountains through lofty pines. Camp is at Summit Meadows. Good water and grass, also fuel. Fourteen and a quarter miles, western slope of Cascade Mountains. Rough roads. Nineteen and a quarter miles, Rogue River Valley. Road descends into this settlement in six miles, where there is a lovely fertile valley, well settled with farmers. Twenty-three and three quarter miles to Fort Lane. Near Table Rock on Rogue River, eight miles from Jacksonville. Dragoon Post. Twenty-two and three quarter miles to Rogue River Valley. Good camp. Eighteen miles to Siskiyou Mountains. Road crosses the Siskiyou Mountains and is difficult for wagons. Eighteen miles to Eureka, flourishing mining city. Eighteen miles to Fort Jones, infantry post in Scotts Valley. Twenty miles to Scotts Mountain. Good camp at the foot of the mountain. Road passes over the mountains, but is impassable for wagons. Ninety miles to Shasta City. Good grass, wood, and water. 180 miles to Sacramento City. Itinerary 11. From Soda Springs to Fort Walla Walla and Oregon City, Oregon, via Fort Hall. Soda Springs to Portner Creek, 25 miles. Good camp. Take the right-hand road. 10 miles to Ross's Creek. Good camp. 10 miles to Fort Hall Valley. Good camp. Road runs down the creek. 8 miles to Snake River. Good camp. Road crosses the river bottom. 5 miles to Fort Hall. 15 miles to Small Branch. Camp is 3 miles below the crossing of Portnuff River, which is fordable. Good wood, water, and grass. 10 miles to American Falls. Good camp. 13 miles to Raft River. Road rough and rocky. Sage for fuel. Grass scarce. 17 miles to Bend of Swamp Creek. Grass scarce. 20 miles on Snake River. Road crosses Swamp and Goose Creeks. Wood on the hills. Grass short. 25 miles to Rock Creek. Road crosses one small creek and is very rough and rocky for several miles when it enters a sandy region where the grass is scarce, sage plenty, and willows on the creek. 24 miles to Snake River. Road crosses several small branches. There is but little grass except in narrow patches along the river bottom. 26 miles to Fishing Falls. Road very crooked and rough, crossing two small streams. 29 miles to Snake River. Road crosses several small creeks, but leaves the main river to the north, and runs upon an elevated plateau. Good grass at camp. 26 miles to Snake River Ford. Road tortuous. Ford good in low water. 19 miles to Small Branch. Road crosses Snake River and follows up a small branch, leaving the river to the left. Good grass. Road ascends to a high plateau, which it keeps during the whole distance. 26 miles to River. O Rocher. Road passes hot springs and is rough. Wood, water, and grass plenty. 22 miles to Small Creek. Road crosses two small branches and is very rocky, but at camp grass, wood, and water are abundant. 23 miles to Rio Boise. Road crosses one small creek and follows along the Boise River. Good wood, water, and grass. 
26 miles to Fort Boise. Road follows the south bank of Boise River to the fort. 2 miles to Fort Boise. Road crosses Boise River. Good ford at ordinary stages. Grass good in the river bottom. 20 miles to River, O. Matthews. Good road. Grass abundant, but coarse. Wood and water plenty. 27 miles to Snake River. Road passes over a rough country. Grass scarce and of a poor quality. 20 miles to Burnt River. Road leaves Snake River and takes across Burnt River, following up the north side of this to the camp. It is mountainous and rough, but the grass is good, and there is wood along the river. 22 miles Burnt River. Road continues up the river and is still rough and mountainous. Grass and wood plenty. 26 miles to Small Branch. Road passes over a divide to Powder River. It is still rough, but getting better. The grass is good. 13 miles to Powder River. Good road, grass plenty. 21 miles to Creek. Road passes a divide, crossing several small streams, and is smooth with plenty of grass and fuel. 20 miles to Creek. Road crosses one small branch and is rather rough. The grass and fuel are good and abundant. 21 miles to Creek. Road follows down the creek for 10 miles, then turns up a small branch and is good. There is plenty of grass and fuel. 12 miles to Branch. Road crosses a divide and strikes another branch. 5 miles to small branch of the Umatilla River. Good road with plenty of wood and grass. 16 miles to branch of Walla Walla River. Wood, water, and grass. 18 miles to Walla Walla River. Wood, water, and grass. Columbia River at Fort Walla Walla. Wood, water, and grass. 10 miles to Butler Creek. Good camp. 18 miles to Wells Spring. Good camp. 12 miles to Willow Creek. Good camp. 13 miles to Cedar Spring. Good camp. 6 miles to John Day's River. Good camp. 5 miles to Forks of Road. No camping. Left-hand road for wagons and right-hand for pack trains. This itinerary takes the left. 10 miles to Uli's Camp. Good camp. 19 miles to Soots River. Good camp. 6 miles to Fall River. Good camp. 10 miles to Utah's River. Good camp. 18 miles to Soots River. Good camp. 6 miles on Soots River. Good camp. Road follows up the river, crossing it several times. 16 miles to Sand River Fork. Good grass a mile and a half to the left of the road. 8 miles to Good Camp. 15 miles to Royal Hill Camp. Good camp. 7 miles to Sandy River. But little grass. 45 miles down the river. Good camps all the distance. 25 miles to Oregon City. Good camps all the distance. 75 miles to Salem. Good camps all the distance. Itinerary 12. Route for pack trains from John Day's River to Oregon City. John Day's River to Columbia River, 17 miles. From John Day's River to the forks of the road and thence by the right-hand fork to the Columbia. Good camp. Two and a half miles to Scotts River Ferry. Good camp. 15 miles to Dawes. Good camp. 25 miles to Dog River. Good camp. 15 miles to Cascade Mountains. One bad place. 9 miles to Uli's Rock. Good camp. 20 miles to Image Plain Ferry. Good camp. 15 miles to Portland. Good camp. 12 miles to Oregon City. Good camp. End of itineraries 9 to 12. Itineraries 13 through 16 of A Prairie Traveler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Prairie Traveler by Randolph B. Marcy. Itinerary 13. From Indianola and Powderhorn to San Antonio, Texas. Four miles from Powderhorn to Indianola, Texas. Steamers run from New Orleans five times a week to Powderhorn. Fourteen miles to Chocolate Creek. Good grass and water. Fuel scarce. Road passes over a low, flat country, which in wet weather is heavy and muddy. Twelve miles to Grove. Grove of oak. Good water and grass. The road passes over a hog wallow prairie, which is very muddy and almost impassable for loaded teams after rains. The grass is abundant everywhere in this section. Twelve and a half miles to Victoria. The road is good, passing along near the east bank of the Guadalupe River. The country is thickly settled with farmers who sell grain at reasonable rates. Grass abundant, also fuel. 34 miles to Yorktown. Road crosses the Guadalupe River on a bridge. Toll one dollar for a six-mule team. It then crosses a low bottom for three miles. From thence the road is good over a rolling country, with plenty of wood, water, and grass. 33 miles to Cibello River. 
Good road, wood, water, and grass plenty. 35 miles to San Antonio. Good road with plenty of wood, water, and grass along the road. The Sabella is fordable at ordinary stages. The traveler can procure anything he may need at Victoria and at San Antonio. Itinerary 14. Wagon road from San Antonio, Texas to El Paso, New Mexico, and Fort Yuma, California. Distances in miles and hundredths of a mile. 6.41 miles from San Antonio to Leona. 18.12 miles to Castroville. 11 miles to Hondo. 14.28 miles to Rio Seco. 12.5 miles to Sabinal. 13.46 miles to Rio Frio. 15.12 miles to Nueces. 10.27 miles to Turkey Creek. 15.33 miles to Elm Creek. All good camps with abundance of wood, water, and grass. Country mostly settled, and the road very good except in wet weather from San Antonio to Elm Creek. 7 miles to Fort Clark. Good grass, wood, and water. Road level and good. 7 miles to Piedra Pinta. Good grass, wood, and water. 8.86 miles to Mavericks Creek. Good grass, wood, and water. 12.61 miles to San Felipe. Good grass, wood, and water. 10.22 miles to Devil's River. First crossing. Good wood, water, and grass. 18.27 miles to California Springs. Grass and water poor. 18.39 miles to Devil's River. Second crossing. Grass poor. 19.5 miles on Devil's River. Good camp. The only water between Devil's River and Live Oak Creek is at Howard Springs. The road is very rough in places. 44 miles to Howard Springs. Grass scarce, water plenty in winter, wood plenty. 30.44 miles to Live Oak Creek. Good water and grass. The road passes within one and a half miles of Fort Lancaster. 7.29 miles to Crossing of Pecos River. Bad water and bad camp. The water of the Pecos can be used. 5.47 miles to Las Moras. Good wood, water, and grass. The road is rough on the Pecos. 32.85 miles to camp on the Pecos River. Wood and grass scarce. 16.26 miles to Escondido Creek. At the crossing, water good, little grass or wood. 8.76 miles on Escondido Creek. Grass and water good, little grass. 19.4 miles to Comanche Creek. Grass and water good, little grass. 8.88 miles to Leon Springs. Grass and water good, no wood. 33.86 miles to Barella Spring. Grass and water good, wood plenty. 28 miles to Fort Davis. Good camp. From Fort Davis to Eagle Springs there is an ascent, and one of the very best of roads. 18.42 miles to Barrel Springs. Water good. Grass and wood fair. 13.58 miles to Dead Man's Hole. Good wood and water. Grass scarce. 32.83 miles to Van Horn's Wells. No grass or wood, but they will be found two miles back. 19.74 miles to Eagle Springs. Grass and wood poor. Water about half a mile from camp in a narrow canyon. 32.03 miles to mouth of Canyon de los Caminos. The road is rather rough. From here to Fort Bliss, opposite El Paso, the road runs near the river, and camps may be made anywhere. The wood, water, and grass are good at all points. 61.13 miles to San Elusario, Mexican town. 9.25 miles to Socorro, Mexican town. 15 miles to Fort Bliss at El Paso, United States Military Post, and Mexican town. Total distance from San Antonio to El Paso, 654.27 miles. 22 miles from El Paso to Cottonwood. From El Paso to Mesilla Valley in the Gadsden Purchase, the road runs up the east bank of the Rio Grande to Fort Fillmore, New Mexico, where it crosses the river into the Mesilla Valley. 22 miles to Fort Fillmore. 6 miles to La Mesilla. 65 miles to Cook Spring. From Mesilla Valley to Tucson, the road is remarkably good with good grass and water. The streams on this section are the Mimbres and San Pedro, both fordable and crossed with little trouble. The Apache Indians are generally met with in this country. There is a flouring mill two miles below El Paso, where flour can be purchased at very reasonable prices. 18 miles to Rio Mimbres. 17 miles to Ojo La Vaca. 10 miles to Ojo de Inez. 34 miles to Peloncia. 18 miles to San Domingo. 23 miles to Apache Springs. 9 miles to Cabeza Springs. 26 miles to Dragon Springs. 18 miles to Cuercos Canyon. Bunch grass will be found sufficient for traveling purposes along this section of the road between El Paso and Tucson. 6 miles to San Pedro Crossing. 20 miles to Cienega. 
thirteen miles to Cienega Creek, twenty miles to Mission of San Navier, eight miles to Tucson, total distance from El Paso to Tucson, three hundred and five miles, five miles to Pico Chico Mountain, thirty-five miles to first camp on Gila River, twenty-nine miles to Maricopa Wells, the Maricopa Wells are at the western extremity of a fertile valley occupied by Pincos Indians, who cultivate corn and other grain. Forty miles to Tesotal, across Jornada. There is but little grass here, but in the season the mesquite leaves are a good substitute. Ten miles to Ten Mile Camp. Fifteen miles to Oatman's Flat, first crossing of the Gila River. Twenty-five miles to second crossing of the Gila. The traveler can generally find sufficient grass in the hills along the valley of the Gila. 32 miles to Peterman's Station, 20 miles to Antelope Peak, 24 miles to Little Corral, 16 miles to Fort Yuma. The distance from El Paso to Fort Yuma is 644 miles. Itinerary 15, from Fort Yuma to San Diego, California. Distances in miles and hundredths of a mile. 10 miles from Fort Yuma to Los Algodones, along the Colorado. 10 miles to Cook's Wells. Here commences the Great Desert. Water nowhere good or reliable, until arriving at Cariso Creek. The points named are where deep wells have been dug. New River, though usually set down, is a dry arroyo. The surface of the desert for seven miles on the eastern side is drifting sand and heavy for wagons. Then comes a section in the center of the desert that is hard and level. On the west side there is about three miles of a mud flat. 21.9 miles to Alamo Rancho. 16.4 miles to Little Laguna. 4.5 miles to New River, 5.8 miles to Big Laguna, 26.4 miles to Cariso Creek. Water good, cane and brush for fuel, and they afford some forage for the animals. No grass. 16.6 .6 miles to Vallecito. Grass poor, wood and water sufficient. 17.8 miles to San Felipe. Grass poor, wood scarce, water good. 15.8 miles to Warner's Ranch. The road passes through a beautiful oak grove where there is an abundance of grass and water. This is the summit of the mountain. At the ranch, the grass is poor and no wood. The water is good. The oak grove terminates six miles from Warner's. 10.3 miles to Santa Isabel. Good grass, wood, and water. This was an old Spanish mission, but is now occupied by some Americans and Indians. 11.4 miles to Laguna. Two miles from last camp is a good camping place. The road passes over some steep hills, not high. This is the best camp on the road. 12 miles to San Pascal. For the first nine miles, the road is level and good to the top of the mountain, where there is a good camping place with wood, water, and grass. Thence the road descends a very steep hill. The camp is on the east side of the brook near Soto's house. 18.8 .8 miles to Parasquitas. The road passes a good camp three miles from San Pascual. Wood, water, and grass at Parasquitas. 8 miles to Fisher's house. The road passes over several miles, and at four miles is a good camping place wood, water, and grass at camp. San Diego, California. When animals are to be kept a considerable time at San Diego, they should be taken four or five miles up the river, as the grass is poor near the town. Total distance from Fort Yuma to San Diego, 217 miles. Itinerary 16. From El Paso, New Mexico to Fort Yuma, California, via Santa Cruz. 26.1 miles from El Paso to Samalayuca. Spring with grass and wood. 38 miles to Salado. Bad water with little grass and wood. 24.7 miles to Santa Maria. Good grass, wood, and water. 27.5 miles to Mines of San Pedro. Bad water, little grass or wood. 19.2 miles to Corelitos. Good water, grass, and wood. 20 miles to Juanos. Good water, grass, and wood. 12 miles to Pelatudo. Good water, grass, and wood. 30 miles to San Francisco, water half a mile south of the road. 18 miles to San Luis, good water, grass, and wood. 35 miles to San Bernardino, good water, grass, and wood. 30 miles to Ash Creek, grass, wood, and water. 37 miles to Head of San Pedro, grass, and water. 24 miles to Santa Cruz, good grass, wood, and water. 31 miles to Cocospe, much grass, 10 or 12 miles without water. Leave Santa Cruz River at Old Rancho San Lazaro. No water till reaching the head of San Ignacio, except at nine miles, a spring one mile west of the road. Twenty-six miles to Amores. From Cocospe to Santa Ana, follow down the San Ignacio, and in many places there is wood and grass. Grass is much better at three miles from the river. At the foot of the hills there is an abundance of grama grass. 
Five miles to Terranati. Four miles to San Ignacio. 5.2 to Medina. 5.2 to San Lorenzo. 2.6 to Santa Marta. 5.2 to Santa Ana. 26 miles to Alameda. Plenty of grass. Leave the river 10 or 12 miles from Santa Ana, and no water thence to Alameda, which is a small rancho. 31.2 miles to Altar. No water, grass abundant. 13 miles to Laguna. Small water hole, grass scanty and poor. 52 miles to Sonia. Sometimes water is found 25 miles from the Laguna, south of the road. There is a well at Sonia in the town, and sometimes water in a hole 300 yards south of the town, 100 yards west of the road. 10.4 miles to El Paso. Well at El Paso, supplying 100 animals. Water muddy and brackish, grass poor. 52 miles to Sonorita. No water on the road. At Sonorita are several brackish springs. Grass poor, bad camping place. Saltpeter at the springs. Quita o Aquita. No water on the road. Saline spring at camp. Better than at Sonorita, but the grass is not so good. 10.4 miles to Agua Salado. Water uncertain. Grass poor. 23.4 miles to Los Pleyes. Water only in the rainy season. One mile west of the road, hidden by bushes and difficult to find. Grass pretty good. 28.6 miles to Cabeza Prieta. Natural Tenajas in a ravine two miles from the road. Follow a wagon track up this ravine between a black and a red mountain. The water is good and abundant. Grass tolerable. 31 miles to Poso. No water on the road until reaching Poso. Here it is abundant on the east side of the road. Grass good one mile west. 13 miles to Rio Gila but little good grass. 26 miles to Fort Yuma, at the crossing of the Colorado River, but little good grass for several miles. Total distance from El Paso to Fort Yuma, 756 miles. End of itineraries 13 through 16. Itineraries 17 through 20 of the Prairie Traveler this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Prairie Traveler by Randolph B. Marcy. Itineraries 17 through 20. 17. From Westport, Missouri, to the gold diggings at Pikes Peak and Cherry Creek Northwest Territory, via the Arkansas River. Three and three quarters miles from Westport to Indian Creek. The road runs over a beautiful country. Indian Creek is a small wooded stream with abundance of grass and water. Eight and three quarter miles to Cedar Creek. The road passes over a fine country, and there is a good camping place at Cedar Creek. Eight and a half miles to Bull Creek. The road is smooth and level with less wood than before. Camping good. Nine and a half miles to Willow Springs. At nine miles, the road passes Black Jack Creek, where there is a good camping place. The road has but little wood upon it at first, but it increases toward the end of the march. The road is level for some distance, but becomes more rolling, and the country is covered with the finest grass. Good camp at one mile from the main road. Twenty and a quarter miles to one hundred and ten mile creek. The road traverses the same character of country as yesterday, but with less woodland, is very smooth, and at nine and twelve miles passes rock creeks, which have no running water in a dry season. Good camp. Twenty two and a half miles to Prairie Chicken Creek. At eight miles the road crosses Dwistler Creek, which is a fine little stream. Four miles farther, first Dragoon Creek, and at one mile farther, the second Dragoon Creek, both fine streams well-wooded and good camping places good camp twenty miles to big rock creek at one mile the road crosses a small wooded branch three miles beyond it crosses elm creek where a good camping place may be found at seven miles it crosses one hundred and forty two mile creek and at thirteen miles it crosses bluff creek where there is a good camping place good camp twenty miles to council grove on elm creek road passes big john spring at thirteen miles and is smooth and good a fine camp is found three-fourths of a mile beyond the grove on Elm Creek, with abundance of wood, water, and grass. Sixteen miles to Diamond Spring. At eight miles, the road crosses Elm Creek and passes over a section similar to that east of Council Grove. It is fine in dry weather, but muddy after heavy rains. Good camp at Diamond Spring. Sixteen miles to Lost Spring. One mile from camp, the road passes a wooded creek. From thence there is no more wood or permanent water until arriving at camp. Take wood here for cooking, as there is not a tree or bush in sight from Lost Spring. The country becomes more level with grass everywhere. The road is muddy in wet weather. Fifteen and three-quarter miles to Cottonwood Creek. Road continues over a prairie country, sensibly rising and improving. Wood, water, and grass at camp. 
twenty-two miles to Turkey Creek. The road is good, and at eighteen miles passes Little Turkey Creek. No wood, and the water poor at camp. Grass good. Twenty-three miles to Little Arkansas River. The road runs over a level prairie, and at three and a half miles passes Big Turkey Creek with the Arkansas River Valley in sight all day. After rains, there are frequent pools of water along the road. Good camp. Twenty miles to Big Cow Creek. The road passes for ten miles over a level prairie to Cherez Creek, which is a bushy gully, thence six miles to Little Cow Creek, which is a brushy stream, with here and there a tree. Good camp here to the left of the road, near a clump of trees. Prairie dog towns commence to be seen. Road very level. Buffalo grass here. Twenty miles to Big Bend of the Arkansas. The road at twelve miles strikes the sand hills of the Arkansas River. They are soon passed, however, and the level river bottom is reached. The river has a rapid current flowing over a quicksand bed. The road is generally good from the last camp. Wood, water, and grass at camp. Seven miles to Walnut Creek. The road is good. Cool springs at this camp. Good grass and wood. Twenty-one miles to head of Coon Creek. At five miles the road forks, one following the river, and the other a short-cut dry route to Fort Atkinson, where they unite on the river. The country rises for ten miles on the dry route, then descends to the river, and is covered with the short buffalo grass. No wood at camp. Eighteen miles to Arkansas River. The road passes over an undulating and uninteresting prairie with but little vegetation. The water in dry weather is in pools. Nineteen miles to Arkansas River at Fort Atkinson. The road runs over a similar country to that of yesterday, with no wood near. Plenty of buffalo chips for cooking, and good grass. Eighteen and three-quarter miles to Arkansas River. At four and a half miles, the road ascends a bluff covered with thick buffalo grass. On the river is heavy bottom grass. At seventeen miles, pass a ford. Grass good at camp. Nineteen and a quarter miles on Arkansas River. The road is sandy for fourteen miles, but not deep except in places. Thence to camp it is good. Good camp. Twenty-two miles on Arkansas River. Country prairie covered with short buffalo grass. Good camp. Twenty-two miles on Arkansas River. The road is fine, crossing several dry beds of creeks, along which are seen a few scattering trees. Good camp on a dry creek near the river. Twenty-four miles on Arkansas River. The road runs over a barren plain at the foot of the main plateau and crosses two dry creeks near the camp, on which are cottonwood trees. Plenty of wood at camp. Twenty-one miles on Arkansas River. The road follows the base of the hills at from one to three miles from the river. Good camp. Twenty miles on Arkansas River. At seven miles the road strikes the big timbers, where there is a large body of cottonwood. Thence for three miles the road is heavy sand. Good camps along here. Thirteen miles on Arkansas River. At one mile the road passes some old houses formerly used as a trading post. Here terminates the big timbers. Coarse grass at the camp. Fifteen miles on Arkansas River. At three miles, the road passes the mouth of Purgatoire Creek. Camp is below Bent's Ford. Good grass here. Twenty-four miles on Arkansas River. Pass Bent's Fort. The grass is excellent in the vicinity of the fort, but after this it is not so good. The road runs over a high and considerably broken country. Good camp. Eleven miles on Arkansas River. Opposite the mouth of the Apishpa Creek, good camp. The Huerfano Mountains and Spanish Peaks are in sight from the camp. The Cherokee Trail comes in from Arkansas near Bent's Fort and leads to the gold diggings at Cherry Creek. Nine miles on Arkansas River. Opposite the mouth of the Huerfano Creek. Good camp and a ford opposite Charles Audeby's house. Twelve miles on Arkansas River. At this point the Cherokee Trail bears to the right and leaves the river. The left hand, or river road, runs up to the old Pueblo at the mouth of the Fontaine Quibui Creek. The right hand road leads to the gold diggings. Fifteen and three-quarter miles to fontaine Quibui. The road strikes in a northwest course over the rolling country and comes upon the creek at a most beautiful camp where there is a great abundance of good wood, water, and grass. The wood, water, and grass are good at all points on the fontaine Quibui, and travelers can camp anywhere upon this stream. Seventeen and a half miles on the fontaine Quibui. Here the road forks, one running up the river and the other striking directly across to the divide of the Arkansas and Platte. I prefer the left-hand road, as it has more water and better grass upon it. Six and a half miles to Forks of the Fontaine Quibui. The road to Cherry Creek here leaves the Fontaine Quibui and bears to the right. There is a large Indian trail which crosses the main creek and takes a northwest course towards Pike's Peak. By going up this trail about two miles, a mineral spring will be found, which gives the stream its name of the fountain that boils. This spring, or rather these springs, as there are two, both of which boil up out of solid rock, are among the greatest natural curiosities that I have ever seen. 
The water is strongly impregnated with salts, but it is delightful to the taste, and somewhat similar to the Congress water. It will well compensate any one for the trouble of visiting it. Seventeen and a half miles to Black Squirrel Creek. This creek is near the crest of the high divide between the Arkansas and Platte rivers. It is a small running branch, but always affords good water. There is pine timber here, and the grass is good on the prairies to the east. This is a locality which is very subject to severe storms, and it was here that I encountered the most severe snowstorm that I have ever known, on the first day of May, 1858. I would advise travelers to hasten past this spot as rapidly as possible during the winter and spring months, as a storm might prove very serious here. Fourteen miles to near the head of Cherry Creek. The road crosses one small branch at four miles from Black Squirrel Creek. It then takes up to an elevated plateau, which in a rainy season is very muddy. The camp is at the first timber that is found, near the road to the left. There is plenty of wood, water, and grass here. There is also a good camping place at the small branch that is mentioned. Ten miles on Cherry Creek. There is good grass, wood, and water throughout the valley of Cherry Creek. The mountains are from five to ten miles distant, on the left or west of the road, and when I passed there was a great abundance of elk, deer, antelope, bear, and turkeys throughout this section. Seven miles on Cherry Creek. Good camp. Eleven miles on Cherry Creek. Good camp. Seventeen miles mouth of Cherry Creek at the South Platte. Good camp, and a town built up since I passed, called Denver City. Total distance from Westport to the gold diggings, 685 and one quarter miles. Itinerary 18. From St. Paul's, Minnesota to Fort Walla Walla, Oregon. 17 and a quarter miles from St. Paul's to Small Brook. The wood, water, and grass are abundant as far as the Bois de Sioux River. 20 and a quarter miles to Cow Creek. This stream is crossed on a bridge. 23 and a quarter miles to Small Lake, north of the road. The road passes over a rolling prairie and crosses Elk River on a bridge. 17 miles near Sauk Rapids. The road crosses Elk River twice on bridges, Mississippi River near. 18 miles to Russell's, ferry across the Mississippi River, then follow the Red River Trail. Camp is on a Cold Spring Brook. 6 miles on Cold Spring Brook, cross Sauk River, 300 feet wide, 4.5 feet deep. 19.5 miles to Lake Henry, road good. 18 and three quarter miles to Lightning Lake. Cross Cow River in a ferry boat, water four and a half feet deep. 17 and a half miles to Lake, one mile from Red River Trail. Pass White Bean Lake. Nine and a half miles to Pike Lake. Pass the south branch of the Chippeway River. Road runs over Rolling Prairie and crosses a small branch. 19 and a quarter miles to Small Lake. Cross Chippeway River in a boat. Road passes numerous lakes and the best grass. Nine and three quarter miles to Small Lake. Road passes rolling prairies and crosses Rabbit River. Twenty seven miles to Bois de Sioux River. Cross Bois de Sioux River rolling ground. Eleven miles to Wild Rice River. Cross Bois de Sioux River seventy feet wide and four to seven feet deep. Muddy bottom and banks. Wood, water, and grass at all camps between this and Maple River. Four and a half miles to Small Creek. Cross Wild Rice River on a bridge. Twenty-six and a half miles to Cheyenne River, smooth prairie road. Sixteen and a half miles to Maple River, cross Cheyenne River on a bridge, and several small branches. Twenty miles to Small Creek, smooth road, no wood. Twenty miles to Pond, wet and marshy, numerous ponds in sight, no wood. Fifteen miles to Pond, no wood, approaching Cheyenne River. Thirteen and a half miles to Cheyenne River, prairie more rolling, camp in the river bottom, wood, water, and grass abundant. 17 miles to Slough, cross Cheyenne River, 50 feet wide, 3.5 feet deep, no wood. 10 miles to Lake, rolling prairie with many marshes, wood, water, and grass. 10.5 miles to Pond, low wet prairie, no wood, plenty of grass and water. 18.25 miles to Marsh, smooth prairie, generally dry. 20 miles to Riviera Jacques, smooth prairie with marshes, road crosses the river several times, wood, water, and grass. Twenty-one and a half miles to Pond, hilly and marshy prairie with small ponds and no wood. Twelve miles to Small Branch, marshy prairie filled with ponds with a thin, short grass and no wood. Nineteen and three-quarter miles to Lake, on a high knoll. Road crosses the south fork of Cheyenne River, good crossing, thence rolling prairie, passing Balto de Moral, also a narrow lake four and a half miles long. Sixteen and a half miles to Pond, marshy prairie, ponds and knolls, Cross a small branch at seven and three-quarter miles. No wood. 
seventeen and three-quarter miles pond rolling prairie cross wintering river a deep muddy stream one hundred feet wide also marshy prairies and ponds no wood sixteen miles to small branch tributary of mouse river road skirts the valley of mouse river crossing the ravines near their heads fifteen and a quarter miles to pond undulating prairie with occasional marshes the road then turns up the high ridge called grand couteau no wood twenty and a quarter miles to lake hilly road approaching grand couteau no wood twenty miles to lake rolling prairie smooth good road no wood fifteen and a half miles to pond road passes grand couteau at eleven miles and runs between two lakes no wood but plenty of bois de vache for fuel nineteen and a quarter miles to branch of white earth river country rolling and hilly road passes wood at eight miles from camp twenty three and a quarter miles to pond for two miles the road passes over a low flat country after which the country is hilly no wood twenty three and a half miles to pond rolling and hilly country with rocky knobs at eighteen miles cross branch of muddy creek fifteen feet wide wood in ravines near this stream no wood at camp twenty miles to pond rolling country at eleven miles there is water in a ravine to the left there is more water but the country is rough no wood sixteen and a quarter miles to fort union road descends a hill to the fort before this it passes over high firm prairie good grass near in the hills six and a half miles to pond no wood good grass six miles to little muddy river good camp fifteen and a half miles to creek two good camps between this and the last wood water and grass ten miles to big muddy river driftwood for fuel eleven miles to marsh near missouri good camp eighteen miles to poplar river good camp one or two good camps between this and the last camp twenty three and a half miles to creek near missouri good camp fifteen miles to slough near missouri good camp seventeen and a half miles to milk river one good camp between this and the last camp thirteen and a half miles on milk river several good camps passed seventeen and a half miles on milk river good camp nineteen and a half miles on milk river several good camps passed seventeen and three-quarter miles on milk river at the crossing the road follows a trail on the bluffs and descends again to the river seven and a half miles to lake no wood grass and water plenty twelve and a half miles on milk river second crossing good camp twelve miles on milk river good camp fifteen and a half miles on milk river good camps between this and the last camp ten and three-quarter miles on milk river good camp twenty miles on milk river good camp sixteen miles on milk river good camp eighteen miles on milk river at the third crossing good camp seventeen and a half miles to branch of milk river good camp seventeen and a half miles on branch of milk river several good camps between this and the last camp six miles to branch of milk river good camp nineteen and a quarter miles to prairie spring no wood water and grass plenty thirteen and three-quarter miles to teton river road crosses marias river eighteen and three-quarter miles on teton river at fort benton a trading post two and a half miles to small creek good wood water and grass eighteen and three-quarter miles to missouri river good camp twenty and a half miles on missouri river above the falls road much broken into ravines wood water and grass sixteen and three-quarter miles on missouri river road crosses first tributary above fort benton at ten miles seventeen miles on missouri river the road becomes very bad after fourteen miles but is better on the north side of the missouri six miles on missouri river the road is exceedingly rough and broken crosses the river good wood water and grass eleven miles to tributary of the missouri the most difficult part of the road is passed but the country is still hilly eighteen and a half miles to tributary of the missouri the road follows up the last-mentioned stream to near its head. Good camps. Fifteen miles near the summit of Little Blackfoot Pass, on a broad Indian trail, excellent road. Fourteen and three-quarter miles to Little Blackfoot River. Road crosses the summit of the Rocky Mountains. Good road for wagons, with many camping places. Seventeen and a half miles on Little Blackfoot River. Road good, descending along the river. Near the camp, a large fork comes in. Twenty-eight and a half miles on Little Blackfoot River. Good road, which follows the broad open valley for fourteen miles. Good camps. Nineteen and a half miles on Little Blackfoot River. The valley contracts so that wagons will be forced to take the bed of the river in some places. The river is fordable, and the trail crosses it five times during the day. 
Twenty-two and a half miles on Blackfoot River. Sixteen miles from the last camp, Blackfoot and Hellgate rivers enter, and about one mile of this distance is impassable for wagons. They would have to cross the river, which is fordable. Good camps. Twenty-seven and a half miles to Fort Owen. Road runs up the St. Mary's River to Fort Owen, over a broad good trail in the valley. Forty miles to St. Mary's River. The South Nez Perce Trail leaves the main trail, which ascends the St. Mary's Valley to the Forks, and follows the Southwest Fork to its source. To the Forks, the valley of the St. Mary's is open, and admits wagons. Twenty-four miles to Southwest Fork of St. Mary's River. The road follows a narrow trail, crossing the river frequently, and is not passable for wagons. The valley is narrow and shut in by hills. Five and a half miles to Kuskuskia River. Road leaves the St. Mary's River, passing over a high ridge to the Kuskuskia River. Ten miles to Branch. Road runs over wooded hills. Fourteen miles to Creek. Road runs over wooded hills. Nine miles to Small Creek. This is the best camp between the St. Mary's River and the Nez Perce country. Fifteen miles to Small Creek. Road passes over wooded hills. Nine miles to Small Branch. Road passes over wooded hills. Is very rough and difficult. Poor camp. Fourteen miles on Small Creek. Ten miles from last camp, the road passes a high divide, ascending rapidly, though not difficult. Good grass on the summit, but no water. Thirteen miles on Small Creek. Good camp where the trail emerges from the woods onto the high plateau. Seven miles to Clearwater River. Large tributary. Road runs over high tableland and descends to the valley of the river. Forty-three miles to Lapwai River. The road follows a broad trail down the river six miles when it leaves the river bottom and descends the plateau, which extends to Craig's house on the Lapwai, fifteen miles from the river. Twenty-three miles to tributary of the Snake River. The trail runs over high ground from Craig's to Lapwai River, fifteen miles. This river is four hundred and fifty feet wide. No wood. Indians are generally found here who ferry over travelers. The trail follows Snake River for several miles. Twenty-six and a quarter miles to Tichannon River. The trail passes five and a half miles up the bottom of a small creek, then runs over a steep hill to another small creek, eight miles, then along the valley of this stream, ten and a half miles, thence over a high hill to camp on Channon River, three miles. Eleven and a half miles to Touche River. The trail crosses the Channon River and descends to a high plain which continues to camp. Thirty-two and a half miles on Touche River. Road follows a good trail along the valley, where good camps are found anywhere, with wood, water, and grass. Nineteen and a half miles to Fort Walla Walla. Leaving Touche River, the trail passes over again to the plains, when there is neither wood, water, or grass, to Fort Walla Walla. Total distance from St. Paul's to Fort Union, seven hundred and twelve and a half miles. Total distance from Fort Union to Fort Benton, three hundred and seventy-seven and a half miles. Total distance from Fort Benyon to Fort Owen, two hundred and fifty-five miles. Total distance from Fort Owen to Fort Walla Walla, 340 and three-quarter miles. Total distance from St. Paul's, Minnesota to Fort Walla Walla, Oregon, 1,685 and three-quarter miles. Itinerary 19. Lieutenant E. F. Beale's route from Albuquerque to the Colorado River. Distance is in miles and hundredths of a mile. 2.10 miles from Albuquerque to Atrisco. Wood, water, and grass. 20.63 miles to Rio Puerco, water in pools, wood and grass. 19.41 miles to near Puta, abundance of wood, water and grass. 13.12 miles to Covera, water and grass abundant, wood scarce. 13.06 miles to Hay Camp, wood, water and grass plenty. 25.37 miles to Agua Frio, wood, water and grass plenty. 16.28 miles to Inscription Rock, Small Spring, Grass and Wood Plenty. 16.32 miles to Ojo del Pescado, Water and Grass Plenty, Wood for Camp. 15.13 miles to Zuni, Grass and Water, Plenty, Wood Scarce. 6.1 miles to Indian Well, Wood, Water and Grass. 14.43 miles to Number 1, Wood and Grass, No Water. 11.93 miles to Jacob's Well, Wood, water, and grass. 6.57 miles to number 2 Navajo Spring. Wood, water, and grass. 13.62 miles to Noon Halt. Water by digging. Grass and wood scarce. 6.13 miles to number 3 Grass abundant. 7.75 miles to Noon Halt. Wood, water, and grass abundant. 
Seven point two five miles to number four. Water in holes, grass and fuel plenty. Three point six miles to three lakes. Wood, water and grass. One point seven miles to crossing of Puerco. Wood, water and grass abundant as far as La Rue Spring. Eleven point two five miles to number five. Eighteen point five miles to number six. Ten point seventeen miles to number seven. Thirteen point two five miles to number eight. 19.35 miles to Canyon Diablo, 14.7 miles to number 10, 13.5 miles to near Coast Nino Caves, 17.32 miles to San Francisco Spring, 9.06 miles to La Rue Spring, 8.48 miles to number 13, wood and grass but no water, 11.13 miles to Breckenridge Spring, wood, water, and grass abundant, 8.07 miles to number 14, wood, water, and grass abundant, 6.5 miles to Cedar Spring, wood, water, and grass abundant. 10.5 miles to number 15, wood, water, and grass abundant. 19.7 miles to Alexander's Canyon, wood and grass plenty, not much water. 8.05 miles to Smith's Spring, wood, water, and grass abundant. 8.75 miles to Pass Dornan, wood and grass abundant, no water. 13.5 miles to number 19, wood and grass abundant, no water. 16.35 miles to number 20, water 2 miles from camp, wood and grass plenty. 4.06 miles to Hemp Hills Spring, wood, water, and grass abundant. 21.25 miles to number 21, wood, water, and grass abundant. 9.75 miles to number 22, wood and grass, spring 1 mile distant. 5.5 miles to number 23, wood and grass plenty, no water. 8.45 miles to number 24, Wood and grass, spring three miles off. 16.75 miles to number 25, wood and grass, no water. 7.25 miles to Sabadras Spring, wood, water, and grass. 13.25 miles to number 26, wood, no grass or water. 8.75 miles to spring, wood, water, and grass. 1.25 miles to number 27, wood, water, and grass. 3.17 miles to number 28, wood, water, and grass. 1.25 miles to number 29, wood, water, and grass. 3.11 miles to number 30, wood, water, and grass. 3.25 miles to number 31, east bank of Colorado River, wood. Number 32, west bank, water and grass abundant. Itinerary 20, Captain Whipple's route from Albuquerque, New Mexico to San Pedro, California. Distances in miles and hundredths of a mile. 0.88 miles from Albuquerque to Atrisco, permanent running water. 12.16 miles to Isleta, permanent running water. 22.78 miles to Rio Puerco, water in holes. 18.30 miles to Rio Rita, permanent running water. 13.77 miles to Covera, permanent running water. 14.66 miles to Hay Camp, permanent running water. 17.71 to Sierra Madre, no water. 8.06 miles to Agua Frio, permanent running water. 17.49 miles to Inscription Rock, El Moro, permanent springs. 14.23 miles to Ojo del Pescado, permanent springs. 11.74 miles to Zuni, permanent running water. 8.83 miles to Arch Spring, permanent spring. 10.77 miles, blank, no water. 19.67 miles to Jacob's Well, Permanent water hole. 7.04 miles to Navajo Spring. Permanent springs. 12.13 miles to Willow Creek. Rio de la Jara. Water in holes. 10.87 miles to Rio Puerco of the West. Water in holes. 11.59 miles to Lithodendron Creek. Permanent running water. 11.99 miles to Colorado Chiquito. Permanent running water. 14.42 miles on Colorado Chiquito. Permanent running water. 8.63 miles on Colorado Chiquito, permanent running water. 4.94 miles on Colorado Chiquito, permanent running water. 1.35 miles on Colorado Chiquito, permanent running water. 4.9 miles on Colorado Chiquito, permanent running water. 10.99 miles on Colorado Chiquito, permanent running water. 15.88 miles on Colorado Chiquito, permanent running water. 4.44 miles on Colorado Chiquito, permanent running water. 1.51 miles on Colorado Chiquito, permanent running water. 29.72 miles to Colonino Caves, 
permanent water holes, 11.81 miles near San Francisco Spring, no water, water four miles from camp, 10.46 miles to La Rue Springs, permanent water, 8.23 miles, no water, 6.17 miles, no water, 8.54 miles to New Year's Spring, permanent spring, 9.77 miles to Lava Creek, water in hole, 9.89 miles to Cedar Creek, water in holes, 13.26 miles to Partridge Creek, water in holes, 3.89 miles on Partridge Creek, water in holes, 13.52 miles on Partridge Creek, water in holes, 0.87 miles to Picacho Creek, water in holes, 7.45 miles, no water, 8.69 miles to Turkey Creek, permanent running water, 5.71 miles to Pueblo Creek, permanent running water, 6.67 miles on Pueblo Creek, permanent water in holes, 5.98 miles on Pueblo Creek, permanent water in holes, 5.8 miles to Canyon Creek, permanent water in holes, 12.16 miles on Canyon Creek, permanent water in holes, 0.3 miles on Canyon Creek, water in holes, 11.2 miles on Canyon Creek, water in holes, 9.64 miles to Cactus Pass, permanent running water, 7.97 miles to White Cliff Creek, permanent running water, 11.6 miles to Bighorn Springs, permanent spring, 12.83 miles to Mouth of Canyon Creek, permanent running water, 9.21 miles to Big Sandy Creek, permanent running water, 4.35 miles on Big Sandy Creek, permanent running water, 6.21 miles on Big Sandy Creek, permanent running water, 4.08 miles on Big Sandy Creek, permanent running water, 6.10 miles on Big Sandy Creek, permanent running water, 5.56 miles on Big Sandy Creek, permanent running water, 6.44 miles to mouth of Big Sandy Creek, permanent running water as far as the Colorado River. 6.52 miles to Rio Santa Maria, 8.97 miles on Rio Santa Maria, 6.85 miles on Rio Santa Maria, 7.22 miles on Rio Santa Maria, 3.9 miles on Rio Santa Maria, 8.69 miles on Rio Santa Maria, 4.33 miles to mouth of Rio Santa Maria, 4.74 miles on Colorado River, 5.02 miles on Colorado River, 9.06 miles on Colorado River, 11.39 miles on Colorado River, 29.87 miles on Colorado River, 1.02 miles to Mojave Villages, 9.46 miles to Crossing of the Colorado River, 0.33 miles on Colorado River, 2.78 miles on Colorado River, 20.71 miles. The road on leaving the Colorado runs up over a gravelly ridge to a barren mesa and descends the bed of the Mojave four or five miles above its mouth and at nine and a half miles it passes springs near the point where the road turns above the western base of a mountain there is no water at the camp but grass in an arroyo nine miles to piute creek this is a fine stream with good water and grass thirteen miles to arroyo grass and wood water is found by digging seven miles to fine spring good water and grass the wagon road passes around the hills but an indian trail leads through the ravine where the spring is nineteen miles to marl spring this is a small but constant spring excellent grass and grease wood for fuel thirty miles to lake the road follows a ridge for some distance then descends to an arroyo and in a few miles emerges into a sandy plain where there is a dry bed of a lake which is firm and makes a good smooth road the camp is at some marshy pools of water good grass and grease wood for fuel twelve miles to mojave river road passes through a valley of drifted sand and at the camp strikes the river, which is here a beautiful stream of fresh water, ten to twelve feet wide and a foot deep, with a hard gravelly bottom, grass in the hills near. Thirteen miles on Mojave River, the road ascends the river, the banks of which are covered with fine grass and mesquite wood, good camps along here. Twenty miles on Mojave River, the road leads up the river for a short distance, when it turns into an arroyo, and ascends to a low mesa, and continues along the border of a level prairie covered with fine bunch grass it then enters the river bottom again which is here several miles wide and well wooded grass good twenty miles on mojave river six miles from camp the road strikes the mormon road and crosses the stream near a mormon camping place the trail runs along the river which gets larger and has more timber on its bank as it is ascended good grass water and wood twenty two miles on mojave river 
A short distance from camp the valley contracts, but the road is good. It leaves the valley and crosses a gravelly ridge, but enters it again. Good grass, wood, and water. Fifteen miles on Mojave River. Road continues along the right bank of the river in a southwest course and crosses the river at camp. Good wood, water, and grass. 29.5 miles to Caju Creek. The road leaves the river at the crossing and runs toward a break in the San Bernardino Mountains. It ascends a sharp hill and enters a cedar thicket. It then ascends to the summit of the Caju Pass, thence over a spur of the mountains into an arroyo or creek in a ravine, thence along the dry channel at the Caju Creek for two miles, where the water begins to run, and from thence the road is rough to camp. Seven miles on Caju Creek. Road continues along the creek to camp and is rough. Wood, water, and grass at camp. Twenty miles to Cocomuga's Ranch. On a pretty stream of running water, the road runs for six miles down the Caju Creek, along its steep and rocky bed. It is here a good-sized stream. Captain Whipple's road here leaves the San Bernardino Road and turns to the west along the base of the mountains towards Los Angeles. It then crosses a prairie and strikes the ranch of Cocomauga, wood, water, and grass. Twenty-four miles to town of El Monte. The road runs upon the northern border of a basin which is watered by many small streams and is settled. The camp is on the pretty stream of San Gabriel, where there is a good camping place. 14.25 miles to City of Los Angeles. The road passes the mission of San Gabriel, then enters a ravine along hills and broken ground. It then descends and crosses the river, which waters the valley, and enters the city. There is a good camp upon the point of a ridge on the left bank of the river. 23 miles to San Pedro. Good camp. End of itineraries 17 through 20. Itineraries 21 through 24 of The Prairie Traveler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Prairie Traveler by Randolph B. Marcy. Itinerary 21. From Fort Yuma to Benicia, California. From Lieutenant R. S. Williamson's report. Distances in miles and hundredths of a mile. Fort Yuma on Rio, Colorado. To Pilot Knob, 6.51 miles. 5.06 miles to Algodones. 11.18 miles to Cook's Wells. 21.11 miles to Alamo Mocho, 14.16 miles to Little Laguna, 10.29 miles to Big Laguna, 12.92 miles to Forks of Road. The left-hand road leads to San Diego, 139.94 miles, the right hand to San Francisco, 17.62 miles to Salt Creek, 29.94 miles to Water in the Desert, below Point of Rocks, 12.6 miles to Coahuila Village. 15.82 miles to Deep Well, 10.62 miles to Hot Spring, 7.36 miles to East Base of San Gorgonio Pass, 18.29 miles to Summit of Pass, 27.10 miles to San Bernardino, Mormon Town, 17.6 miles to Sycamore Grove, 14.00 miles to Kikwalmungo Ranch, 26.6 miles to San Gabriel River at Crossing, 6.7 miles to Mission of San Gabriel, 9.0 miles to Los Angeles. 10.2 miles to Cahuengo Ranch at the crossing of a branch of the Los Angeles River. 10.7 miles to Mission of San Fernando. 5.9 miles to Summit of San Fernando Pass. 7.15 miles to Santa Clara River Southeast Fork. 15.8 miles to Summit of Coast Range in San Francisco Pass. 18.0 miles to Eastern Base of Sierra Nevada. 6.7 miles to Summit of Tejon Pass. 13.10 miles to Depot Camp in the Tejon. 31 miles to Kern River at the crossing. 10.8 miles to Depot Camp on Pose Creek, or Okoya. 24.3 miles to White Creek. 14.9 miles to Moores Creek. 5.10 miles to Tule River. 22 miles to Deep Creek. Deep Creek is the first of four creeks crossed by the wagon road, into which the Pipiuna divides itself after emerging from the Sierra. These streams are commonly known as the Four Creeks. 0.29 miles to Cameron Creek, the second of the Four Creeks. 3.3 miles to Kawiya River, the third and principal one of the Four Creeks. 0.89 miles to St. John's Creek, the last of the Four Creeks, at the crossing. 28.13 miles to Pools Ferry on Kings River. 12.32 miles to Slough of Kings River. 25.73 miles to Fort Miller on San Joaquin River in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada. 9.4 miles to Cottonwood Creek. 
7.72 miles to Fresno River. 12.15 miles to Chowchilla River, sometimes known as the Big Mariposa. 10.39 miles to Mariposa River. 6.03 miles to Bear Creek. 18.33 miles to Merced River. 18.89 miles to Davis's Ferry to Lumney River. 28.85 miles to Grayson, a ferry on the San Joaquin River. 27.54 miles to Elkhorn. The distance is by the wagon road and is circuitous. 6.9 miles to Summit of Livermore Pass. 7.2 miles to Egress from Livermore Pass. 40.42 miles to Martinez, on the Straits of Carquives, opposite Benicia, California. Total distance from Fort Yuma to Benicia, 800.45 miles. Itinerary 22. A new route from Fort Bridger to Camp Floyd. Opened by Captain J. H. Simpson, USA, in 1858. Fort Bridger to Branch of Black's Fork, 6 miles. Wood, water, and grass. 7 and a quarter miles to Cedar on Bluffs of Muddy. Grass and wood all the way up the ravine from the Muddy and water at intervals. 5 and a half miles to Last Water in Ravine after leaving the Muddy. Wood, water, and grass. 5 and three quarter miles to East Branch of Sulphur Creek. Wood, water, and grass. Junction of Fort Supply Road. Half mile to Middle Branch of Sulphur Creek. Sage, water, and grass. 3 miles to West Branch of Sulphur Creek. Willow, water, and grass. Spring a mile below. Five and a quarter miles to east branch of Bear River, wood, water, and grass. Quarter mile to middle branch of Bear River, wood, water, and grass. Two and three quarter mile to main branch of Bear River, wood, water, and grass. Nine and three quarter miles to first camp on White Clay Creek, wood, water, and grass. Five and a quarter miles on White Clay Creek, wood, water, and grass. Fifteen miles on White Clay Creek, good camps all along the valley of White Clay Creek. Three quarter miles to commencement of canyon. Wood, water, and grass. Half mile to White Clay Creek. Good camps all along the valley of White Clay Creek to the end of the lower canyon. Twelve miles to Weber River. Wood, water, and grass. Six miles to Parley's Park Road. Wood, water, and grass. Pass over the divide. Three and three-quarter miles to Silver Creek. Willows, water, and grass. Six miles to Timpanogos Creek. Wood, water, and grass. Cross over the divide. One mile to commencement of canyon. Wood, water, and grass. 24 and a half miles to Cascade in Canyon. Good camps at short intervals all along Timpanogos Canyon. 4 and a quarter miles to Mouth of Canyon, Wood and Water. 6 and a quarter miles to Battle Creek Settlement, Purchase Forage. 3 and a quarter miles to American Fork Settlement, Purchase Forage. 3 miles to Lehigh, Town, Purchase Forage, Grass Near. 2 and three quarter miles to Bridge over Jordan. Grass and Water, Wood in the Hills, 1 and a half miles distant. 14 miles to Camp Floyd, wood, water, and grass. Total distance from Fort Bridger to Camp Floyd, 155 miles. Note, Captain Simpson says this wagon route is far superior to the old one in respect to grade, wood, water, and grass, and in distance about the same. Itinerary 23, from Fort Thorn, New Mexico, to Fort Yuma, California. Distances in miles and hundredths of a mile. Fort Thorn, New Mexico, to Water Holes, 14.3 miles. One mile west of Holin Rock. Water uncertain, no wood. 9.14 miles to Mule Creek. Water at all seasons a little up the creek. Wood plenty. 12 miles to Cook Spring. Water sufficient for camping. Mesquite bushes on the hills. 19.5 miles to Rio Mimbres. Water and wood abundant. 16.3 miles to Ojo de la Vaca. Water and wood. 12 miles to Spring. Constant small streams two miles up the canyon. Water at the road uncertain. 44.4 miles to Rancho. Pond of brackish water one mile to the right, four miles before reaching here. 13.9 miles to Rio San Simon. Constant water a few miles up and mesquite wood. 18.4 miles to pass in the mountains. Water on the left about two miles after entering the pass. 6.4 miles to Arroyo. Wood one mile up. Water uncertain. Small stream crossing the road one and a half miles from last camp. 26.3 miles to Nugent Spring. Large spring, excellent water one mile south at Playa San Domingo. 17.2 miles to canyon, to the left of the road. Water one and a half miles up the canyon, two miles from the road. 17 miles to Rio San Pedro, wood and water abundant. 16.3 miles to San Pedro, water abundant, wood distant. 20.8 miles to Cienaquilla, water and wood abundant. 7.3 miles along Cienaquilla, water and wood abundant, road rough. 
21.8 miles to Mission of San Javier. Large mesquite and water plenty in Santa Cruz River. 8 miles to Tucson. Village on Santa Cruz River. Tucson is the last green spot on the Santa Cruz River. The best camping ground is 2 miles beyond the village, where the valley widens and good grass and water are abundant. 7.2 miles to Mud Holes. The road passes over arroyas, but is rather level. 65 miles to Agua Hermal. Road passes over a desert section and is hard and level. Water is found in most seasons, except in early summer, in natural reservoirs on an isolated mountain about midway called Picapo. Poor water and tall horse grass at the mud holes. Road here strikes the Rio Gila. 15.1 miles to Los Pimos. Road follows the river bottom. Lagoon of bad water near camp. Grass good, plenty of cottonwoods and mesquite. 13.2 miles to Los Maricopas. Road takes the river bottom and passes through cultivated fields. Soil and grass good. The Indian village is on a gravelly hill. The road is good. 40 miles to El Tegotal. The road leaves the river and crosses the desert. No water between this and the last camp at the Maricopas village. Road is good. The Calita abounds here, and the mules are fond of it. 10.5 miles to Pega del Rio. Road runs in the river bottom and is level. Rincón de Vega. Road runs in the river bottom and is level. Good grass. 10.5 miles to Malpais. Road continues near the river, but over low gravel hills and through a short canyon of deep sand. 9.5 miles to Mil Flores. Pass over a very steep precipice to an elevated plateau, thence over gravel hills four and a half miles to camp, where there is excellent grass and wood. 13.7 miles to Santado. Road keeps the river bottom until within four miles of camp when it turns over the plateau. Good grass. 16.7 miles to Las Lonas. Road follows the river bottom. Scattered bunch grass on the hills. 11.4 miles to Vegas. Road follows along the river bottom. Grass poor. 16.8 miles to Matate. Road runs along at the foot of a rugged mountain. Excellent grass at the camp. 14.7 miles to El Oral. Road ascends to the plateau, which it follows for seven miles over a level country, then descends over gravelly hills to the river. Camp on the river bank near the desert. Wood plenty. 20.8 miles to Los Algodones. Road runs along at the foot of the hills or spurs of the desert. Small rugged hills, vegetation, dwarf mesquite, cacti, etc. Good grass at camp. 7.4 miles to Fort Yuma on the Rio Colorado. Total distance from Fort Thorne, New Mexico to Fort Yuma, 571 miles. Itinerary 24. Lieutenant Bryan's route from the Laramie Crossing of the South Platte to Fort Bridger via Bridger's Pass. Laramie Crossing to Bryan's Crossing, 14 miles. Road runs on the south side of the Platte. Good grass and water. 12 miles to first crossing of Pole Creek. Pole Creek is a rapid stream, sandy bed, 15 feet wide and 2 feet deep. Good grass on the creek and wood 3 miles off in the bluffs. 37 miles to second crossing of Pole Creek. Road runs along the creek. Good grass and good camps at any point. Good road. 17 and a quarter miles to third crossing of Pole Creek. Good camp, wood on the bluffs. 20 and a half miles to fourth crossing of Pole Creek. Creek dry for three miles. Good grass. Twenty and a quarter miles to bluffs covered with dead pines. Creek is crossed several times. Road runs over a rough broken country. Good grass. Fourteen and a half miles to road from Fort Laramie to New Mexico. Road rather rough. The valley opens out into a wide plain. Plenty of grass. Ten and a half miles on Pole Creek. Good road. Good camp. Twenty miles on Pole Creek. Road crosses several ravines, most of which can be avoided by keeping on the bluffs. The valley is narrow, grass not very good. Seventeen and a half miles to Cheyenne Pass. Road passes over a rolling country. Good grass, willows for fuel, military post established here. Fourteen and a half miles to summit of Black Hills, source of Pole Creek. Grass poor. Ten and a quarter miles to East Fork of Laramie River. Good camp. Sixteen miles to West Fork of Laramie River. Good camp. Cherokee Trail comes in here. 14 miles to Cooper's Creek, wood and grass. 10 and a half miles to East Fork of Medicine Bow Creek, wood and grass as far as Pass Creek. 2 and a half miles to Small Creek. 6 miles to Birch Creek. 5 and a quarter miles to West Fork of Medicine Bow Creek. 2 miles to Flint's Creek. 3 miles to Elm Creek. 7 miles to Rattlesnake Creek. 5 miles to Pass Creek. 14 and a half miles to North Fork of the Platte. Good road over High Prairie. Five miles before reaching the river, the Cherokee Trail turns to the left and crosses three miles above. Good camps on the river. Three and a half miles to first crossing of Sage Creek. 
Good road. Grass not plenty. Ten and a half miles to second crossing of Sage Creek. Road runs through Sage Creek Valley. Hilly, broken, and sterile country, covered with sagebrush. Grass not abundant. Cherokee Trail leaves three miles back. Four miles to third crossing of Sage Creek. Road continues through sagebrush. Grass gets better. Three miles to fourth crossing of Sage Creek. Good grass, wood, and water. Nine miles to Bridger's Pass. Road runs over a hilly country, crossing several small branches, with a little grass upon their banks. Country covered with sage. Three and a half miles to Muddy Creek. The valley of the Muddy is deep and narrow at first, and afterward opens out. The crossings of this creek were either bridged or paved by the troops in 1848, but little grass in this valley. Twenty and a half miles to near Muddy Creek. Very little grass. Poor camp. Sixteen and a half miles to Bridger's Fork of the Muddy Creek. The road for thirteen miles over a rolling country, then over a rough broken country with deep ravines. No water in this fork in a dry season. Small springs of brackish water near the crossing. Grass poor. Four miles to Small Spring. Water bad. Grass poor. Two and a half miles to Small Spring in the bluff. Water bad. Grass poor. One mile to Haystack. Clay Butte. Spring in the dry bed of the creek. Bunch grass. Five and a half miles to small springs, in bluffs, on the right of the road. Grass poor and water bad. Seven and a half miles to springs. There is a fine spring at the foot of a steep hill on the south side of the road. Very little grass. Rushes on the creek. Three and a half miles to south fork of Bitter Creek. Good grass and water. Fourteen and three-quarter miles on Bitter Creek. Country hilly and intersected with deep ravines. South fork is a fine stream of good water. Sixteen miles to Sulphur Springs. Road very hilly, crossing many deep ravines. Grass and sage plenty. Nine miles to Bitter Creek Crossing. No grass at the crossing. Water bitter when the creek is down, but tolerable in high water. Road rough with numerous ravines. Eighteen and a half miles to North Fork of Bitter Creek. Cherokee Trail enters near the crossing. Road good, but little grass except in spots. Sage for fuel. Four miles to Bluffs. Springs of good water in the elevated bluffs on the right side of the road, in the cottonwood groves. Grass good and abundant at the base of the bluffs. Eleven and three-quarter miles to Green River. Road is very rough and hilly and winds along the valley of the creek. Good camp on the river with plenty of wood and grass. Fifteen and three-quarter miles to Crossing of Black's Fork. Road runs up through Rabbit Hollow, which is steep and sandy, then passes over Rolling Prairie to Black's Fork. Bunch grass on the hills and good camp at the crossing. Eleven and a quarter miles to Fort Laramie Road. Rolling country. Good road through sage bushes. Good camps along the creek. Five and three quarter miles to Ham's Fork. Good camp on either side of the creek. United States Bridge here. Good road. Three quarter miles to Black's Fork Crossing. Good ford except in high water when the right hand road on the north bank of the creek is generally traveled. Fourteen and a half miles to Fourth Crossing of Black's Fork. Good road. Fine camp. Plenty of wood, water, and grass. Two and three quarter miles to fifth crossing of Black's Fork. Good camp, good road. Two and three quarter miles to Smith's Fork. Good camp, good road. Eleven and three quarter miles to Fort Bridger. Good camp near, good road. Total distance from Laramie Crossing of the South Platte to Fort Bridger, five hundred and twenty and a half miles. By the Fort Laramie Road, the distance is five hundred and sixty nine miles. End of itineraries twenty one to twenty four. Itineraries 25 through 28 of The Prairie Traveler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Prairie Traveler by Randolph B. Marcy. Itinerary 25. Wagon route from Denver City at the mouth of Cherry Creek to Fort Bridger, Utah. Five miles from Denver City to Vasquez Fork. Good road and fine camp. Nineteen and a half miles to Thompson's Fork. Road crosses three creeks about five miles apart is good and the camp is well supplied with water and grass but wood is scarce sixteen and a half miles to bent's fork road crosses two streams about five miles apart no wood on the first good camp twenty six miles to cache la poudre river excellent road crossing two streams at ten and twenty three miles from the last camp good camps on both cache la poudre is a fine large stream which issues from the mountains near the road and is difficult to cross in high water it has a firm bottom good camps along this stream with plenty of wood and grass sixteen miles to beaver creek road turns to the left and enters the hills ascending very gradually between two lines of bluffs and is good except in wet weather good camp nineteen miles to small branch road crosses beaver creek three times affording good camps 
Road is hilly but not very rough, passing for a portion of the distance through a timbered region. Elk and mountain sheep are abundant in this section. The camp is near the summit of the divide. Grass short. Seventeen and a half miles to tributary of Laramie River. Good road on the divide. Grass and water plenty, but wood not abundant. Eighteen and a half miles to on tributary of Laramie River. Road passes Laramie Fork three miles from the last camp. Good camp. Twenty-one miles on tributary of Laramie River. Road crosses a small creek at fourteen miles from last camp. Fine camp. Seventeen miles to Medicine Bow Creek. At twelve miles, the road crosses Sulphur Spring Creek, and at the west fork of the Laramie, Lieutenant Bryan's road enters. At ten miles from the last camp, there are two roads, one Bryan's leading north of the Medicine Bow Butte, and the other to the south of it. The former is the best. Good camp. Seventeen and a half miles to Prairie Creek. Fine camp. A portion of the road is very rough. It crosses several small branches upon which good camps may be had. Fine game section with bear, elk, etc. in great abundance. Twelve and a half miles to North Fork of the Platte. Excellent camp. Leave Bryan's Road four miles back, taking the left, which is altogether the best of the two. The crossing of the Platte is good except in high water when it is very rapid. A flat boat was left here by Colonel Loring's command in 1858. Twelve and a half miles to Clear Creek. Sage for fuel. Grass short. Twenty-three miles to Dry Creek. Road leaves Bryan's Trail to Bridger's Pass and bears to the right, passing over a smooth country covered with sage and poorly watered, passes a pond of milky water at thirteen miles there is water in dry creek except in a very dry season two miles from the creek on the old trail there is a fine spring on the left of the road which runs down into the road and here is the best grass after leaving the platte with plenty of fuel ten and a half miles to muddy creek road leaves the old cherokee trail at dry creek and bears to the left good camp for a limited number of animals fine grass along near the bank of the creek bad crossing buffalo seen here nineteen and a half miles to lake old trail enters near this camp road passes a brackish spring four miles back the road may be shortened by bearing to the left and skirting the hills for about six miles before reaching the lake the water in the lake is not good but drinkable and will be abundant except in the very driest part of the summer grass is good on the hills the road from dry creek is shorter than the old road by thirty miles twenty four and a half miles to red lakes road is good but traverses a very dry and sterile region the water is not good in the lakes, but drinkable, and may go dry in midsummer. Grass tolerable. Twenty-two miles to Seminoe's Spring. After passing the flats at the Red Lakes, the road is smooth and good, and there is a good camp at Seminoe's Spring. Twelve and a half miles to Bitter Creek. New road to the left, cutting off ten or twelve miles. Good camp. Water a little saline, but drinkable. Twenty-five miles to Sulphur Spring. Road runs along the valley of Bitter Creek, where there is but little grass until reaching camp. Animals should be driven across the creek into the hills where the best grass is found. Seventeen miles to Green River. Road leaves Bitter Creek at Sulphur Spring and passes near some high bluffs where there are small springs and good grass. Excellent camp at Green River. From here the road runs over the same track as Bryan's Road to Fort Bridger. From all the information I have been able to obtain regarding Lieutenant Bryan's Road from Sage Creek through Bridger's Pass and thence down the Muddy Creek, I am inclined to believe that the road we traveled is much the best. It is said that Lieutenant Bryan's route from Bridger's Pass to Green River has a scarcity of grass. The water is brackish and the supply limited, and may fail altogether in the dry season. The road passes through deep valleys and canyons, crossing muddy creeks and deep ravines. The creeks have been bridged and the ravines cut down so as to form a practicable road, but freshets will probably occur in the spring, which will destroy a great deal of the work and may render the road impassable. Lieutenant Duane's Notes the other road is for the greater part of the distance smooth, and has a sufficiency of grass in places, but the water may become scarce in a very dry season. Itinerary 26. From Nebraska City on the Missouri to Fort Kearney. Nebraska City on the Missouri River is a point from whence a large amount of the supplies for the Army in Utah are sent, and one of the contractors, Mr. Alexander Majors, speaks of this route in the following terms. Quote, the military road from Fort Leavenworth crosses very many tributaries of the Kansas River, the Soldier, the Grasshopper, etc., etc., which are at all times difficult of passage. There are no bridges, or but few, and those of but little service. From Nebraska City to Fort Kearney, which is a fixed point for the junction of all roads passing up the Platte, we have but one stream of any moment to cross. That one is Salt Creek, a stream which is now paved at a shallow ford with solid rock. There is no other stream which, even in a high freshet, would stop a train a single day. Again, upon this road, we have an abundance of good grazing every foot of the way to Fort Kearney. The road from Nebraska City is about 100 miles shorter to Fort Kearney 
than that from Fort Leavenworth, the former being less than 200 miles, and the latter about 300 miles. From Nebraska City to Salt Creek is 40 miles. From Salt Creek to Elm Creek is 60 miles. From Elm Creek to Fort Kearney is 100 miles. Upon the entire route, there is an abundance of wood, water, and grass, and camping places frequent. Itinerary 27. From Camp Floyd, Utah, to Fort Union, New Mexico. By Colonel W. W. Loring, USA. 23 miles from Camp Floyd to Goshen. The road runs through Cedar Valley, is level and good for 11 miles, to where the road forks. The left runs near the lake, and has good camps upon it. Thence to a fine spring, where there is a good camp, is 3 miles. Grass continues good to the camp near Goshen. Wood, water, and grass abundant. 14 miles to Salt Creek. Road runs over a mountain in a direct course to a fine spring branch, which runs into Salt Creek at 3.5 miles, where there is a good camp. Thence through a meadow to a small branch 3 miles, striking the old Mormon road again opposite a mud fort, where there is a fine spring and good camp, thence into the valley of Salt Creek, where there are good camps. 18 miles to Pleasant Creek. Near the last camp, the road forks, one running to Nephi, a small Mormon village, the other to Salt Creek Canyon, which is the one to be taken. The road runs up the canyon 5 miles, thence up its small right-hand fork to a spring 3 miles, thence to camp. Good camps can be found anywhere after crossing Salt Creek, with abundance of wood, water, and grass. Nineteen and a half miles to Willow Creek. Road at six and a half miles passes a fine spring. Half a mile farther is another spring where the road forks. Take the right through a meadow. It is three or four miles shorter. To the crossing is three miles. Thence to the main road again three miles. To the village of Ephraim, five miles. Good camp. Twelve miles to Ledinaquint Creek. At six miles pass Manti. Thence to Salt and Sulphur Springs is three miles. Good camp with a fine spring, wood, and grass. Fifteen miles on Ledinaquint Creek. Road passes over a rugged country for four miles to a creek, thence one mile it crosses another creek, thence two and a half miles up the creek, where there is a good camp. The road improves, and for eight or nine miles camps can be found by leaving the creek a short distance. The creek on which the camp is is muddy with narrow channel. Eighteen miles to Onapaw Creek or Salt Creek. Road is good over a barren country to the pointed red hills near the entrance to Wasatch Pass seven miles. From the red hills cross Salt Creek three times in four miles, Grass fair at second crossing, very good at third crossing, and a good camp. Road rough for three miles after leaving the creek. The road then enters a fine valley with plenty of blue and bunch grass. Road is level to within a mile of the camp. Wood, water, and grass abundant at camp. Seven and a half miles to head of branch of Salt Creek. Road runs over a bridge at two miles, thence one mile to a small branch. Grass abundant. Road runs along the branch three miles. In places very rough, with some sand, ascends the entire distance, and the camp is very elevated. Good spring at camp. Five and three-quarter miles to Salt Creek. Road passes over a ridge two and a half miles to a spring. Good camp at this spring. Colonel Loring worked the road at this place. It crosses the creek six times within the five and three-quarter miles. Good camp, with abundance of wood, water, and grass. Six and a half miles to Silver Creek. Road traverses a rolling section, is good, passes several springs where there are good camps, and crosses several trails which lead from California to New Mexico. Seventeen and a half miles to Media Creek. At two miles, the road passes the dividing ridge between the waters of Salt Lake and Green River, thence two miles descent to Shipley Creek, where is a good camp. For about a mile, the road is rough, but then descends into an open plain where the road is good. The ground is rough about the camp and covered with sage and greasewood. Two miles up the creek near the canyon is some grass, but it is not abundant here. Nineteen and three-quarter miles to St. Raphael Creek. Road passes a rolling section for five miles, thence one and a half mile to Garamboyer Creek, where there is a good camp. Thence, with the exception of short distance, the road is good to the knobs, nine miles, when it is broken for four and a half miles. Good camp. Eleven and three-quarter miles to San Mateo Creek. For three miles, the road is over a rolling section with steep hills to a creek. For three miles, the road is over a rolling section with steep hills to a creek, where is a good camp. Thence for three miles along the creek, soft soil and heavy road. Thence five miles to another creek, some grass, but not plenty. Thence to camp, the road is rough in places. Good camp. Fourteen and a quarter miles in the hills. Road runs over a rolling country two and a half miles to San Marcos, or Tanohe Creek, where there is good grass and water with sage. Two miles farther over a gravelly road, then a good plain road for nine and three quarter miles to camp. Good wood, water, and grass. Twenty-three miles to spring. Road for the first ten miles is rocky, when it strikes a spring where there is a good camp, thence two miles to water in a tank, not permanent, thence the road is on a ridge for six miles and is good, 
thence three miles the road is sandy spring at camp is large with plenty of wood but the grass is scarce down the creek is more abundant eighteen miles to green river for five miles the road is sandy thence the road is good for the remainder of the distance to camp where there is plenty of wood water and grass thirteen miles to thirteen mile spring green river can be forded at ordinary stages road runs among several arroyas for a few miles and then is straight and good to camp good grass a mile to the east of camp an arroya road runs between two rocky buttes and strikes the mormon trail which leaves green river at the same place but is very tortuous water not permanent here good grass three-fourths of a mile from camp twenty and a quarter miles to cottonwood creek road passes over a broken country to a water hole nine miles grass abundant thence there is sand in places crosses several arroyas camp is between two mountains wood water and grass abundant twelve miles to grand river road is over a rolling country in places light sand and heavy for wagons good camp thirteen miles on grand river road is rolling and sandy the mormon road runs nearer the mountains and colonel loring thinks it is better than the one he travelled good camp sixteen and three-quarter miles to one and a half miles from grand river the first three miles is level then the road passes over a very elevated ridge and descends into the valley grand river runs through a canyon and cannot be reached with the animals road in places sandy good camp nine and a half miles to grand river at two miles strike salt creek where the mormon road passes up a dry creek toward gray mountain road skirts the mountains along grand river and is rough in places passing over abrupt hills good camp sixteen and three-quarter miles on grand river road runs over a level and firm section with good camps at any point along the river cross the mormon and other trails good ford at the crossing except in high water good camp eighteen and a half miles on an arroya road runs over an undulating surface crossing several small streams issuing from elk mountain affording good camps at almost any place and strikes the marcy's and gunnison's trails good camp fifteen and a quarter miles to grand river rolling country high ridges with abrupt slopes for six and a quarter miles thence into a plain for seven and a quarter miles to double creek good camps twelve miles to uncompagre river good ford except in high water at six miles cross a dry creek thence three miles over a high level and firm road strike a large trail descend a hill with gentle slope into the valley of uncompagre where there are fine camps winter resort for ute indians fourteen and a half miles on uncompagre river road runs along the valley of the uncompagre is good and camps may be found at any point with plenty of wood water and grass thirteen miles to cedar creek road leaves the uncompagre and bears to the east up cedar creek to the gap in the mountains six miles thence up the valley of cedar creek to camp where are wood water and grass the gap is the first opening in the mountains above the mouth of the uncompagre eighteen and three-quarter miles to devil's creek road runs to the head of cedar creek over the divide into the valley of devil's creek and is rough with a steep descent camp is near a narrow canyon called devil's gate with high perpendicular bluffs good camp three miles to north fork of devil's creek road very rocky and worked by colonel loring marcy's and gunnison's trails pass here good camp seven and three-quarter miles to cibola creek road runs over abrupt hills covered with pine good camp five and a half miles to ruidos creek road rough with abrupt ascents and descents fine creek five feet wide and good camp thirteen miles to grand river road rather smooth for the first three miles then rough and rocky crossing several creeks and descending into the valley of the grand or eagle tail river where is a good camp plenty of brook trout in all the streams in this section fourteen and a half miles on grand river road crosses the river three times bottom wide grass and wood abundant cross several beautiful streams upon which are good camps some sand and rough places but generally good road game and brook trout abundant in this region indians resort to this section a great deal eighteen miles to kutibitopi creek at about five miles the kutibitopi creek enters forming at the confluence of a beautiful valley which the road crosses and strikes the creek near the point of rocks where the valley is only forty yards wide but after passing the point it opens again the course of the creek is nearly north good camps twenty miles to spring near beaver creek road crosses several small creeks where are good camping places good camp sixteen and three-quarter miles to sawatch creek road runs over a very rough and mountainous section for fourteen miles to the summit of the rocky mountains thence it descends to camp where grass wood and water are abundant twenty one and a half miles on sawatch creek road rough and rocky in places strikes the main sawatch creek at nine and a half miles crosses numerous small branches where are grass wood and good water in abundance twenty five and a half miles to camaro creek 
Road for seven miles to Sawatch Buttes is good, thence one and a half miles to the last crossing of the Sawatch, where there is a good camping place. Good camp at Camaro Creek. Three and a half miles to Garita Creek. Good road and good camp. Sixteen and a half miles to Rio Grande. Road level and good. Good camps along the river at almost any point. Six miles on Rio Grande. Good road and camp. Seventeen and a half miles to Fort Garland. Hay camp. Road continues down the river and is good. For six miles there is timber, but after this willow is the only wood to camp. Good road. Hay is cut at this place for the forts Massachusetts and Garland. Sixteen miles to Culebra Creek. At fourteen and three-quarter miles cross Trinchera Creek, where is a good camp. Road rather sandy. Good camps anywhere on Culebra Creek. Twenty-four and three-quarter miles to Latos Creek. Road tolerable to Costilla Creek. Ten and three-quarter miles. Good camp. Fourteen miles to Osakia, near Lama Creek. Road crosses several small branches. At nine and a half miles strike Red River. Grass at camp good, but not abundant. Nineteen and three-quarter miles to Meadow near Indian Puebla. At six miles the road crosses the San Cristobal, thence over another ridge into the valley of the Rio Hondo. Camp two miles from Taos. Two miles to Taos, New Mexico. Good road. At Taos are several stores where goods of all descriptions can be had at fair prices. Thirteen miles to Taos Creek Canyon. Road passes through the settlement where grain and vegetables can be obtained. It then enters the Taos Canyon at three miles and crosses the Canyon Creek frequently to camp. Good camp. Twenty-nine miles to Guadalapepita. At five miles the road ascends to the dividing ridge and is tolerable, thence in four miles cross the mountain and reach a fine spring branch, where is a fine camp. Thence the road passes short ridges for nine miles to Black Lake. Good camp. Fort Union. Road follows Coyote Canyon three miles, thence one mile to Mexican Settlement, thence nineteen and a half miles over the prairie to the fort. Colonel Loring came over the route from Camp Floyd to Fort Union with a large train of wagons. He, however, found the road in many places upon the mountains very rough, and it will require working before it will be suitable for general travel with loaded wagons. It is an excellent route for summer travel with pack trains, and is well supplied with the requisites for encamping. From Fort Union to Fort Garland, the road passes through a settled country where supplies of grain and vegetables can at all times be purchased at reasonable prices, and there are small towns met with during almost every day's march, where small shops supply such articles of merchandise as the traveler needs. Itinerary 28. Wagon route from Waimas, New Mexico to Tubac, Arizona. From Captain Stone's Journal. Waimas to Rancho de Caballo. Ten and a quarter miles. Good wood, water, and grass. Nine miles to Rancho de la Noche Buena. Good wood and grass, but no water for animals in May and June. Nineteen and five-eighths miles to Rancho de la Cuna Guinta. Good wood, water, and grass the year round. Water in tanks and wells. Fifteen and three-quarter miles to Rancho del Posito. Good wood and grass the year round. Water for men at all times, and for animals except in the months of May and June. Eight miles to Rancho de la Palma. Wood, water, and grass at all times. Sixteen and three-eighth miles to Rancho de la Pazza. Good wood, water, and grass at all seasons. Sixteen miles to Hermosillo. This is a town of ten thousand inhabitants on Sonora River, where all supplies may be procured. Thirteen miles to Hacienda de Alamito. Plenty of running water, wood, grass, and grain. Eight miles to Hacienda de la Labor. Plenty of running water, grass, and grain. Twenty-eight miles to Rancho de Tabique. Roughest part of the road, but not difficult for wagons. Wood, water, and grass. From Hermosillo to this place, there is water at short intervals along the road. 36 miles to Rancho Carababi. Wood and grass, water in tanks. 12 miles to Barajita, small mining village. Bad water, good wood and grass. 13 miles to Santa Ana, village on the river San Ignacio. Plenty of wood, water, and grass. 12 miles to La Magdalena, thriving town where all supplies can be procured. 5 miles to San Ignacio, village on the river. Good wood, water, and grass. Six and three quarter miles to Imuris, village on the river, wood, water, and grass. Eleven and a half miles to Los Alisos Rancho, wood, water, and grass. Three and a half miles to La Casita, wood, water, and grass. Three and a half miles to Chibuta, wood, water, and grass. Eleven and a quarter miles to Agua Sarca, wood, water, and grass. Twenty three and a quarter miles to Rancho de las Calabazas, wood, water, and grass. Thirteen miles to Tubac, silver mines at this place. Total distance from Waimas to Tubac, 295 miles. Note. During the months of July, August, and September, water will be found at almost any part of the road from La Casita to Hermosillo. 
there is no lack of wood or grass on any part of the road from waimas to the frontier the only difficulty in encamping at almost any point upon the road is that of obtaining water in the dry season that is from february to the first of july the remarks for each place apply to the most unfavorable seasons end of itineraries twenty five to twenty eight